Rake on the Run by Mindy Burbage Strunk Narrated by Victoria Brazier Chapter One There comes a time in a man's life when he is required to assess his actions and decisions. Perhaps now was that time. Lord Nathaniel Westlake peeked around the stack of crates, scanning the docks of King's Lynn. He spotted Lord Malvern and his son, Lord Hartleson, skulking about, obviously intent on finding someone. Finding me. His heart picked up its pace and his hands became moist. Lud, how was he to get out of this scrape? Last call! Nathan heard the holler from the large ship off to its right. He looked toward the sound. Sailors moved into position, hoisting the gangplank off the dock. With little thought to the repercussions, Nathan snatched up his valise, threw a quick prayer heavenward even though he surely did not deserve such attention from God, and hurried out from behind the crates. He half ran, half walked, trying to avoid drawing too much attention to himself. Ah, you there! He hollered, slightly breathlessly up to the men. Please, let me aboard. The closest man furrowed his brows. But, my good fellow, Nathan said, cutting him off. I have no time for oscillation. Please, let me aboard. Nathan cast a glance over his shoulder, scanning the nearby crowd for his pursuers. The man shrugged. If ye hurry, the winds are picking up. Together, the men dropped the plank back to the dock, and Nathan hurried on board as the men resumed their hoisting before Nathan's feet even touched down on the deck. Once aboard, he grinned at them and touched his fingers to his brow, giving them a small salute. I am much obliged to you, good sirs. The plank settled into place with a thunk as Nathan leant against the railing of the ship. He sighed, his body relaxing at last. He spotted Lords Malvern and Hartleson just as they spotted him. He grinned and dipped his head toward them, their expressions angry. Both men raced to the edge of the dock, but it was too late. The ship was just far enough away that they could pursue him no further. The wind pushed at the sails, taking him away from all his troubles. His shoulders sagged and he closed his eyes for a moment. This was what he needed. A fresh start away from the disapproving stares of the Ton's fathers. But just where was his fresh start to take place? He looked around. In truth, Nathan had no idea where this ship was bound. The swishing of skirts sounded above the waves and breeze. In his relief over his escape, he had not noticed a lady moving to the rail next to him, this was not a common occurrence for him. He chuckled to himself. He was nothing if not proficient at noticing women. Nathan turned, making sure to place his most charming smile upon his lips. But the face that greeted him stopped him in his tracks. She looked at him with the barest hint of a smile. Her eyes flicked from Nathan to the lords on the dock below. She was plain at best. Her hair was a nondescript brown, as were the eyes looking up at him. The face was altogether too tan to be considered handsome, and her teeth were slightly askew. The smile dropped from his face. She was not ugly, he supposed. She was just, well, not the sort of lady he was accustomed to paying much heed to. He looked around. Surely there were other, more diverting women on board. He sighed at the empty deck. If there were other women aboard, they were not in want of air at the moment. Nathan turned back and shrugged, resigning himself to a conversation with the woman next to him. I'm afraid I do not know where this ship is bound. I, I made the decision to board rather hastily. He chuckled. Yes, I saw. She had turned her eyes back to the dock. Calcutta, India, sir. India? That was not quite what he'd had in mind when he had awoken this morning. But neither had he intended to face Lord Malvern. India, Nathan thought again. He could think of worse places to be headed. Back to Cambridge and Lady Elizabeth among them. His head nodded slightly as the thought settled on him. He had never been to India. It seemed he had been presented with a unique opportunity if he decided to make the whole of the journey. Nathan looked back at the lady standing next to him. Perhaps she was not as plain as he had originally thought her, but still, she was not a beauty. Although, her voice did have a pleasant sort of timbre to it. Perhaps she would prove to be a good conversationalist, 
Such equality would be in high demand after several weeks passed confined upon this ship, and then, once he was in India, there would surely be ladies clamouring for his attentions. Nathan looked out at the dock, growing farther and farther away. India was a long distance to travel on a whim. His estate was in good hands, but nonetheless, was it prudent to take such a trip? He might be better served to disembark at the next stop. Where would that be? Cape Town? The angry, might he even say murderous, faces of Lords Malvern and Hartleson came to his mind, and he gave a slight shudder. Yes, India looked better and better. Besides, he had never taken a tour, as many of his friends had done after leaving Cambridge. He turned back to the woman next to him. What takes you to such far reaches of the kingdom, miss? He trailed off, waiting for her to introduce herself. Miss! She pushed herself from the railing, scowling at him. Good day, my lord. He sensed anger in her voice. What did she have to be angry with him about? They had only spoken for the first time moments ago. He cleared his throat. Lord Nathaniel Westlake. He sketched a brief bow before waiting for her to look on him with more admiration now that she knew his station. Granted, his brother would be the one to inherit the marquisate and all that went with it, but Nathan had an estate of his own with a good income. Besides, he had never had a lady complain at his only being a second son. My apologies, my lord, but it would be improper for me to be seen in such deep conversation with someone to whom I had not been properly introduced. I am certain my aunt would not look upon it favourably. Nathan reared back slightly. It seems it is I who should be apologising, miss. I did not realise we had entered into a deep conversation. His nose turned up slightly. Ah, she was of the extremely proper sort of lady. In his experience, those types were rarely any fun at all. But then, had not Lady Elizabeth been the same until her introduction to Nathan? He smiled. The woman gave him a slight curtsy and moved swiftly to the other side of the deck. Her gaze turned down to the water below. They must be fascinating waves of the way she kept her eyes trained upon them. Nathan shrugged. She may prove more stubborn than most, but she would come around. They always did. Your ticket, sir. An official-looking man stood at Nathan's elbow. Nathan turned and smiled at the man. Uh, <laughs> I do not precisely have a ticket. My decision to board came at rather the last moment. There was no time to purchase a ticket without the ship departing first. The man did not return Nathan's smile. A ticket is required for passage, sir. His voice was firm, with a definite edge to it. Nathan withdrew several notes from his haversack and held them out. It is not that I do not have the blunt, sir. I was merely short on time. He pushed the notes forward. I believe this is enough for a stateroom and... Nathan winked, which served to only increase the man's scowl. Some extra for you. He narrowed his eyes at Nathan. I am not allowed to accept bribes, sir. You are to have paid for the ticket before you boarded. Nathan nodded and rubbed at the back of his neck. I understand what you are saying. He spoke slowly, as if talking to someone of little wits. But the fact remains that I did not purchase a ticket before I boarded the ship. What would you have me do? Jump overboard and swim ashore? The gleam in the man's eyes indicated that Nathan was not too far off the mark. Nathan leant over the rail, peering down at the murky water of the harbour. He turned pleading eyes on the man. Surely you can make an exception this time. As soon as we land in Calcutta or wherever our first stop shall be, I will explain myself to the ticket office and pay up in full. You have my word as a gentleman. I've known many a gentleman, sir. Your word does not hold weight with me. Nathan nodded toward the money still rustling in the breeze in his outstretched hand. But you know I have the blunt. It is not as if there is much for me to buy on this ship, so it stands to reason that I should have it when we dock. The man squinted at him. All the staterooms are full, sir. Something you would have known had you checked in with the ticket office. He straightened his shoulders and lifted his chin. I'm afraid I can only offer you a space with the crew. Nathan's mouth gaped open. The crew? But I am a gentleman. The man took the money from Nathan's hand. A gentleman without a ticket. I shall write up a receipt and deliver it immediately. Please, wait here. Nathan remained, his mouth hanging open. 
Just how much longer would it be until they reached the Cape? Chapter 2 Tears pricked at Justina's eyes and she swatted at them angrily. It was not that she wished for the attentions of a man like Lord Nathaniel. In point of fact, she would rebuff him if he offered. But the fact that she was so completely forgettable that the man did not know they had met on at least four other occasions was disheartening. What was it about her that men found so lacking? It was no secret that she was not considered a diamond of the first among the ton, but was it too much to ask that her name be remembered, at least after the third introduction? Justina picked at the crack in the wooden railing. Not only had they been introduced, but less than a month before they had both attended the same two-week house party in Brighton. She stared at the waves as the ship cut through, sending them rolling back out to sea. Why had Lord Nathaniel had to travel on this ship to India? Could God not have guided him to a different ship in the time of his distress? Did it have to follow that she should be the one made uncomfortable when it was he who was running from yet another angry father? She leant her elbows on the railing and folded her arms, breathing in the salty air. The ship had not yet cleared the safety of the harbour, leaving only a slight breeze lifting the ribbons of her bonnet. Why should she care if Lord Nathaniel was aboard this ship? If their previous introductions had done anything, they had showed her that he would not remember her for even an hour's time, let alone the entirety of a trip to India. They had already been confined to the same house for a fortnight, even that brought no recollection on his part. Why should the ship be any different? Justina pushed herself off the railing, glancing discreetly over her shoulder to see if Lord Nathaniel was still there. He was, and seemed to be in a heated discussion with the first mate. Here is your receipt. I'm afraid you gave me more than the passage costs, but I cannot refund the difference. We do not keep much in the way of currency on board, but I have noted on the receipt the amount you paid. When we reach the Cape, you can apply to the ticket office for the difference in cost. The first mate looked sternly at Lord Nathaniel. Lord Nathaniel's mouth tightened, and he eyed the man. Truly, you do not have any staterooms available. A snicker hummed through Justina's nose, and she clamped her mouth shut to prevent it from sounding too loudly. The first mate shook his head. Are you suggesting I am telling you a Banbury story? There is always the bilge, sir. The man glared at Lord Nathaniel before he strode away. Lord Nathaniel stood rooted in place, apparently too shocked to even move. Justina bit her lower lip to keep from laughing, and quickly returned her gaze to the water below. It seemed to get clearer the closer they got to the open water of the English Channel. She cautioned one last glance over her shoulder at Lord Nathaniel and chuckled again at his upturned nose. Lord Nathaniel bunking with the crew. Perhaps God was smiling down on her after all. Oh, there you are, dearest. I was wondering where you had gone after getting the children down to rest. Her Aunt Martin stepped to the railing next to Justina, ending her imaginings of Lord Nathaniel and his fate. She gave a smiling sigh and turned her full attention to her aunt. Yes, I found I was too excited to stay in my quarters. Besides, it is such a lovely day. Her aunt turned her face toward the sky and took in a deep breath. Yes, and we seem to be moving away from the stench of the harbour. She patted Justina's hand. I am so happy you decided to join us, my dear. I know your mother shall miss you, but I shall be happy for the company. Justina grinned at her aunt. How shall I? Although I would be telling a falsehood if I did not admit to anticipating some grand adventures as well. Her heart skittered slightly, and her eyes widened. I am in hopes of even riding an elephant at least once. Her aunt put a hand to her chest. Oh, I shall leave that to the young. I am far too old to participate in such frivolities. Justina tilted her head to the side and eyed her aunt. Come now, aunt. You are barely one and thirty. That is not so old as to remain indoors with your stitchery all of the time. She gave her aunt a playful nudge. I shall see to it that you mount an elephant at least one time, or I shall die trying. Oh, do not say such things, dearest. Her aunt pulled her handkerchief out from the cuff of her sleeve. Your mother would never forgive me if I should let something happen to you. I am even beginning to think you riding an elephant is not as pleasant of a notion as I originally thought. Ah... Uh. I see your aunt has arrived so as to be able to properly introduce us. Lord Nathaniel's voice sounded behind them. Although, who will introduce your aunt to me? I have no notion. 
there was a note of humour in his voice. Justina and her aunt both turned slightly away from the railing and stared at Lord Nathaniel. Her aunt sucked in a breath of recognition and smiled, while Justina only raised a brow. Lord Nathaniel, I had no idea you would be sailing with us on this trip. Neither did he. Justina mumbled under her breath. What a pleasant surprise. Her aunt nearly quivered with excitement. Not for everyone. Justina scowled. Mrs. Martin, Lord Nathaniel clapped his hands together. This is indeed a pleasure. Am I to assume Mr. Martin is also making the trip? Her aunt nodded, her curls bobbing at the side of her face. Yes, he is resting at the moment. I am afraid he did not sleep well on our journey here, and if he is feeling under the weather he is more prone to seasickness. Lord Nathaniel nodded his head, an irritating smile gracing his face. I was speaking with your niece earlier, but she did not think you would approve of our conversation until a proper introduction had been made. Her aunt looked from Lord Nathaniel to Justina and back. But why should you need an introduction, my lord? I am certain I have already done that honour. Aunt Martin looked at Justina. She looked out across the deck, not wishing to see Lord Nathaniel's face when he realised his mistake. Then both of them would know how utterly forgettable she was. Besides, Justina was not going to be the one to inform Lord Nathaniel of his faulty memory. Yes, her aunt continued, I am certain of it. It was at Mrs. Hutching's card party last April. She frowned. Or was it May? She turned to Justina with inquiring eyes. Dearest, you remember, do you not? Justina nodded. Mrs. Hutching's card party was in May, Aunt Martin. And yes, I do remember. Her aunt let out a breath, as if Justina not remembering signified the problem was with her aunt's memory rather than Lord Nathaniel's. Oh, I thought that to be the case. Lord Nathaniel squinted at Justina, tilting his head to the side and obviously searching the recesses of his mind for even a sliver of a memory which did not seem to be appearing. But, as quick as a rabbit, his charming smile was upon his face and he offered a slight bow. Oh, perhaps you could refresh my memory. I cannot imagine how I could have forgotten such a lovely creature. Justina wanted to laugh at the blatant lie, but the knowledge that it was, indeed, a lie hurt her too much for laughter. Her aunt, who was easily taken in by his charms, swatted him on the arm and chuckled, Oh, you are a scoundrel, my lord. She looked at Justina with the adoring eyes of a mother. It lessened the sting from Lord Nathaniel's lie, but only slightly. This is my niece, Miss Justina Tinsdale. She is my sister's daughter. Justina dipped a slight curtsy as he took her hand and placed a kiss upon her glove. He bowed deeply. Miss Tinsdale, it is a pleasure to make your acquaintance. He stammered, but pressed on, or, or rather, reacquaintance, as this case seems to be. He released her hand and stood. Clapping his hands, he rubbed them together. And now that we are acquainted, we may have as many deep conversations as we desire. He gave Justina a wink, and she felt her face heat. She clenched her teeth tightly. Why must she act like all the other ladies she had seen him charm? Is that not right? He raised one brow at her. Her aunt tittered beside her. Justina simply nodded, unable or perhaps just unwilling to tell him. She doubted he would remember this introduction tomorrow. It really was of no consequence if they spoke again or not. The breeze began to pick up as they cleared the protection of the harbour. Justina put an arm around her aunt. Come, aunt, I think we should return to our quarters. We should get back to my cousins. I am certain they are near to waking. She tossed a smirk back at Lord Nathaniel. Perhaps you should secure your spot below deck, my lord. I've heard tale that the good spots are claimed quickly. You may already be too late. The mention of his travel accommodations dropped the smile from his face, which, of course, brought a shadow of a smile to hers. Chapter 3 Nathan had received what he desired, yet he still felt irritated. India. He still could not fully comprehend what that meant. How long did it even take to get to India? He crumbled the receipt of sale in his hand, shoving it into his haversack, a low growl grumbling in his throat. He frowned at the retreating backs of Mrs Martin and her niece. What was her name again? He furrowed his brow, trying to recall the name that Mrs Martin had given him. 
Miss Dimpledale? He shook his head. Could it be true that they had indeed been introduced to each other before? He could understand not remembering the lady if they had been introduced at a ball. Those were always such a crush, with more people than a person could keep track of. But at a card party? Those types of affairs were normally smaller and more intimate. Was that why she had acted so angry at him when first he spoke to her? Because he had not recognised her? He rubbed at his temple. Well, hang, miss... Truly he did not remember it again. He rubbed harder at his temple. What was wrong with him? He must have some mental deficiency where she was concerned. Miss Taylor? Miss Templeton? He shook his head with a scowl. Perhaps he could find Mrs Martin and ask her the lady's name. It would be embarrassing, but not nearly as much as having to ask the lady herself. He gave his head a side toss. She could just be angry with him. He could not be faulted for not remembering every young lady who sought him out. He was very desirable among the ladies of the ton. Perhaps not with the fathers, but that was not worth dwelling on at present. He glanced up and saw the first mate walking on the upper deck. For the second time in as many minutes, Nathan growled. Sleeping with the crew, how had he come to such unfortunate circumstances? Nathan had never been one to believe in fate, the idea that something happened because of one's past misdeeds. But he was beginning to think that if such a thing was possible, it might explain his recent run of bad luck. Could this be the result of his conduct with Lady Elizabeth? Surely he had not done anything to her so bad as to warrant his current situation. Yes, he had asked her to meet him in the library, alone. And yes, he may have even kissed her there, several times, fully knowing he had no intentions of asking for her hand. But did that stand to reason that he was destined to be plagued by bad luck for the rest of his days? He had done similar things with other ladies for years, and never had he experienced such unpleasant happenings. He leant over the railing, and watched the water peel away from the hull of the ship. Perhaps that was the issue. It was not just Lady Elizabeth, but a culmination of all the ladies he had trifled with. He furrowed his brow. Not trifled. That seemed much harsher than what he had done. He had only been entertaining the young women. And it was not as if they did not understand what they were getting into. After all, he did have a reputation. What did all those women expect? Did they each believe that they would be the one to win his heart? Nathan gave a wry chuckle. He had never told any of them that he loved them, at least, not in so many words. It was their own folly if they misunderstood his intentions. He removed his handkerchief and dabbed at the moisture dotting his forehead, his skin feeling itchy. How could he be perspiring when the wind was blowing all around him? He sighed. The ship rocked to the side and he gripped the railing to steady himself. A dull ache at the back of his skull pulsed, and his stomach pitched one way and then the other. Miss Tindley? He shook it away. Whatever her name was, she may have had the right of it. He would be wise to claim his bed with the crew. His lips curled. He was quite certain there were staterooms still available, but the first mate was just being stubborn and mean-hearted. Nathan hitched the strap of his valise higher on his shoulder and tentatively removed his hand from the railing. His legs wobbled a bit with the sway of the ship, but he managed to take several steps toward the stairs leading below. The ship lurched, and Nathan reached for the railing again. Perhaps he should use it until he came nearer the stairway. He walked quickly down the railing, thrusting himself toward the entrance to the staircase. Throwing the door open, he grasped that railing and proceeded down into the depths of the ship, each sway making his knees buckle and his stomach flop. The darkness and smells within the hull became thicker the farther he descended. A sailor passed him at the bottom of the second set of stairs, and Nathan stopped him. Begging your pardon, sir, where would I find the crew's quarters? The man squinted at Nathan, giving him a full-body glance. The sailor lifted a shoulder and nodded to the door behind Nathan. Through that room there, what need have you with the crew's quarters? Nathan let out a heavy breath. It seems that is where I have been sold passage for the journey. The first mate indicated all the staterooms were otherwise occupied. The sailor grunted. There aren't many hammocks left, but Evans is still about. He can direct you to an empty one. Ha hammock Nathan stuttered, and then swallowed hard. He had heard of such accommodations, but had never imagined sleeping in one. 
The thought of swaying back and forth with the waves made his stomach royal again. Thank you, I shall seek out Mr Evans. The sailor shrugged and hurried up the staircase, disappearing from view. Nathan pushed through the door the man had indicated, into a small larder. Another door stood at the opposite side. Stepping through the door, he stopped in his tracks. Rows upon rows of tightly spaced hammocks hung from the rafters and support beams. Nathan's mouth dropped open slightly. At least his earlier apprehension about swinging to and fro seemed less likely now, for there was not enough room between hammocks to allow much of a sway. He looked around for the man called Evans. A boy, not much more than fifteen in Nathan's estimation, stepped out from behind a row of canvas. He took a surprised step back when he spotted Nathan. Excuse me, sir, but the staterooms are at the stern of the ship, the next level up. Nathan's head shook of its own accord. No, this is the passage I paid for. I am looking for a Mr Evans. I was told he could point me to a vacant berth. The boy stepped toward Nathan, his chin jutted out. It's just Evans, sir. He hooked a finger behind him. The top hammock is available. He took several steps towards Nathan and eyed him closely. On second thought, you look a little green. Perhaps you'd be best on my lower one at the bottom there. He moved over to a support beam and pulled off a bucket hanging on a nail. He held it toward Nathan. You may be needing this also, sir. Nathan held up his hand to object when the ship pitched again, sending him falling into Evans. Nathan quickly pushed himself back to his feet and accepted the bucket, briefly thinking he might need it. Thank you, just Evans. The boy opened his mouth to correct Nathan until he smiled. Then Evans nodded, seeming to realise Nathan's joke. You're welcome, sir. Nathan held out one hand while bracing himself on the beam next to him. You can call me Nathan, just Evans. Nathan smiled for a split second, until the breakfast he had eaten earlier began a hasty climb up his throat. He pulled his hand away from Evans, barely getting the bucket to his face before he heaved. Evans had wisely taken a large step back, but now he came forward and helped Nathan into the hammock at the bottom of the stack. He took the bucket, holding it far out in front of him, and placed a clean one on the floor beside Nathan's hammock. I will dispose of this, Nathan. He said Nathan's name slowly, as if it felt odd on his lips. You just rest there. I have to report to duty, but I will send someone down to check on you soon. Nathan moaned as he heaved again. Evans hurriedly placed the already soiled bucket under Nathan's face. Nathan closed his eyes, willing the swaying to stop. His body began to shiver and his head pounded even harder. His stomach pitched again, but there was nothing left to come up. Leave me here to die in peace, just Evans. I do not wish to keep you from your duties. Evans let out a chuckle. Just give it some time, sir. Nathan, you will become accustomed to the swaying in time. Almost everyone does. Nathan cracked an eye at Evans and regretted it instantly as the hammock above him swung into his line of sight. He pinched his eyes shut as his stomach heaved again. Blood. What if he was one of the few that did not become accustomed to it? Chapter 4 Justina held tightly to Matthew's hand and pulled little Mabel up higher on her hip. She watched Penny, who walked several steps ahead of her, take in the sights around them. It was the first their mother had allowed the children above deck, due to the rain the first few days they had been on the ship. If Justina was being honest with herself, she had not been overly anxious to leave their rooms either. While she was not anticipating seeing Lord Nathaniel much, she did not relish the idea of happening upon him. It was not an overly large ship, after all, and the likelihood was great. Penny! Step back from the railing, dear. I do not want you to accidentally slip and tumble overboard. Justina tightened her grip on Maybell. Matthew pulled at her hand, trying to get to the railing. She allowed him to stand at the railing, but only because his head did not even reach the top. He peered through the rails, pointing at the waves in the distance. Several seamen passed behind them. Is the gentleman still ill? It's been days. Should he not be feeling better yet? Justina turned to the side, keeping a tighter grip on Matthew's hand. Excuse me, sir. Did you say there are still people who are not well? The men pulled up, straightening into attention. Yes, miss. A gentleman was sold passage with the crew. 
He's not left quarters since we cleared the harbour. Can't even stay in his hammock. He's just been lying on the floor. Justina felt a tug in her chest. That was terrible and worrisome. Lord Nathaniel should be feeling better by now. Thank you for the information. She turned from the men and herded Penny away from the railing. Come, children, we need to return to our chambers. I need to attend to something. After I am done, I will bring you back up. Perhaps we will even see a dolphin. Oh, but we just came out. We have been shut up in the room for such a long time. Penny looked up at her with a pout on her lips. Can we not stay outdoors while you see to your errand? Justina felt for the children. She was just as excited as they were to be out in the sunshine and fresh air. She shook her head. Your mother would never permit it, but I promise to hurry. Let me do this one thing and then we will stay out for at least an hour's time. Penny sulked. And I shall release you from studying your numbers for today. Justina smiled, knowing that would be enough to convince the girl. As suspected, Penny quickened her pace toward the staircase. Come on, Justina, let us get to our room. I should not wish to keep you from your errand. Justina laughed at the girl's change in attitude. Penny burst through the door of the room and Aunt Martin sighed. What are you doing back so soon? I thought you were to stay outside for some time. Justina put Maybell in the small crib and handed her a small doll. The baby cooed at the toy and promptly stuffed a hand in her mouth. Going to a trunk tucked under the bed, Justina took out two slates and placed them on Matthew and Penny's laps. Both of you practice your letters and words until I come back. She glanced back at her aunt, and please, do it quietly so your mother can have some peace. Justina took a small satchel from the trunk. If you are quiet while I am gone, I will give you each a piece of candy. Matthew's eyes widened, and he bent his head to the slate. Justina grinned and turned to her aunt. I will be back. I'm going to check on Lord Nathaniel. Some of the seamen mentioned he is still having trouble with seasickness. Her aunt nodded. Oh, the poor dear... Yes, you should go check in on him. I will see to the children. Justina slipped out of the room and moved toward the staircase leading to the lower level. She was not sure where the crew was housed on the ship, but surely there would be someone about who could direct her. She descended the stairs slowly, allowing her eyes to adjust to the decreasing light. Pushing open a door at the bottom of the staircase, she entered a larder of sorts. The door on the opposite side opened, and a man backed through it, holding a tray of uneaten food. He straightened once inside the larder, setting the tray on a barrel. Once she saw him from the front, she could see he was actually much younger than she thought. She cleared her throat and the man flinched. He looked over at her. His eyes widened. Justina smiled. I am sorry if I startled you. I was wondering where the crew is housed. He looked at her with weary eyes. It's not proper for a lady to be here, miss. It would be best if you returned to the deck or your stateroom. Justina nodded. I do not plan to stay long. I understand that Lord Nathaniel is not on the mend yet. I only wish to check in on him. The man nodded, and a look of relief passed over his face. He is not doing well. He has not eaten in days, nor had anything to drink. When he speaks, it is only nonsense. He led her into a long room, with hammocks hanging in neat rows. She followed him down a row. Lord Nathaniel lay on the floorboards midway down the aisle. Or at least... She thought it was Lord Nathaniel. He looked unlike she had ever seen him before. His sweaty hair was plastered to his pale brow. In the darkness, it was hard to tell if his pallor was more pale or green, but whatever it was, he did not look well. Her chest constricted, and she pulled at the ribbon tied at her back. Sir Evans, miss. Justina smiled at him. Thank you, Mr Evans. I am Miss Tinsdale. Now, would you please bring him to my stateroom? I will see to his care. She did not know why she was taking such liberties, or why she even cared what happened to this man, but something propelled her actions forward. Mr Evans raised his brows. I will move in with my aunt and have my uncle stay in the room with Lord Nathaniel. That seemed to drop his brows. She motioned to Lord Nathaniel. Now, if you could help him to my stateroom, I should be most grateful. The man nodded and bent forward, hoisting Lord Nathaniel onto his shoulder like he was a sack of flour. A stench filled the area around them at the movement. Justina placed a gloved hand to her nose and mouth. The seaman wrinkled his nose and nodded. He hasn't always made it to the bucket. The other men will not be unhappy to see him gone. Justina nodded. 
How was she to get him bathed? Her uncle had not bought a valet, thinking to hire one once they reached India, and obviously Lord Nathaniel was currently without one. Would one of the crew members take pity on her and perform the task? She shook her head. She could worry about that later. For now, she needed to get him out of here and up where she could help take care of him. He may be a rake, but he still deserved some kindness, did he not? That is what the vicar in her childhood parish had taught. She followed behind, keeping her hand to her nose as much as possible. Remaining in the corridor, she directed Mr Evans to place Lord Nathaniel in the lower berth. Hers was one of the smaller rooms, making the quarters quite close with even just Evans inside. She thanked him as he joined her in the passageway. Thank you, Mr Evans. He nodded. It's just Evans, Miss Tinsdale. Thank you, Evans. She placed a hand on his arm. I am sure Lord Nathaniel appreciates the care you have given him. I hope it has not been too much of a burden on you with your other duties. He just ducked his head and moved away. He turned before ascending the stairs. I will talk to the captain about having the tub sent down. Oh, thank you, Evans. He nodded and headed up the stairs. Justina left the door ajar and poked her head next door. Aunt, I have had Lord Nathaniel brought to my room. He is very ill indeed. I was hoping I might sleep in here with you or the children, until he is well enough to sleep elsewhere. I can make up a pallet on the floor. Her aunt raised one brow, but nodded her head. I think he will need some ginger tea, and he is in great need of a bath. Now both of her aunt's brows rose. Oh? Justina sighed. I must go inquire of the cook to get some hot water for the tea, and ask the captain if he can spare a man to give Lord Nathaniel a bath, seeing as Lord Nathaniel did not bring a valet along. Very well, dear. Go and make the arrangements. I shall listen in and make sure he is well until you return. Justina's shoulder relaxed. Thank you, aunt. She left the room and headed to the galley in search of hot water. But as she entered, she rethought her plans. Perhaps it would be best if there was nothing in his stomach when Lord Nathaniel was bathed. She found the cook, a wrinkled man with as many teeth missing as were still present. Justina twisted her hands in front of her. Excuse me, sir, I was hoping I might be able to trouble you for some water. It is to bathe one of the passengers. He has been very ill and is in desperate need of one. The cook, Henley, was hesitant, but when she smiled sweetly at him, he relinquished and nodded his head. I can only spare a few pots full, miss. This water must last us until we reach the cape. Justina nodded, smiling at the whistle his missing teeth caused in the words with S's and thuzz. Whatever you can spare will be greatly appreciated. She bit her lower lip. Would it be too much trouble to heat the water? She tilted her head, hoping it would be enough to make him agree. He let out a sigh. It will take about thirty minutes, miss. I will send someone up with it when it is ready. She clapped her hands and reached out, squeezing the man's arm gently. Oh, thank you, Mr Henley. He blushed and waved her away. No, none of that. You hurry along and I will heat your water. Justina felt a little of the tightness in her chest release. Lord Nathaniel was not on the mend yet, but this was surely a start. She made her way back to her chambers. A small round half-barrel sat on the floor, nearly taking all of the space between the berth and the wall. It seemed this was the tub, and Evans had been true to his word. Justina left the door to the room open and walked over to examine the tub. She did not envy the person who would be tasked with trying to fit Lord Nathaniel's six-foot frame into that barrel, especially as Lord Nathaniel would not likely be of much help himself. She sighed, and he let out a soft moan. She bent over the bed and ran a hand across his forehead. In the small light provided by the porthole window in her room, she could see the sinking of his eyes. If he did not get some food and water into his body soon, he would undoubtedly die. A knock sounded at the door, and Justina turned to see Evan standing in the doorway, a pot in his hands. "'I figured you would not be able to bathe him, miss. I asked the captain and he agreed to let me help you, but he, he said to tell you this is the last I can be spared for Nathan.' Evans looked at his feet. He, he also said to give you this. He handed forward a paper. Justina took it and glanced down. It listed several items and sums to the side. Justina looked up. Is this a bill for the water and the use of the tub? Evans nodded, not meeting her gaze. I, I tried to explain. You do not need to explain, Evans. I know this is not your doing. 
I also know that the captain is a businessman. I can see this for what it is. He is afraid Lord Nathaniel will die before he gets his money. She looked down at the sum and moved to her reticule, withdrawing the required coins. I will go pay the captain while you help Lord Nathaniel. Evans nodded. I think he must have a change of clothes in his haversack. If not, slip this ribbon under the door and I will borrow something from my uncle. Again, Evans only nodded. Justina pointed to a bar of soap on the writing desk. It may not be the most masculine scent, but it will be a marked improvement, I am sure. She gave Evans one last quick smile and quit the room. As the door clicked closed behind her, she leant against it and took in a deep breath. Even the stale air below deck was better than what was in that room currently. Her feet carried her quickly up the stairs, and pushing out onto the deck she took in a huge gulp. The first mate met her on the deck, dipping his head in a bow. Miss Tinsdale, I understand you have taken over care of our unexpected guest. He said the last word with slight disdain in his voice. Justina nodded. Am I to give this to you or to the captain? She held out the paper to him. It fluttered about, and she knew if she loosened her grip it would be lost. The first mate nodded and extended his hand. He took the paper from her and she dropped the coins into his hand. Please let the captain know it is paid. She turned to leave, and also, please thank him for allowing Evans to help me with Lord Nathaniel. I appreciate it, and I believe Lord Nathaniel will also, once he has come to his senses. The first mate nodded. I shall pass on your comments, miss. Justina looked at the door to the staircase, dreading the idea of going back below. But Evans would make quick work of the job, and she did not want to keep him from his duties any longer than necessary. When she arrived at the door, her ribbon stuck just into the corridor. Of course Lord Nathaniel had not packed a change of clothes. He had not anticipated a trip to India when he left his estate. Or had he been staying in London? She was not sure where he had run from. She knocked once on her aunt's door and opened it. Would Uncle mind too terribly loaning Lord Nathaniel some clothing until his can be cleaned? Aunt Martin let out an exasperated sigh. Had I known he would be this much trouble, I should never have introduced you. Justina grinned. Which time? I had thought the man more gentlemanly at the time. Aunt Martin dug through a trunk and withdrew a shirt and a pair of trousers. She handed them to Justina. You realise these will not fit him properly. Your uncle is at least a hand shorter and two stones heavier than Lord Nathaniel. Justina grinned. Then perhaps it will teach him to pack better before he flees. Chapter 5 Nathan felt his head lift and something warm flow down his throat. His eyes felt heavy and it seemed nearly impossible for him to open them. A soft humming sounded next to him, but he didn't recognise the tune, or the voice for that matter. Could it be his mother? He did not remember ever hearing his mother hum. He shifted his body, rolling to his side. Perhaps his eyes would open easier this way, without gravity working against them. Oh, there now. Are you coming round? The voice was distinctly female, but Nathan could honestly say he had no notion as to whom it belonged. He pushed his lids open, an unfamiliar space coming into focus in front of him. Nathan tried to push himself up, a tickle of panic forming in his chest. Oh, where am I? A gentle hand rested on his chest and pushed him back onto the bed. Do not try to get up yet. I'm afraid your legs will crumble beneath you should you try. Nathan stared at the young woman sitting in the chair at the writing desk. She looked vaguely familiar, but he could not place her name. You are on board the Calcutta Star, a merchant ship bound for India. India? Pieces of memory started to come back to him. Lady Elizabeth and her father jumping on board the departing ship to escape. Nathan relaxed back against the mattress. Oh, yes, India. But wait, was he not relegated to sleeping with the crew? What was he doing in a stateroom? He looked at the lady staring down at him, smiling, and the memory of Mrs Martin introducing them also came back to him. But what was her name? Why could that piece not have come back as well? What am I doing in this room? I, I was to be sleeping with the crew. She grinned, as if she was enjoying something about this situation. But then, did not most women enjoy their time with him? You are in my stateroom, my lord. It seems the sea does not suit you. The seamen were more than happy to see you. 
and your foul smell leave their quarters. Her lips twitched, and Nathan realised it was not being with him that she was enjoying. He glanced down at his attire, only now noting that his shirt and several thin blankets were all that covered him. He pushed up slightly, resting his cheek in the palm of his hand, and looked at the lady with brows raised. A bland look was all the response he received from her. She motioned to the door with her head. The door is always open, my lord, and up until now no one thought me in danger with a man who is not even lucid. She stood, and the scent of jasmine drifted past his nose. Where are my clothes? he asked, with a hint of seductiveness in his voice. Her nose wrinkled. Several thought it best to throw them overboard. But as you had no other clothes in your haversack, Evans thought it best if we keep them someplace well ventilated, until you are well enough to wash them out yourself. Nathan's brows dropped and his nose flared. Me? Wash them? Why, I am a gentleman. I have no notion of how to clean them. That is why I employ a valet and other such servants. The woman looked around the room. Where have you been hiding these servants, my lord? I would have appreciated their aid in your recovery. This lady had a saucy tongue. It was curious. Nathan did not recall ever being treated in such a manner. It was not disrespectful, yet it was certainly not the usual tittering that accompanied his conversations with women. But I have secured a pair of trousers from my uncle. She motioned to something at the foot of the berth. They will certainly be ill-fitting, but then you have little other choices now, do you? He squinted up at her. Who was this woman? It seems I am in your debt. The boat lurched, and Nathan closed his eyes, waiting for the turn of his stomach that had been his constant companion for days, or at least the days he remembered. But no churning came. He cracked open an eye and was greeted by a smile. Are you well, my lord? He opened both eyes and sat up on his elbows. His muscles felt shaky, probably from the lack of food over the last few days. But other than that, he felt perfectly normal. I am quite well, miss, but I can hardly account for it. She clasped her hands in front of her. I believe it is the ginger tea, my lord. She bit her lower lip, and Nathan sighed. My Uncle Martin quite swears by it. He never boards a ship without it. It seems to be a miracle cure, then. I shall have to thank your uncle when next I see him. She glanced down at her hands, her mouth frowning slightly. But first, I must thank you. You have done far more than I likely deserve, miss. He let it trail off, hoping she might think he had not intended to say her name, rather than the notion that he still could not remember it for the life of him. She looked up at him, her brows raised in expectation. Yes? Miss? Tarnation. She knew, and she was going to make him say it out loud, which would, no doubt, end with a lecture from her on his thoughtless nature. Not that she would be so very wrong, but still he did not relish the idea. He took in a deep breath. I think you have already realised I have once again forgotten your name. He scooted back on the bunk, waiting for the peal she would surely ring over his head. But none came. She sat back down in the chair and looked at him. I shall still consider our previous encounter a success. At least this time you remember that you should know my name, even if you don't remember it. Her lips began to twitch again. She thought the entire situation funny, and at his expense, well, are you going to enlighten me, or shall I just think up my own name for you? She tilted her head to the side. And what name would you give me, my lord? She leant forward, and he breathed in deeply. Jasmine. She raised a brow, and that is easier for you to remember than Justina or Miss Tinsdale. It is not as if my name is so common as to slip the mind. Nathan nodded. Oh, yes, Miss Justina Tinsdale. How did he forget that name? He had never heard of the name for a woman. Justina, that is a ridiculous name for a lady. But every time you move near me, I shall remember the name Jasmine. It is the smell I shall always associate with you. Her face pinked, and Nathan sat up taller in the bed. In his brief experience, a blush had not been an easy thing to pull out of this young woman, but he found a deep satisfaction at having done it. Justina, how did you come to be named such a decidedly male name? She sat back in the chair, 
I have two older sisters, both of whom are named by my mother. When I came along and was another girl, my father feared he should never get a son. He insisted that he would be the one to decide upon my name, so I was named after him, in case his fears were realised. She looked off at something above his head, a grin on her lips. My mother was mortified, but what could she do? Nathan scratched at his head. But just naming you after him did not change anything, did it? Is his estate not entailed? Miss Tinsdale nodded, a chuckle sounding. I did not say his actions were sound or in any way made sense. She shrugged. But I adore my father, so I find I do not mind it much. And were his fears realised? Miss Tinsdale shook her head. No, I have two younger brothers. My father's estate and title were protected. Nathan dropped back down onto the bed. Well, I... I find I do not like your name. It is far too masculine for you. I shall call you Jasmine. It suits you far better. Miss Jasmine tusked and glanced over at him. Do not go making promises you cannot keep, my lord. I am not yet convinced you shall remember me when next you awaken. Nathan grimaced. While she said the words in jest, there was an underlying tone of... What? Hurt? Or was it a certainty that she was right? Perhaps it was both. A knot formed in Nathan's stomach, but this time it had nothing to do with the swaying of the ship. Then perhaps we should take a turn about the deck so I may become better acquainted with you. Surely you will not believe me capable of forgetting a friend. She stared at him, but there was no change in her countenance. She was still obviously wary of him, and why not? Had she not witnessed his mad escape from Lord Mulvan? She may not know the whole of the story, but she seemed an intelligent girl one who could discern the truth. She pushed herself off the chair. You are probably half-starved. I shall go to the kitchens and ask the cook if he can spare some food. Before Nathan could agree or decline, she was out the door and out of sight. He folded his hands over his chest. He had just held a complete conversation with a woman while in his nightclothes and lying in bed. He could honestly say that had never happened to him before. Not that he had ever wanted it to happen, He'd always considered conversation something left to the drawing rooms and parlours, not the bedchamber. But now that it had happened, he found himself reconsidering his stance on the matter. Or perhaps it was just his earlier assumptions of Jasmine that he was reconsidering. She was not as overly proper as he had originally assumed. She was actually quite a pleasant conversationalist, and she was obviously kind. The fact that she had taken an interest in his well-being attested to that fact. He found... He did not even find her as plain as he had when he'd first glimpsed her. She was no Lady Elizabeth, but... He shook his head. Lady Elizabeth had turned out to be no prize, but he need not think on that subject any more. Nathan nodded, and a smile stole across his lips. Perhaps this trip would not seem so tedious, after all. Chapter 6 Justina walked along the deck of the ship, Maybell on her hip. After delivering Lord Nathaniel his food, she had needed to escape his company, and her cousins provided the perfect excuse. After all, he was able to eat on his own and no longer needed her attentions. Maybell lay her head on Justina's shoulder. Justina tilted her head, resting it on the girl's soft fabric bonnet. The little girl let out a contented sigh and Justina wished she felt the same peace. For some reason, since her conversation with Lord Nathaniel, her nerves felt jumpy and on edge. She did not know if it was the intimacy of the setting or the easiness with which they had spoken. But something felt different, unsettling. She remembered him calling her Jasmine, and her skin broke out in goose flesh, a shiver running down her back. No, she scolded herself. She would not become one of those simpering bits of muslin who pined and hung on his every word, waiting for Lord Nathaniel to single her out. She knew what kind of man he was. Just because he finally remembered her, in a way, did not mean anything. Thoughts of Lord Grayson pressed into her mind, bringing with them the old sting she'd grown accustomed to. She had once longed for Lord Grayson to notice her, but he'd already married another before she had set out on this journey. She couldn't fault him for it. There had never been any partiality on his part. Just kindness. Justina pulled Maybell tighter into her, shielding the child from the breeze and closing her own eyes. Could it be that the sting had begun to lessen? 
Jasmine. The memory of Lord Nathaniel's name for her chased any lingering thought or previous dreams from her mind. Jasmine. Justina opened her eyes, realising it was not just in her mind she was hearing the name. Lord Nathaniel walked toward her, his hands held out to the side, as if he was using them to keep his balance. He smiled when she caught his gaze. Lord Nathaniel, are you certain it is wise for you to be up and about so soon after your recovery? He stood next to her. I feel better than I have since setting foot on this dratted boat. He took in a deep breath and lifted his face to the sunshine. This fresh air can do nothing but help me after the staleness of the stateroom. She looked him over, noticing the absence of his form-fitting trousers. His waistcoat and tailcoat were obviously his own, snugly hugging the muscles in his arms and tapering nicely at the waist. But the trousers were a different story altogether, hanging loosely on his hips and legs. She laughed, putting a hand to her mouth to cover it. Lord Nathaniel had used a rope to keep the trousers tight around his waist, but the seat bagged and the legs ballooned out over the tops of his hessians. Lord Nathaniel offered a bow. What, pray tell, do you find so amusing, Miss Jasmine? I should think you would be relieved to see me up and out of your bed. Justina felt her cheeks heat. Am I to assume you will be returning to your hammock with the crew? He cringed. It would be the gentlemanly thing to do. He eyed her with a raised brow. Unless you are willing to share your room with me. Justina laughed, even as she widened her eyes at him. I think not, my lord. She shook her head. Even the suggestion... She trailed off, unable to think on the improperness of his suggestion. He dropped his chin to his chest. Then I suppose I am relegated back to the dingy crew's quarters. He looked down at her from under the shadow of his hair. But I thank you for allowing me the use of it during my unfortunate illness. I shall impose on you no longer. My haversack has already been removed. He took in a deep breath. They have even allowed me to change to an upper berth now that there is no fear of sickness. Maybell let out a slobbery breath, and Lord Nathaniel looked down at her, as if just noticing the child was on Justina's hip. And who might this young one be? His voice dropped to a whisper, barely discernible over the breeze and crashing of the waves. Justina smoothed a few curls away from the girl's face and smiled down at her. This is Maybell. She is my cousin. It is one of the reasons I am coming to India with my aunt and uncle. I am to function as a companion for my aunt and teacher to my cousins. She moved Maybell to her other side, hoping not to wake the sleeping child. Aunt Martin will hire nurses and other servants, so I will not be needed for those sorts of tasks, but she worried there would not be anyone suitable to teach the children. Lord Nathaniel nodded his head slowly. How long do you plan to stay in India? Justina swallowed, pushing back the homesickness which had already begun to press down on her, at least as long as my aunt and uncle are in residence. But, but that could be years, Lord Nathaniel sputtered, as if he cared. Decades even, if previous partners of the East India Company are to be used as an example. Justina nodded. Yes, that is a possibility. Lord Nathaniel's mouth dropped open. But will you not miss England? Justina's throat tightened, and a lump formed, making it difficult to fully swallow. I am sure it will be an adjustment, but there is very little for me in England. I am already considered on the shelf in the eyes of the ton. She took a halting breath. Not that I expect to find a match in India, but I can be of assistance to my aunt, and I will be able to attend social functions, so it is not as if I will be completely without society. She pulled the bottom of her cloak up over Maybell. And what of you, my lord? How long are you to stay in India? I know this was not in your plans. She could not get the topic of conversation off herself fast enough. He sat down on the deck, motioning for her to join him, their backs leaning against the wall of the upper deck. Justina carefully repositioned Maybell onto her lap, tucking the cloak about her. I had considered disembarking at the first stop we make to resupply, Lord Nathaniel said. I believe the first mate mentioned that to be the Cape of Good Hope. He tilted his head to the side, but I have not made any plans as yet. He shrugged. Until this morning I could not even lift a cup to my lips. Planning the next year of my life seemed like an impossible task. A smile tugged at her lips. She could understand why so many ladies fell under his spell. He was really very charming. Although, she bit the inside of her cheek. 
This man did not fit the picture she had formed of him in her mind. From all she had seen of him with other ladies, he was outlandish and excessive. But this man, sitting on the deck in trousers which were not his own, did not fit that notion. It was perplexing. She caught him watching her, and he grinned when she realised she had been staring at him also. It is the cut of my trousers, is it not? You find you are unable to keep your eyes off of me. His eyes sparkled with mirth, and Justina's lips turned up in response. I can assure you, my lord, the cut of your trousers would be completely lost on me. The realisation of how much danger she could be in if he continued in this manner hit her. She shifted Maybell to her other side, placing the girl between herself and Lord Nathaniel. It would not be wise to let herself think anything could be possible with Lord Nathaniel. What is it you were thinking about that made you smile before? Justina raised a brow, thinking quickly to cover the whole truth. I was recalling the looks on Lords Mulvan and Hartleson's faces when they spotted you on the deck of the ship. I thought for a moment they might jump in and swim for it. Lord Nathaniel chuckled. Yes, I think they believed they had me cornered. But I had the last laugh. Justina threw her head back and laughed, causing Maybell to wiggle. She clamped her mouth shut until the girl settled back to sleep. She whispered, Yes, you most definitely had the last laugh, as you are the one travelling to India. What could you possibly have been thinking, my lord? What if this ship had been bound for Australia? India is about as far as one could go, is it not? He shrugged. I was not thinking, beyond escaping Lord Malvern. Had he caught me, I have no doubt he would have shackled me to the back of a wagon and carted me back to Cambridge to have me riveted to his daughter. Justina looked at him hard. If you find the notion so appalling, why did you pursue Lady Elizabeth in the first place? She had heard the rumours. They had spread through the ton like an uncontrolled fire. Justina did not understand the gentleman's thinking. He wrinkled his nose several times as he rubbed at a mark on his boots. I was interested at first. He stopped, and Justina figured it must be the beginning of a lie. Perhaps that is a bit of a bouncer. Lady Elizabeth is beautiful, and she was the most sought-after lady of the season. It was a challenge to win her affections. He glanced up at Justina, but looked quickly away. However, she does not have the most charming personality. She scolds and simpers till a man considers the grave a more desirable situation. He sighed. It is why I sent her the note, asking her to meet me in the library. I wished to inform her that there would be no arrangement between us. I had hoped to do so without drawing the attention of the ton. He ran a hand through his hair. But that is not how it happened. He snapped his mouth shut and pulled one of his knees up to his chest, clasping his hands around it. What do you wish to see or do while you are in India, Miss Jasmine? Her stomach gave a flop at the sound of her new name on his lips, and she scolded it. She gave a wistful sigh. More than anything, I wish to at least see an elephant. But I should greatly love to ride upon one. Her eyes widened. Can you imagine such a thing? I saw the elephant at Exeter Change Royal Menagerie. The poor, sad thing was chained up behind bars, and it was in such a small space for so large an animal. But to see one outside of a menagerie... She took in a deep breath, chancing her first look at Lord Nathaniel since starting her elephant lecture. His whole face was crinkled with a wide smile. I have never seen someone display such enthusiasm about anything, much less an animal. What is it like to feel that way? She shrugged and looked away. I am only being childish. I should not have spoken in such a way. Please forgive me. He shook his head. I shall not. It was refreshing, and I am in hopes that even a fraction of your enthusiasm will somehow transfer to me in our time aboard this ship. She tried to give him a bland look, even as the heat continued to build, spreading to the tips of her ears. Now you are teasing me. A smile dropped from his face and Justina sucked in a breath at the sincerity she saw there. On the contrary, Miss Jasmine, I have never been more serious. Chapter 7 Nathan climbed quietly from the hammock, using the cannon beneath as a step to the floor. Several of the hammocks around him hung low with the weight of men. He picked up his boots and crept from the room, all evidence he had seen indicated the men in those hammocks would sleep through whatever noise he made, but still he felt the need to quit the room as quietly as possible. 
He exited the door at the far end of the room and made his way to the stairs, the sound of shouting and laughter filling his ears. He emerged from the stairs into the small room the crew used to take their meals and do any other chores that could not be accomplished above deck. At first glance, he did not immediately see where the noise came from. As he cleared the doorway, he searched the room, noticing in the far corner a group of men huddled on the floor in a circle. Nathan grinned when he saw Evans's head pop up from the farthest side of the circle. The young man noticed Nathan and gave him a quick dip of his head. Nathan strode over to the group. Every head was bent toward the centre of the circle, making only a small hole in the middle in which to see what they were about. One of the men shook his hand, throwing a pair of dice into the centre of the circle. The men let up a whoop. Evans motioned to the men across from him. Make a space, men. Let his lordship join in the fun. Nathan waved them away. No need. I am content to watch. Evans quirked his head to the side, a lopsided smirk on his face. You chicken-livered, my lord. A single brow rose on Nathan's forehead. No one calls me chicken-livered, just Evans. You realise you are doing just as he desires, do you not? A sweet feminine voice sounded at his elbow. He turned and noticed Miss Jasmine standing next to him with a knowing look in her eyes. She leant in and whispered conspiratorially, They only wish to take your money, my lord. His mouth turned up of its own accord. You think me quite daft, do you not, Miss Jasmine? I am not fresh from the schoolroom, you know. He leant into her, the smell of her filling his senses. He paused as he took in a deep breath. I am wise to their intent. They make little money. If I can help pad their pockets on a sporting game of chance, why should I not? He knelt down on the floor in the gap made by the seamen. Sitting back on his haunches, he winked at her. Besides, I am quite the hand at hazard. Miss Jasmine placed her hands on her hips and narrowed her eyes at him. But a smile played at the corners of her mouth. It is a game of chance, my lord. No one can boast proficiency at such a game. He shrugged. And yet, I am. Stand back and watch, Miss Jasmine. I am sure to dazzle you with my abilities. Evans chuckled before handing Nathan the dice. We have all had a turn as the caster. Why do you not give it a go? Nathan nodded, looking around the circle at the faces of the men eager to strip him of his money. He swirled the dice around in his palm, and then, with a flick of his wrist, sent the dice skittering across the circle. The dice stopped, with one showing a four and the other a three. Nathan pounded his fist into the palm of his other hand. He turned his head and looked over his shoulder at Miss Jasmine. You see, the most optimal number for the main, and on my first try. She looked heavenward, as if trying to contain her irritation with him, but still her smile hovered. Nathan turned back to the game as wages were being given to the setter, a man named Jones. Nathan withdrew a roll of notes from his pocket and handed over his wager. Jones looked at the one-pound note and raised a brow at Nathan. Nathan smiled, but cast a quick wink over his shoulder at Miss Jasmine. If you would quit coquetting with the mist there, we could get on with this game. A gruff voice brought Nathan's head back around to the game. He was not sure who had made the comment, but it made him pause. Did it appear he was flirting with Miss Jasmine, earning a growl from several other players? Very well, gentlemen. I have never seen such an impatient lot to lose their money. He grinned at each man in the circle. Nathan again shook the dice in his hand and flung them onto the wooden planks of the floor. The total of eleven between the two dice brought a growl from a large man on the opposite side of the circle. Nathan let out a hoot as Jones began to divvy out the money to the outstretched hands. Nathan rolled five more times before finally throwing out and handing the dice to the man on his left. He placed his wager before standing up to stretch his legs. Miss Jasmine moved up next to him. I thought you were to lose your money so as to help these men, not to take it from them. Her whisper was terse and her brows drawn down. He put his hand on her arm and guided her back several steps. It is the overall plan, yes, but if I were to lose every time it would be suspicious. These are proud men, Miss Jasmine. They do not wish to be the object of pity or charity. She eyed him closely, as if she was not sure to believe his words. The notion brought a slight hardening to his stomach, and he dropped his head down. Why did he care if she believed him? Had they not known each other for just over three weeks? It was not as if she was his mother and he was seeking her good opinion, and yet 
As she continued to study him, he felt the need to prove his earnestness to her. A noise went up, and Nathan returned his focus to the game. Please excuse me, Miss Jasmine. It seems you are distracting me from the game. He placed another wager, and he noted Miss Jasmine moved closer to see the outcome of the roll. It took some time until it was again Nathan's turn to be caster. He knelt back down, rolling the dice in front. He rolled a six. Why could he never have this kind of luck when he played Hazard with Ian or Tierney? Of course, the luck would come when he was playing with men who had not the means to be playing in the first place. Nathan handed over four pounds to the new setter, although Nathan did not recall the man's name, if he had even heard it. The man's mouth dropped open slightly at the large bet. Nathan heard Miss Jasmine suck in a breath behind him. He pushed her obvious doubts aside and rolled again. The dice fell on the floor at his knees and Nathan saw that it would turn up as twelve, barely before the dice had stopped spinning. He did not intend to win this round, hence the large wager. Drat his turn of luck. He coughed, drawing most of the eyes toward him, as he had hoped. He dropped his hand down and flicked the die closest to him, turning it so the two instead came to a total of eleven. He jerked his hand upward quickly, hoping no one had seen the change in the dice. Thunder and turf, he growled. I beg your pardon. The staleness of the air must be causing an itch in my throat. He looked down at the dice and winced for effect. Yes, I am sure it is the air that is driving you from the game. Jones laughed as he looked at his share of the large pot. What is it, my lord? Afraid your luck is worn out. Nathan grimaced. It is fortunate I paid the first mate for my passage when first I boarded. I am certain you fellows will have fleeced me of all my money by the time we make port at the Cape. He pushed himself to standing and turned toward the stairs at the back of the room, but stopped and turned back. Until next time, my good sirs. He made a flourish with his hand and bowed to the seamen, a smile touching his lips. If anyone had seen his sleight of hand, they had not made mention of it. He hoped that remained the case, as he very much wanted to be invited to play again. He turned back toward the stairs and saw Miss Jasmine staring at him. What thoughts could possibly be going through that mind of hers? Her head tilted to the side and her brow was furrowed, as if she were trying to puzzle through an exceptionally taxing problem. He walked over to her and held out his arm. Miss Jasmine, would you care to take a turn about the upper deck with me? I find I am in need of some air after that rather remarkable loss. She continued to watch him, but nodded and wrapped her hand around his elbow. He led her up the tight, narrow stairs and opened the door onto the deck. The door was ripped from his grasp, swinging and slamming into the wall behind it. Nathan stepped out, instinctively placing his other hand over Miss Jasmine's, lest the wind pick her up and carry her away. Perhaps we should return to below deck. I fear you may be swept away. He practically screamed at her so as to be heard over the wind. She shook her head. It is not so very bad. Look, the sky is still blue. She nodded her head to a spot up against the wall of the quarter deck above. The wind should be blocked if we are up against that wall. If you are serious about needing air, that would be the best spot. He looked between her and the wall. Was she in earnest? It was at least twelve feet before they would be sheltered by the quarter deck wall. Twelve feet of rather fierce winds and little to grasp onto to keep their balance. He returned his gaze to her. She seemed to be waiting for him to make the decision, but when he hesitated, she shook her head and set out across the deck without him. What the devil are you doing? Nathan hurried out after her, grasping hold of her hand. She shook him free and scowled at him, yelling at him through the wind. I have seen how steady you are on your feet, my lord. I should prefer to make my way there by myself. I do not need you to drag me into the Atlantic with you. He wanted to argue with her, but a large wave crashed against the bow of the ship, sending water flowing over the decks. Miss Jasmine quickened her pace, reaching the wall and settling under the stairs leading to the quarterdeck. He joined her there only seconds later. Are you trying to be washed overboard, Miss Jasmine? She shook her head and closed her eyes, taking in a long, deep breath. Her face sparkled with droplets of water, and Nathan had the sudden urge to wipe them away. He took a step back. She opened her eyes and smiled. I was in need of fresh air also, my lord. The children are currently resting, and if I do not come up now I shall lose the opportunity. We shall be working on sums and number writing the rest of the afternoon. 
Her voice was softer, as the wall not only buffered the wind, but some of the noise also. Oh, I had no idea. I am sorry to have delayed you with the game of hazard. Again she looked at him with a look he had never seen, although different from the one she had pierced him with below deck. You did not force me to stay, my lord. She shifted her gaze and looked out toward the horizon. Standing next to him, she wrapped her arms tightly around her body. You are cold. He wished he had brought his greatcoat, but it was currently sitting at his estate in Cambridgeshire. He unbuttoned his tailcoat and pulled his arms out one after the other. Turning to her, he put the coat over her shoulders and noted her wide-eyed look. He reared back slightly. Do not look at me as if I have just ruined you. You are cold and I am presently without my greatcoat. She looked at his waistcoat and shirt sleeves, but he let out a frustrated sigh. We are not in a ballroom in England, Miss Jasmine. We are on a windy ship in the middle of the Atlantic. I think we can loosen the strings of propriety this one time. She slipped her arms inside the sleeves of his coat and recrossed her arms. Thank you, my lord. She brought her eyes up to his. But will you not be cold? He shrugged. For some reason he was not the slightest bit cold at the moment. He watched as she caught her lower lip in between her teeth. He remembered thinking upon their first meeting that her teeth were too crooked to make her pretty. Staring as the pink of her lip became white as it dragged through those same teeth, he conceded they did not seem so very askew now. Curious that he had thought them so before. I saw what you did down there. You changed the dye on purpose. She pulled the coat tighter around her. Is that not what I told you I would do? He twisted and dropped his head to the side. Miss Jasmine, I understand you think me a complete rake and scoundrel, but do you think me a liar as well? Perhaps you think me completely devoid of a heart. Her face coloured. He wasn't sure if it was due to the cold or if he had managed to read her thoughts with precision. He scowled. If it was the latter, he did not think himself happy with the notion. Chapter 8 Did she believe him devoid of a heart? Everything she knew of him, prior to this voyage, told her he did not. Why do you do it? She had not intended to ask the question aloud, but now that she had, she truly wanted to know the answer. Why do I do what? He seemed genuinely confused by her question. Why have you ruined so many ladies' reputations? Such are not the actions of a man with a heart. His countenance changed, and his jaw hardened. I did nothing they did not want or deserve. Her stomach tightened. He was unhappy with this line of questions. The tension practically hummed between them. But if they were to be friends, she needed to understand him. She needed to know how he could be kind one moment and a scoundrel the next. The man she was coming to know did not seem capable of doing the awful things she was certain he had done. What could they possibly have done to deserve such treatment? By their very nature. By being ladies. His voice spat out the last word. They are all vipers, the whole lot of them. He folded his arms across his chest and glared out at the horizon. Justina assumed his same position, her spine stiffening. She was merely asking a question and did not deserve such disdain. I am a lady. Had she misjudged them these last few days? He scoffed, hardly the same thing. You are nothing like the others. And just what are the others like, my lord? He briefly shifted his gaze to her, then looked out over the deck. You know the type. Simpering and conniving. All they want is a title and some blunt. Justina stared at him. And what, may I ask, brought about this enlightened opinion? Her chin jutted out. The longer this conversation lasted, the angrier she felt. He narrowed his eyes at her, as if assessing what he should tell her before relaxing slightly. When I was a younger... Simpler man, I had the misfortune to fall in love and ask for the hand of a lady. Justina's mouth fell open. It was not what she had expected to hear, although what she had expected, she was not sure. Lord Nathaniel had been in love. She did not think him capable of such feelings. He frowned at her response, and she shut her mouth, her lips pinched together tightly. 
Before the final bands could be read, the lady threw me over in favour of a viscount with a more sizeable income. His breath came out slow and measured. I had thought her feelings the same as mine. But I was wrong. Justina's chest squeezed and her spine softened. Such an event must have been difficult to endure. She looked at him, about to excuse his poor behaviour, but then the lazy, charming smile she had seen him offer to so many ladies drifted through her mind. Her jaw hardened. So, an entire gender is to suffer at your hands because one woman spurned you. He was not the first to be wronged, yet he felt it his right, his duty even, to punish every woman except the one who had actually caused him hurt. Look around you, my lord. You are not the first to have been thrown over. Nor is it something that only happens to gentlemen. I have known plenty of ladies to be dismissed because a prettier face with a more handsome dowry came along. She took in a sharp, raggedy breath. Your pain does not excuse your actions. Her nostrils flared slightly, and she gave a stomp of her foot. You need to grow up, my lord. She stepped out from the protection of the wall, and the wind took hold of her bonnet, whipping the ribbons wildly about, the end slapping her on the cheek. But she did not care. She needed to be away from him and his selfish ways. The notion that he did not follow her only confirmed what she believed of him. He was a hopeless rake. Justina sat at the small desk in her stateroom, her elbow on the desk top and her chin in her hand. She stared at the painting of the English countryside hanging on the wall above. A tightness formed in her chest. Would she always feel this longing for home? In time, would it lessen and allow her to enjoy her new home in India? A soft touch on her hand brought her out of her thoughts. Penny sat across the desk, an expectant look on her face. Did I do my sums correctly, cousin? Justina shook all the remaining thoughts of England and her family estate away. It was doing no one any good for her to think on what was not to be. At least, not for some time. She focused her attention on the slate Penny had pushed across the desk to her. Running her finger next to the numbers written in a slightly meandering column, she added the numbers in her head. She lifted her eyes to meet those of her young cousin. Penny, you did very well. I am pleased with your progress, especially considering our surroundings. The girl beamed up at Justina. Thank you, cousin. I should like, in time, to see your numbers written in a more uniform column, but for now I am very pleased indeed. She moved the slate back across the desk. Please erase those numbers and I shall give you another group. Justina read off a set of five numbers and watched with a smile as Penny wrote. The tip of her tongue stuck out between her lips as she carefully lined the numbers up in a neater row than the previous set. Penny looked up when Justina quit reciting numbers. Justina nodded. That is all of them. You may begin your addition. Justina looked over at Matthew, who was tracing over the lines Justina had made of the numbers one through five. His chubby little fingers gripped the chalk like it was a wooden stick rather than a writing implement. Justina reached over and gently pried his fingers apart, then took the chalk in her own hand. She showed Matthew the correct way to hold it so that when he began to write with quills he would have an easier time of it. Matthew took a deep breath and pushed his lips out in a pout. But that way hurts my fingers. Justina pulled him over onto her lap and held his hand in hers. She wrapped their fingers around the pencil and brought the slate over in front of them. Starting with the number one, she used both their hands to trace the number. Matthew's hand pushed against hers, trying to free itself from the unfamiliar position. She held his hand slightly tighter and began to hum in his ear. His fingers relaxed and they traced each number slowly several times. A knock sounded on the door, and Aunt Martin poked her head in the door. It is time to ready for supper, children. Come, and we will let Justina enjoy some peace for a few moments. Matthew seemed reluctant to vacate his place on her lap, but when Justina released his hand from hers, he hopped down and joined his mother at the door. He looked back toward the table and returned to Justina's side. Reaching out, he grabbed the slate, taking it to show his mother. Aunt Martin smiled down at him and told him how pleased she was with his progress. Cousin, would you check my son before I leave with Mama? Penny pushed her slate across the desktop once more. Justina quickly checked it over. Perfectly done, Penny. Now run along. You know your father does not like to wait for supper. She stacked the slates and stood, moving to tuck them into her trunk. 
The children left their mother standing alone in the hallway. She moved into Justina's stateroom, but still hovered near the doorway. Dearest, each passing day only reaffirms to me how perfect the decision was for you to join us on this journey. I know not how my nerves would have handled these last six weeks without your help with the children. Justina smiled, her eyes flicking to the picture on the wall. I am happy I have come as well, and you know I adore the children. Her aunt sagged slightly. And they you. She glanced at the picture on the wall and then back to Justina. I have worried you are becoming homesick. Justina shrugged. There are moments when I feel the loss, but generally I am greatly anticipating our new home. It was only an understatement, rather than a complete lie. There were times when she was happy and excited. Her aunt nodded. Is there anything I can do to help? Anything which would make you feel more at home? She looked around the cramped room and grinned, or as at home as one can feel in a stale ship. Justina shut the lid of her trunk, finally meeting her aunt's eye. Once we are in India, perhaps we can find some watercolours or charcoal so I might draw. She sat down on her trunk. I'm sure there'll be much to see and draw in Calcutta. I have heard the colours there are like none I have ever seen, both in the flowers and in the clothing worn by the natives. Her aunt nodded her head. Yes, yes. Of course you shall have your paints, dearest. Is there anything else? Justina stood and moved over to her aunt. Placing an arm around her aunt's shoulders, she squeezed. I am content, aunt. Do not worry after me. Aunt Martin sighed. But I do, Justina. I think on you almost as my own daughter. I cannot bear to think you are unhappy because of something I have asked of you. Justina smiled. She may be homesick, but at least she was with people whom she loved and who loved her in return. She took in a deep breath. She could do this, be happy with the life she had chosen for herself. I am not unhappy. I believe we are all tiring of this ship, but I shall try to do better. Her aunt raised a brow. I should think the time you are spending with Lord Nathaniel would bring at least a hint of a smile to your lips. Justina scowled. She was still not sure what to think of him after their conversation the day before. Oh, come now, Aunt Martin. You know the sort of man he is. Besides, I am not the kind of lady the gentleman is known to pursue. She shrugged, even as her pulse accelerated for some unaccountable reason. I believe we may become friends, and that is precisely the way I should like to keep it with Lord Nathaniel. Justina gave her head a firm nod. Her aunt gave her a knowing smile. I think Lord Nathaniel need only find the right lady one who will love him in spite of his past faults. She moved toward the hallway. I know not why he acts as he does, but I think, underneath, he is a good man. You just wait. You will see that for yourself. Justina sighed and put her hand on her aunt's arm, gently pushing her toward the door. What happened to the peace Aunt Martin had boasted about earlier? She did not wish to think on Lord Nathaniel. Neither of them could force him to stop his rakish ways, that was something only Lord Nathaniel could decide. Justina's mouth pulled down, but realising her aunt would take it as a sign of discontentment, she quickly turned the frown upward. She would force herself to smile for the remainder of the journey, even if it killed her. Chapter 9 Nathan paced from one side of the room to the other, passing multiple hammocks on his route. He had not been able to get Jasmine's words out of his mind since she had stormed away from him the day before. He paused at the far end and shut his eyes, a burning sensation keeping them closed longer than he intended. He rubbed at the back of his neck. How dare she tell him he was the one in the wrong? She did not know his pain. She did not understand. Who did she think she was telling him he needed to grow up? It was plain to see that she thought herself far above him. Perspiration dotted his brow and he swallowed hard. She was wrong about him, and he would prove it to her. His brow furrowed. Why did he feel the need to prove anything to Jasmine? It was not as if he sought her good approval, and it was obvious she was not about to bestow it upon him. He sighed and rubbed harder at the knots in his neck. They still had close to a month before they would be stopping at the Cape. Whether he thought she deserved his attentions or not, the fact remained that she was the only person on board he found tolerable in the way of conversation. Just Evans proved amusing at times, but he was far too busy with his duties to provide much entertainment. 
and Mr. and Mrs. Martin were only tolerable in small doses. Nathan narrowed his eyes. Jasmine seemed to be the only one worth spending any time with. Or at least, she had been. He was not sure how they would get on now that he knew her true opinion of him. He turned on his heels and ran into someone, knocking himself to the floor. I beg your pardon, my lord. A hand reached down and grasped Nathan roughly around the upper arm. The man, Nathan could not recall his name, half pulled, half dragged Nathan to his feet. I saw you standing there, but I did not expect you to turn so quickly. The man looked to his feet and gave an awkward bow. It is me who was at fault. Please do not concern yourself. I am perfectly well. He dusted at the seat of his pants and down his thighs. You see, everything has been put to rights. The man ducked his head and hurried to his berth, rummaging around in his small trunk until he seemed to find what he was after. With nothing more than a nod of his head, he quit the room, leaving Nathan with his thoughts. Nathan growled. His thoughts were not precisely where he wanted to be left. He was tired of rehearsing the conversation with Jasmine over in his mind. If it were not for the wind and rain outside, he would take his thoughts to the deck and allow them to be swept away. But the risk of being swept overboard was a more pressing concern on deck at present. He climbed onto the cannon and hopped into his hammock, placing his booted foot on the support beam to limit the amount of swing the hammock could make. He scowled at the underside of the deck above him. Was Jasmine right? He bristled and shook his head. All of the women he had ruined had known what they were getting into when they aligned themselves with him. He had never said he loved any of them, nor had he asked outright for their hands. If they had allowed themselves to believe that was his intention, he could not be held responsible for their misguided notions. The door opened, and he heard several men walk in, speaking in loud, rough language. She's a pretty bit of skirt. Too bad his lordship's always about. We could have had some fun on this voyage. He assumed they were speaking of Jasmine, for she was the only single female on board. Nathan's hands clenched at his side, and he sank deeper into his hammock, pulling his foot off the beam. How dare these men speak of her in such base terms? She was not here simply for their amusement, nor was she some light skirt that would have a dalliance with the likes of them. They continued past Nathan, and their voices hushed as someone opened a trunk. The lid slammed closed, and the men moved back out the door. The nerve of the men, even thinking on Jasmine in such a way. Nathan swallowed as he thought on his own similar thoughts that first day on the ship. Had he not thought she would come around to his charms? He winced. While he did not like to admit it, it was possible his charms were not much different than what these men were proposing. At least, not entirely. Nathan did not usually go to the extent he believed these men likely did. But the outcome was no less damaging. A heaviness settled over him, making him feel dark and on edge. Shutting his eyes, he tried to block out his thoughts and the voices of the men he had heard. The hammock swung softly back and forth, eventually lulling him into a dark and fitful sleep. Nathan's stomach grumbled loudly, the hunger pangs bringing him fully awake. He looked up at the ceiling, his mind returning to his dreams. The faces of the women he had trifled with filled his mind, but it was the images of Jasmine being pursued by crushes of coarse-looking men caused his pulse to quicken. Nathan sat up. He should go in search of some food, but the likelihood that he would encounter Jasmine was great, another thought that caused his heart to race. Yet, if he avoided her, would she be in danger from the men he had heard? He could not let that happen. Sometime in the last month she had become his friend. She had possibly saved his life. Heaving a large sigh, he hoisted himself out of the berth and toward the stairs. The dining hall still contained several people, including Jasmine and two of her charges. She smiled down at the small boy as she helped him cut up the food on his plate. His breath hitched at the sight, and he ran a hand along the back of his neck, unsure how to approach her or what to even say. He stepped inside, and she looked up, the smile dropping from her face. His stomach hardened at her response. Dipping his head, he approached her. Miss Jasmine. She reciprocated with a slight head nod and turned her attention back to the boy at her side. Nathan collected what was left of the victuals and sat at the table across from Jasmine. Her gaze shifted slightly, indicating she had taken note of him, 
but she did not look up or make eye contact. Nathan's shoulders sagged. I hope we are not to be at odds for the remainder of the trip. I find I enjoy your company. He kept his voice low so as not to be heard by everyone else in the room. Jasmine finally lifted her eyes and held his gaze, but she remained silent for several heartbeats. When she spoke at last, a soft smile formed on her lips. Yes, I find I should like that as well, my lord. She dropped her gaze to her plate. I should also apologise for how I spoke to you earlier. Nathan held up his hand. I propose we leave that conversation in the past. Jasmine's lips parted, but then they closed, and she nodded. Very well, if that is what you wish. Is that not what she desired? Did she wish to continue that dreadful conversation? When she had offered an apology, he thought perhaps she had regrets for what she had said to him. But the look currently occupying her face seemed to indicate the opposite. Perhaps it was just him that did not wish to continue it. He looked to the boy next to Jasmine, grasping for anything to change the subject. Matthew, how are your letters coming? I have not seen your progress in recent days. Jasmine's shoulders dropped the barest hint. Had she been as apprehensive about this meeting as he had? Nathan did not know why that notion made him feel relieved. Cousin Justina says I am doing much better, my lord. Nathan grinned at the boy. I am sure you are. Your cousin is a very good teacher. He put his finger to his lip, his gaze flicking to Jasmine. She watched him closely. I am confident that had I such a teacher, I should have excelled in letter writing, but alas, I did not, and my penmanship is worse for it. He tusked and shook his head. Jasmine's head tilted to the side, and she smiled. His heart gave a small lurch. Perhaps, my lord, you could join us, and I could help you improve on your letters. Her face coloured up slightly, and Nathan stared, unable to pull his eyes away from her. I should like that very much. What did this mean? Were they friends again? Nathan found he hoped very much that this was the case. Again, you are coming to my aid. You are a very good person, Miss Jasmine. His face dropped slightly. She was a good person, a much better person than he was. Matthew clapped his hands. You will be joining us. Oh, that shall be great fun. I shall not be the only boy if you are there. Jasmine looked down at Matthew and rumpled his hair. And it is so very bad, is it, to be the only boy? Matthew looked sheepish. I guess it is not so very bad. But another boy will be good also, do you not think, cousin? Jasmine nodded and fixed her gaze on Nathan, one pert brow raised. I guess that will depend on what kind of a student Lord Nathaniel is. I suspect he is rather impertinent. Nathan's eyes widened and he placed a hand to his chest. I have never been so offended. Matthew looked up at Jasmine with pleading eyes. Please do not say such things. You will cause him not to come. Nathan winked at Jasmine and patted Matthew's hand. Not to fear, sir. I shall come so as to spend time with you. I will just have to learn to disregard your cousin and her comments. Matthew sighed and Jasmine's lips twitched. She bit her bottom lip. We have already finished our studies for today, my lord, but you may join us after breakfast in the morning. Nathan's stomach fluttered. Never had he so anticipated a morning of schoolwork before. I shall make sure to be on time, Miss Jasmine. I should not like to be in the briars before we even get started. She nodded and stood to leave. I look forward to tomorrow, then. Nathan grinned. Not as much as I, Miss Jasmine. Chapter 10 Justina straightened the slates and chalk on the table again, glancing up at the door. When are we to begin, cousin? Penny heaved a great sigh and dropped her chin into her hands, elbows balanced on the table. They had been back from breakfast for nearly twenty minutes, and still Nathan had not joined them. Had he been in earnest yesterday when he told Matthew he would come? Justina hoped he was, otherwise Matthew would be very disappointed. There was a knock on the door and her breath hitched. Come in, she called. The door opened and Nathan stood in the doorway. While she missed the humour of him wearing her uncle's trousers, she could not deny that he looked far better in his own well-made clothing. Good morning, Matthew. 
He turned his eyes to her and smiled when he noticed her appreciative glance at him. I hope I did not keep you waiting. Justina cleared her throat and schooled her features. Indeed, you did. We have been waiting for nearly twenty minutes, my lord. If you are to continue as one of my students, you need to be more observant of the time. She raised a brow and pursed her lips. He bowed deeply. My deepest apologies, Miss Jasmine. Please accept his apologies, cousin. I believe he truly means it. Matthew tugged on her sleeve. Very well. I shall overlook your tardiness this time. Her lips twitched as his eyes widened slightly, but I shall not be so lenient again, my lord. He nodded and slid into the chair snugly fitted into the makeshift schoolroom. They sat close together, their hips nearly touching. Many thanks, Miss Jasmine, he whispered close to her ear. The hairs on her arm stood on end. The smell of musky sandalwood drifted past her, and she had to restrain herself from closing her eyes and taking in a deep breath. He leant in, and the scent became slightly stronger. I am sorry to have kept you waiting. Justina leant away from him before she was unable to think at all. I am not very angry, although, she glanced to Matthew, Matthew has been rather anxious that I had scared you away. Nathan winked at her. You are not as scary as you think, Miss Jasmine. Justina mentally shook herself. She knew this man. She knew what he was about. Why was she allowing herself to be taken in by his charms? She pushed the slates over in front of Matthew and Penny, laying a paper down in front of each of them. She looked to Penny first. Please write these words and say them as you write them, so I know that you understand what you are writing. On Matthew's paper she had written rows of letters. He looked at the paper and bent his head low, slowly moving his chalk along the slate. Shall I receive one of those also? Nathan leant over to her again, and Justina stilled. Of course, I made one for each of my students. She handed him his paper. He read over his words, and his face paled slightly, his jaw hardening. Justina reached to snatch the paper from his hands, but he held it tightly. She now regretted the words she had written on the paper for him. He glanced up at her, his face guarded when he caught her gaze. Jasmine. She did not miss the fact that he had not used Miss before her nickname. Am I to assume these words were selected for a reason, or was it simply by chance that you picked them? Justina twisted her hands in her lap beneath the table. At the time, writing the words chaste, pure, wholesome, joy, love and contentment had seemed the perfect words for Nathan. But now it felt like maybe she had just reopened the wounds from their earlier argument. She reached again for the paper, but he pulled it from her reach. I asked you a question. His voice held a hint of irritation, but his face told nothing. I, uh... Oh, why had she been so insolent? Had she not accused Nathan of such behaviour? How was it acceptable that she now displayed her own measure of heartlessness? And just when things were relaxing between them, I thought only to reinforce those traits that you seem to struggle against. Perhaps if you say them enough times, they will become a part of you. There was an element of truth to what she said. In thinking on their previous conversation, she had detected something in him, a sense that he felt almost unworthy of love and true happiness. His eyes narrowed. I thought you believed me beyond hope. Her head shook. The parish vicar where I grew up taught that God does not think anyone is beyond hope. If he can believe it, then who am I to disagree? Could she sound any more like a zealot? Surely this was not something he would understand, and it would be a source of great humour to him. That is, when he was not wishing her to the devil for bringing up his past actions. You believe me capable of change? There was a note of challenge in his voice, but she thought there was also a touch of hope. Yes, I do. His shoulders relaxed, and he nodded. Very well. Where is my slate? Justina sucked in a long breath through her nose. He was not angry with her. Reaching forward, she slid a slate and a piece of chalk toward him. There you are. He nodded, and set to work writing the words she had given him. Justina watched in fascination as he wrote, rather neatly, the words she had given him. A lock of hair fell forward, covering his brow. He swatted at it several times, but then seemed content to let it alone. 
Lord Nathaniel had been telling a bouncer when he had said he did not have neat orthography. His writing was to be admired. Grudgingly, she pulled her eyes from it to check on Penny and Matthew. Penny, I do not hear you saying the words, dearest. The girl quietly said the word she was writing, and Justina smiled. Penny was much shyer now that Nathan was in the room with them. She turned her attention to Matthew. He had moved the chalk into his fist, gripping it tightly. Matthew, dear, loosen your grip or... The pressure was too much, and the chalk broke into three pieces in his hand. He looked up at her with pouty lips and worried eyes. I, I did not mean to break it, Justina. Really, I didn't. It was an accident. Justina smiled and waved her hand toward herself. Now come here and sit on my lap and I shall help you. A look of relief passed over his features. Why is he so concerned over something so small as a broken piece of chalk? Nathan's breath tickled her neck. Justina shifted slightly away from him. I have learnt that their previous governess was not so gentle. Such a mistake with her would have warranted a knuckle rap with her walking stick. Nathan's mouth dropped open. For breaking a piece of chalk? Why was it tolerated? Why did Mrs Martin not sack her? Justina shrugged. She came with high references. And in truth, I am not certain my aunt was aware of what was going on. The children were made to be afraid about speaking of it, and my aunt did not tend to spend much time in the schoolroom. Matthew scooted onto her lap and the conversation ended. Justina tapped Nathan's slate. Back to work, my lord. You are setting a poor example for my other students. He touched his brow and dipped his head. Yes, Miss Jasmine. His voice was soft. He bent slightly and set to work on his words again. Justina took Matthew's hand in hers. Remember how we hold the chalk, Matthew? She placed the chalk in his fingers and wrapped hers around his... I believe I will need help holding my chalk after you are done with Matthew, Nathan whispered in her ear, merriment evident in his voice. I have been watching you, my lord, and I think you are much more proficient than you led me to believe. She loosened her hold on Matthew's hand. He no longer fought against her hand when she held his in place, as he had done in the early days of their voyage. I believe everyone is capable of improving, Miss Jasmine. She hated how his breath warmed her skin and made her momentarily lose track of her thoughts. You are correct, my lord, she touched his slate, which is why we practice. His shoulders slumped and he scowled down at the slate. Justina grinned at his little tantrum. For some reason, it made her smile when she was able to reject him. Matthew finished a row of letters and pushed the chalk away, declaring he was done and would not write a letter more. Nathan mimicked the boy, only in exaggerated gestures, which drew a giggle from Matthew. But it also had him reaching for the chalk and starting the next row. Thank you, Justina whispered to Nathan over Matthew's head. Nathan smiled and nodded. Does that mean you will reward me for my help? What did you have in mind? She cocked a brow. He waggled his brows. Well, you could begin by helping with the formation of my letters... Then we could talk about letting me sit on your lap. Her face flamed, and Nathan threw his head back and laughed. Both children looked up from their slates and looked from Justina to Nathan. I thought that might not be an option. He smiled and bent his head, using the chalk to write the next word on his list. Justina put her hands to her cheeks, trying to cool the burn she felt there. She could not tell if he was in jest or if this was how he truly secured a lady's affections. It irritated her to realise that if he was in earnest, she could understand why he was such a favourite. He was charming to the point of being dangerous, and that was what concerned her. Chapter 11 Nathan stepped out onto the deck and hitched his haversack up higher on his shoulder, the bright sunshine hurting his eyes. Seamen scurried about the ship, securing sails and lowering small rowboats into the water. Jasmine already stood at the railing, looking out at the first sight of land they had seen in more than two months. They had come to a sort of agreement, leaving his past actions in the past. But to say he had not thought on her words, almost to excess, would be a bouncer indeed. He rubbed at the back of his neck and tugged on his shirt collar. What are you looking at, Miss Jasmine? She turned and he was happy to see the ready smile on her face. How different it was from the first time they had been in this exact spot months before. I was just admiring the castle there. 
She pointed to a long stone wall with a gatehouse, complete with a bell tower in the centre. She then pointed to a greenish building, also with a tower of sorts that sat off to the side. And there is the Awal Mosque. In several hours the bells will ring, summoning all Muslims to prayer. Nathan looked at her. How do you know this? I thought you realised I was a bit of a blue stocking, my lord. She raised her shoulders a fraction and then dropped them back down. When my aunt asked me to accompany them, I read everything I could about the journey. I wished to know what I was to expect. He nodded his head. That was very wise of you. I confess I did no such studying before coming. She laughed. No, I should think not. You were obviously much too busy with other matters. He sighed. I hope some day you will forget about my less than austere boarding of the ship. She shook her head. I should think I wouldn't. I have a very good memory, my lord, especially for details and names. Ah, she was teasing him. Warmth flooded through his body. They had weathered the storm and had come out of it as stronger friends. He was grateful for it, even if he did not understand what advantage he brought to her life. He leant forward onto the railing next to her. Are you going ashore, Miss Jasmine? She shook her head and turned her gaze back to the shore. No, my uncle does not think it a suitable place for a lady. He says that while India is primitive, this place can be even more so. The whole of the town is made up of soldiers, traders and slave traders. She gave a shiver, although how that can still be possible after the Slave Trade Act, I have no notion. She took in a deep breath. In truth, I am content to see the cape from here. She turned and looked at him. And you... I assume you are to leave us and try to find passage back to England. Perhaps this time you'll be fortunate enough to secure a stateroom. Her mouth turned up in a full smile. He shrugged, a sudden melancholy stealing over him at the thought of leaving. But that was silly. He could not wait to be free of this ship and his confining sleeping arrangements. Yes, I am to go ashore. Although I do not see any other ships here. I do not know how long I should have to wait until I can return to England. His brow furrowed. Perhaps he should just continue on to India. For all he knew, he could wait here at the Cape for a month or longer before a ship bound for England was to come. And even then, who knew if the ship would allow passengers? His current situation seemed the only one that guaranteed a certain outcome and timeline. Evans approached them and bowed to Miss Jasmine. I beg your pardon, Miss Tinsdale. He turned his attention to Nathan. My lord, the last boat is leaving for shore. If you wish to be on it, you will need to go now. He smiled and gave another quick bow. Nathan's chest felt tight. Well, Miss Jasmine. He looked her in the eye. Or perhaps now is the time to call you Miss Tinsdale. It has been my pleasure to sail with you thus far. Perhaps when you do come back to England, our paths will cross again. He took her gloved hand in his and bowed over it, placing a soft kiss on her fingers. He stood and offered her a salute before turning and heading to where Evan stood at the railing. He had the urge to look back, to see if she was watching his departure, but he refrained. What if she was not? In all likelihood, she was perfectly content to be rid of him. After all, he had done nothing but be a bother to her since they had left King's Lynn. He pulled his haversack to his front and stepped into the wobbly boat hanging at the side of the ship. Once he was inside the boat, he sat in the middle of the centre thwart and chanced to look back at Jasmine. He sighed and smiled when he saw her watching him. Was it because she was sad to see him go, or because she was interested in watching the boat being lowered into the water? He shook his head. Why was he worrying so much about what Jasmine thought? They were merely friends. He would not worry so much if it were Ian or Tierney staying behind on the ship. In point of fact, he would never even consider whether or not Ian watched him as he departed. He grunted and lifted a hand, offering Miss Jasmine a wave as the boat sank below the deck of the ship. Once the boat was on the water and the ropes cast aside, several seamen put the oars in the water and the little boat made its way toward the shore. Again, Nathan had the urge to look back at Miss Jasmine. He was being a complete dolt. In a different time and place, he and Miss Jasmine would not socialise in the least, as had been proven by the fact that he did not even remember her from their previous encounter. He cringed at the callousness of his words, but it served only to prove that there was no need for him to indulge in a fit of the blue devils over his departure. 
The boat pulled up alongside the dock, and Nathan realised he had spent the entirety of the journey wool-gathering. He shook off his dark mood and stepped tentatively from the boat. Evan stood on the dock and dipped his head. It was a pleasure to sail with you, my lord. Nathan narrowed his eyes at the young man. I thought we agreed that you should call me Nathan. Evans offered a quick smile. That was on the ship, sir. On land, the strictures of society should be observed. Nathan ran a hand through his hair. Tell me, just Evans, if I were to decide to continue on to India aboard the Calcutta Star, when would I need to return here in order to catch a boat back to the ship? Evans smiled knowingly, although what Evans thought he knew, Nathan could not fathom. It'll take several hours to get all the supplies aboard, but the captain is not likely to wait for you. I would return within two hours, my lord. The captain does not like to dawdle. You will hear the captain's bell. It is how he summons us to the ship. If you hear five tolls, that means the boat is leaving and you will have only a minute or two to make it back here. Nathan nodded. Understandable. Can you tell me where the posting house is? Evans gave him directions, and Nathan made his way down the wooden plank dock. Once on solid ground, Nathan could see the massiveness of the walls surrounding the castle. They were much taller than he had assumed when viewing them from the ship. He turned toward the path leading up to the gatehouse. According to Evans, the posting house would be inside the castle fortress. He walked through the wooden fence line and followed the path to a large opening in the wall. Passing through it, he entered a lovely courtyard. While the exterior of the wall was all rock and mortar, the inside was covered in a rough, pale yellow type of plaster. Nathan walked to the centre of the courtyard and turned slowly in a circle, his mind trying to absorb all he saw. It was all so different from anything he had seen before. For the first time in his life, he wondered if he had been mistaken in not taking a grand tour, but he'd had no notion things such as this were out there in the world. He nodded his head, making his decision on the spot. He would post his letters to his mother, bailiff and solicitor, informing them of his unplanned adventure. Then he would make his way back to the ship and continue on to India. How long he would stay there he did not know, but he knew he needed to experience that country. Once he arrived, he would decide the length of his stay. Nathan felt a lightness in his step as he made his way to the posting house, which was tucked into a small corner of the tavern. Once he had seen to his letters, he emerged from the posting house and the sun immediately warmed his skin. He closed his eyes and turned his face to the sky, allowing the warmth to spread throughout his body. Nathan opened his eyes and popped open his pocket watch. He only had half of an hour left before he should be returning to the dock, lest he be left behind. Now that he had made the decision to continue on, the thought of being left behind made his stomach turn. He walked back toward the gatehouse, but stopped when something in the window of a shop caught his eye. A set of Conte crayons and a book of drawing paper sat displayed on a small easel. A smile spread across Nathan's face. It had been nearly a month ago, but he had distinctly overheard Miss Jasmine telling her aunt that she wished for some watercolour or charcoals. He had not meant to eavesdrop, but he had been coming to tell Jasmine she was wrong about him and had overheard the conversation. In the end, he had decided not to confront her and had returned to his hammock. He hesitated. Would it be proper? For some reason he worried she might believe it was not. But Jasmine had done so much for him. Did she not deserve to have something which would bring her happiness and joy? He squared his shoulders. She most certainly did. And if he had to endure a few awkward moments to bring her such happiness, then so be it. He pushed through the door of the shop and snatched the crayons and paper from the window display. I should like to purchase these, he said as he plunked the merchandise down on the counter. The man behind the counter nodded and told Nathan the sum. His eyes widened slightly. The items were at least three times the cost they would have been in London, or even Cambridge. Do you still wish to purchase them? The man asked. Nathan nodded and pushed them forward. Yes, I was merely surprised, that is all. Nathan paid the money and tucked the parcel into his haversack. Thank you, I am grateful you had such merchandise to sell. He dipped his head. Good day. When he pushed out of the shop, he heard the distinct ring of four bells. Nathan's stomach dropped. Had he missed the first bell? Was that the captain indicating that the last boat was about to depart? Nathan hugged his haversack to his chest and jogged through the courtyard. 
He passed through the gate but was unable to see the dock through the small slats in the fence. His heart pounded, not just from the exertion, but from the notion that he may not be able to give Jasmine her gift. As he cleared the fence, he saw the captain and the first mate standing on the dock. The captain had his watch open and stared down at it. Nathan increased his jog to a full run. Why did he never seem to make it on a boat without running? He really needed to plan things better in the future. He skidded to a stop in front of the captain, but the boat was already several rods out to sea. Nathan's shoulders dropped. Have I missed the last boat? He wheezed out. Dropping his hands to his knees, he tried to take several deep breaths. The captain let out a harumph. Do you think I should be standing here on the dock if the last boat had left, sir? He motioned to the small rowboat still tied up at the dock, and the first mate laughed out loud. Who do you think would be captaining the ship if I were still here on the dock? The captain looked heavenward, as if he needed divine patience to deal with the likes of Nathan. Nathan felt his neck and ears heat. He stood to his full height, which was at least a head taller than the captain. It made him feel marginally more confident. Ah, uh, yes, sir. My apologies. I had not taken the time to consider that. I was afraid I had missed my chance. The captain looked at him with a raised brow and a slight curl to his lips. You will be continuing on to India with us then, my lord? Nathan returned the raised brow. He was not aware that the captain knew the circumstances surrounding Nathan's travel on the Calcutta Star, although he should not have been surprised by it. Any captain worth his salt knew every happening on his boat. But Nathan refused to be cowed by the man any more than he already had been. That was my hope, sir, if you would be so kind as to allow me the opportunity. The captain shrugged. Very well. There is a stateroom available should you care to use it for the remainder of the voyage. I knew it. Nathan muttered under his breath, scowling at the first mate. The man had been telling him a bouncer when he said there were none available. Nathan shook his head, feeling a bit rebellious. If you do not mind, Captain, I should like to continue on with the crew. Both of the captain's brows rose high on his forehead. Really? That is most unexpected. He studied Nathan, as if trying to gauge the reason for the request. Did the man think Nathan was intent on starting a mutiny? After the way Nathan had been treated, it was not such a bad idea, but revenge was not really his style. In truth, he enjoyed listening to the banter of the seamen, and he had become quite close with just Evans. Nathan supposed that was mostly due to the care the young man had given Nathan while he was sick. Besides, once he was no longer smelling up their quarters with his seasickness, the men had seemed to be tolerant of his existence among them. The captain nodded his head. If that is what you wish... My lord? He put an emphasis on the title. But why and what he meant by it, Nathan had no idea. Perhaps he meant to say that he did not believe Nathan would stay with the men once he had proven his point. But that notion made Nathan only more determined to stay below with the seamen. The captain looked at his watch and rang the bell in the wooden case at his side five times. Nathan saw Just Evans with four other seamen walking toward them, their arms heavy with crates and bags. It was going to be cramped quarters during the row back to the ship, but it was not enough to make Nathan change his mind about returning. Evans and the other men reached them, and the captain nodded to the boat. You men took your time getting here. He looked at Evans. Well done in finding them, boy. The captain cleared his throat. We are behind schedule. Get into the boat. His voice came out as a growl. Nathan followed the others into the small dinghy and took up his place in the middle. The captain stepped into the boat, and the men immediately loosened the ropes and pushed away from the dock. Once they were well on their way back to the ship, Evans leant over to Nathan. I would ask what changed your mind, but I believe I already know that answer. Nathan's brow furrowed, and he opened his mouth to question him, but Evans continued on. Whatever your reason, I'm glad you decided to continue on. I believe you will enjoy India, Nathan. He scooted back to his place on the thwart and pulled hard on his oar. Nathan watched Evans for a moment. What did he think had changed Nathan's mind? He hoped Evans would look back over and give Nathan an indication of what he had been speaking of, but the man made no such movement. He just continued to row. Chapter 12 
Justina sat in the small hammock her uncle had tied up in her stateroom to function as a sort of rocking chair and allowed the boat to sway them back and forth. Maybelle sat on her lap with her head on Justina's chest. The little girl was nearly to sleep when the racket of stomping running feet sounded above her head. Maybelle's head jerked up and her eyes widened. We go see men, she looked up at Justina. Justina smiled and shook her head. We will see them after we rest, dearest. Justina raised a hand to cover her mouth in a fake yawn. Oh, I'm so sleepy. Let us rest, and then we can go for a walk. Maybelle relaxed back against Justina. Running her hands down the child's soft curls, Justina began to hum softly in Maybelle's ear. Soon, soft, deep breaths could be heard, and Justina knew she had been victorious. She smiled and settled into the hammock for a while longer, just to ensure the girl was fully asleep. A rap at the door drew her out of her drowsy thoughts. Justina shook the sleep from her eyes and hurried to scoot out from under Maybelle's heavy body before the knock came again. She rushed to the door, not even bothering to check her hair or smooth the wrinkles in her dress. She yanked open the door just as a hand came down hard, smacking her in the nose. She placed her hand to her face. Ouch! Damnation! A male voice grunted. Shh! Justina whispered checking to make sure Maybelle had not awakened as she pushed into the walkway and closed the door behind her. She finally looked up to see who exactly had nearly awakened the sleeping child, but a thick wetness trickling from her nose stopped her. Justina raised a hand and looked down at the red upon her fingers. Thunder and turf! A white handkerchief was thrust at her face. She recognised Nathan's voice before she looked up to see his face creased with concern. A smile curled her lips, even as she held the now bloody linen to her face. Lord Nathaniel. The words came out softer than she had intended. I thought you were to stay in Cape Town until you could find a ship to return you to England. He shrugged and leant his shoulder against the door frame. That was my plan, but when I saw the castle and how different it all was from England, I realised how much I had missed out when I chose not to take a grand tour. He raised a hand to her face but then dropped it at his side. I am sorry about your nose. She shrugged. Please do not concern yourself. The bleeding will stop soon enough. He leant in closer, and her gown felt tight, as if she had just learned of something distressing. Or was it exciting? In the moment she could not rightly say which emotion she felt. She ducked her head and studied the linen in her hand. It was all so absurd. Lord Nathaniel did not pay attention to someone as utterly forgettable as she. She wiped at her nose and was grateful to see that the blood seemed to have stopped. She looked up at him. You are to stay in India for a time? Did he hear how much hope was in her voice? Lud, she had thought him out of her life when he had stepped on the rowboat that morning. But now, she scolded herself, now was no different. She could not have feelings for this man. She would never allow herself to develop any. He nodded. Yes, I do not know for what length of time, but I would like to see Calcutta at the very least. I am happy for you. She looked back at the handkerchief because she was unable to look him in the eye any longer. I am afraid I have soiled your handkerchief. I shall see it is cleaned and will return it shortly. She ran her fingers over the initials in the corner. He stepped toward her and put his hands on her cheeks, tilting her head to the side. Let me look at your nose. I will never forgive myself if it is broken. His hands were soft and warm. Cradling her face ever so gently, he brought his closer, looking at her from every angle. Justina swallowed slowly, not wanting to do anything to end the moment. She was not sure if it was her legs or his hands which were supporting her most. She closed her eyes, allowing him to lightly run his thumb down the length of her nose, breathing in the smell of his soap and cologne. Does this hurt? His voice was barely a whisper. She wanted to tell him she could feel no pain at the moment, but she did not think her voice would produce any sound. She shook her head instead. He smiled and looked down at her. There was something in his gaze that made her think, if only for a moment, that he might bend the rest of the way and kiss her. But he didn't. He dropped his hands from her cheeks and took several steps back. Justina nearly cried out at the emptiness that suddenly pressed down on her. Stupid, stupid girl, she chided herself. He does not desire the likes of you. 
A new awareness of just how keenly Justina was lying to herself settled upon her. She had feelings for Nathan. It may not be love yet, but if the two of them continued on this path, it would surely come to that. But only on her part. Nathan placed a hand on hers. You may keep it as long as you wish, Jasmine. Unlike trousers, I have several handkerchiefs. He grinned and pulled his hand away. She stared at the spot his hand had occupied, feeling the absence of its warmth immediately. It meant nothing to him if she kept it then. That was what he was trying to tell her. He seemed to be telling her in every way possible, just shy of saying the actual words, that he did not desire her. He stood up straight and pulled something out from his coat pocket. She had not even noticed the bulge that had been there. He held out a small parcel and shifted it from one hand to the other and back again. He seemed nervous, but what he had to be nervous about she did not know. He thrust the package at her, causing her to take a step back. My apologies. If I am not careful I shall give you another nosebleed. His brow crinkled and he rushed on to finish. I passed a shop while I was at the castle and I saw this. It made me think of you. She turned the package over in her hands, untying the string that held it together. The paper fell away, revealing a set of Conte crayons and a book of paper. Justina looked up at him, her heart pounding in her chest. What did this mean? She again chastised her naive heart. Had she not already learnt her lesson from Lord Grayson? She had allowed herself to believe every kind word, every action he took had meant something. But they had not. And when she left Brighton with a broken heart, she'd no one to blame but herself. Lord Nathaniel fidgeted, finally leaning back against the door frame, his brow furrowed. Justina realised she had said nothing about the gift. Oh, thank you, my lord, but it is too much. I cannot possibly accept such a gift. She frowned. How she wished she could accept it. She had not drawn in months, and her fingers itched to do so, especially after this interaction. Please. There was a pleading in his voice. Please, will you accept them? She bit her bottom lip. Her mother would surely not approve, but then her mother was not here. Aunt Martin, however, surely would approve. Justina suspected her aunt was secretly trying to make a match between Lord Nathaniel and Justina. She gave a small nod. His body relaxed and he smiled down at her. I must confess to overhearing your conversation with your aunt several weeks ago and when I saw these in the window I knew you must have them. Justina ran her thumb over the cover of the paper. He was thinking of her while ashore. Was she part of the reason he had decided to continue on to India? She nearly snorted at the thought. It was the least I could do, to tell you thank you for your great care while I was ill. Justina brought the gift to her chest, in part to hide the shaking in her hands. It was not about her, per se. It was about repaying a debt. She smiled at him. You need not have purchased me anything. You have told me thank you on several occasions. She pushed it back toward him. Truly, my lord, I cannot accept such a generous gift. He put his hand on hers and pushed back. She jerked away, feeling as if she had been scolded. She could not take any more contact with him. It was too much. It is insignificant when one thinks of what may have happened if you had not stepped in to help. His voice was quiet but sincere. Please, take them. I know not the first thing about art. It would be a waste of blunt if I were to keep them. She bit her lip. I am sure you will find a lady with an eye for art when we arrive in India. Perhaps you could save these for her. She felt a pinch in her chest at the thought of him resuming his former ways once they were in India. She had seen the hint of a good man inside him to think of him as he was before. He put his hand back on hers and gave it a gentle squeeze. Fiend, seize it, Jasmine, take the gift. I bought them with you in mind, no one else. Justina raised wide eyes to his. Surely it meant something that he had ceased calling her Miss. She could not really say he used her Christian name because he didn't. She wasn't even sure if he remembered her Christian name. But still, dropping the formality of even his made-up name seemed as if it should mean something. She nodded. Thank you. I shall cherish them. He sucked in a deep breath and shook his head. Ludge, Jasmine, you make giving a gift difficult for a man. 
She pushed aside her silly notions and grinned up at him. I had to be certain you truly wished to give it to me. I would not wish you to have remorse for your actions. He straightened and gave her a nudge with his elbow. Why should I regret giving a gift to my friend? Justina bit the inside of her cheek. When had the kind word taken on such a negative meaning? Why, indeed. He pointed to the crayons. Will you draw something for me? She shrugged. Perhaps, but for now I must return inside. Maybelle is certain to awaken soon and I dare not leave her alone in the room. Nathan nodded and clasped his hands behind his back. Then perhaps this afternoon we could take a turn about the deck and then you can draw something for me. Justina thought it sounded both marvellous and torturous. I should be honoured, my lord. Justina gave him an exaggerated curtsy. Perhaps if she pretended it was all a game, eventually she could believe it. He laughed. Come now, Jasmine. I think we are acquainted enough for you to call me Nathan. It is what my other friends, Ian and Tierney, call me. If that is what you think is best, my lord. Justina noted the scowl on his face and grinned. Very well, Nathan. But not when we are about in society. I do not think most of the ton would see your reasoning as sound. If you insist, Jasmine. Justina shook her head. You are already going to have much to explain when they hear you call me Jasmine. He waved her concern away. We shall deal with that when we get to Calcutta. But for the next two months, I see no reason for formality. A thump came from inside the room, and Justina's eyes went wide. She reached forward and carefully swung open the door. Maybelle sat on the floor below the hammock chair, pounding Justina's slippers together. Justina looked down, only now noticing she was without any shoes. She looked up at Lord... Nathan, her face burning hot. I beg your pardon, but I must see to Maybelle. He bowed gallantly. Until this afternoon, my lady. Was he flirting with her? Justina sighed, irritated with herself that she did not even know such a simple thing. She tilted her head, but could not begin to form a coherent sentence. Instead, she pushed into her room and shut the door behind her. Chapter 13 Nathan paced back and forth, from one end of the quarter-deck wall to the other, his hands clasped tightly behind his back and his brow was pulled tight. He let out a loud, huffy breath. He was so confused by Jasmine, something he had never said of another woman. Ladies, in his experience, were usually quite easy to determine. But for some reason, Jasmine left him feeling muddled and uncertain. He had thought her surprised, albeit pleasantly, when she had opened her door and found him standing there, but whether it was because she saw him or because of the bloodied nose he had given her, he did not know. He now felt completely uncertain about his decision to travel on to India, which was absurd, because he was not going to India for Jasmine, he was going because he wished to see more of the world. He turned on his heel as he reached the end of the deck. Had he misread her previously? He thought they had become friends, thought she would be delighted to have him stay and keep her company. But by the end of their conversation, she had seemed almost anxious to be out of his sight. And the gift? He questioned the prudence of it. The hatch from the staircase below creaked as it swung open and Jasmine's head poked out. She glanced around the deck as she made her way up the last few stairs. Nathan hurried forward and extended his hand to help her. She looked at it, and then at him, before grasping hold and stepping up onto the deck. He smiled at her. I was beginning to think you may not come. She pulled her hand away. The children were rather unruly this afternoon. She shook her head. My aunt said she could manage without me, but I fear she will have quite a time getting them to rest. If you are needed elsewhere, I should not presume to keep you. Even as he said the words, he wished them away. What if she accepted his offer and left him here? She shook her head, and his body relaxed. My aunt is capable. I believe once she gets them into their beds, if she reads to them, they shall be asleep in no time. Nathan nodded to the stairs leading up to the quarter-deck. Would you care to sit? No, I have been sitting for most of the day. I would rather enjoy the exercise from walking. He noticed the absence of her crayons and tablet. She did not like them. He frowned. He had been so certain she would. Perhaps it was his due for listening in on their conversation in the first place. As if sensing his thoughts, 
Jasmine cleared her throat. I'm sorry, but I did not bring my pad and crayons. I was not certain of the weather, and I did not wish to ruin the paper if it was raining. Did that mean she liked the gift? He sighed at his indecision. But as you can see, it is lovely out. Besides, I believe the sun is in just the right spot so as to give me the proper shading. He lifted his face to the sun and turned so as to show her his silhouette. He was pleased when he glanced over and saw her grinning. She quirked a brow. And who is to say that you will be the subject of my drawing, my lord? Nathan's whole body relaxed. This was better. This was what he had come to expect from their conversations. Oh, I thought it was obvious. He turned his head back to the side. Come now, have you ever seen a more regal nose or such striking cheekbones? She laughed. Indeed I have. She lightly pinched his chin between her thumb and forefinger, drawing Nathan's face back around. His breath hitched, surprised by the warmth of her touch, even if it was with gloved hands. She seemed not to notice as she continued on. I find your nose a bit too pointed and your lips altogether too pouty for my liking. She tilted her head. But you may be correct about the cheekbones, my lord. They are exquisite. When he caught her gaze, she winked at him. He drew his head back, his eyes wide. He had never guessed she had a saucy side to her. Well, I never. Her face, even in the shadow of the quarterdeck, coloured nicely. She put her hand to her mouth. Oh, my lord, I, I, I do not know what came over me. Nathan grinned, and he had the urge to pull her hand from her mouth and kiss it. His thought stumbled. Kiss her hand? Only her hand? Obviously, that was what he had thought. She moved around the stairs. I believe you are a bad influence on me, my lord. I shall have to be retrained as to the proper way to behave once we arrive in India. Nathan pushed out those lips she found so pouty. I find I quite like this, Jasmine. I will be disappointed to see her put away. She nudged him with her shoulder. As I said before, I am sure once we are in India, you will find others to occupy your time. There was a strange tone to her voice. It was the same tone he had heard in the passageway earlier, and he did not know what it meant. If you think you'll be rid of me once we arrive in India, you are quite mistaken, Jasmine. Nathan looked over. Her arms were crossed, elbows resting on the railing, leaving one hand laying very close to where his own hand rested. Even hidden within her gloves, he could see that her fingers were long and thin, perfect, he would wager, for playing the pianoforte. He wondered briefly if she played the instrument. She sighed. I am certain of it, Nathan. Some young lady will catch your eye and I shall see you no more. Nathan shook his head. I have changed. I have done nothing scandalous in more than two months. Jasmine laughed. Oh, you have not tried to get Mr. Evans or any of the other seamen alone in the library. She looked at him doubtfully. I am certain, once you are back with English society, you will remember this trip with no more than a passing fondness. He looked at her, seeing in her expression that she truly believed he would forget about her once they reached their destination. It hurt him that she believed it to be true. We are friends, Jasmine. I should never dismiss a friend in such a way. He shifted. Please, go retrieve your crayons. I should love to see your work. She nodded and pushed herself off the railing. He watched her until she disappeared below deck. Turning his attentions back to the water, he thought on her words. Why would she think he would forget about her? Had he not proven himself a better friend than that? He shrugged. What did she really know of him? And with no other single females aboard the ship, why should she think him reformed? Was he really reformed? If he did not know that answer himself, how could he expect her to know? His brow furrowed. Did he want to be different? Want things to be different in India? The door creaked open and Nathan turned toward the sound. Jasmine's face appeared. Yes, the overwhelming desire to be better filled his chest. She moved over to the stairs leading up to the quarterdeck and sat to one side of the lower stairs. Opening her book, she pulled out one of the crayons and began to sketch. Nathan strode over and positioned himself behind her, but out of the way of anyone using the staircase. If you come over here, how am I to sketch you by the railing? She glanced up at him. I did not think you believed me serious. I'm sure there are plenty of things for you to draw without me in them. She quirked her mouth to one side. But I had already planned out my picture. 
She had been thinking of him in those terms. Nathan rather liked the notion of that. But I was hoping we could talk while you draw. That will be difficult if I am standing all the way over there. He motioned with his head to the railing. She considered him for a moment, a thoughtful look on her face. Very well. What shall we talk about? He had not thought that far ahead. He had no plans for a discussion. Do you truly believe I will abandon our friendship once we reach Calcutta? He had not intended to ask her this question, but it was too late to take it back now. She kept her eyes on her paper, continuing to make broad sweeps with the crayon across the page. It seems the most logical conclusion. He scowled. That was not the answer he wanted. He had hoped that she would tell him she had been in jest, or at the very least, not in earnest. I'm sure there are Lady Elizabeths in India. She pinched her mouth closed and glanced up to the horizon. Looking over her shoulder, it was clear to Nathan the vista she drew. He folded in on himself, feeling like he had been landed a fist in his gut. He had opened the gate for this conversation, but now he wanted to slam it shut and run in the opposite direction. I think you have the wrong notion of what happened with Lady Elizabeth. I did nothing so very untoward. He grunted and ran a hand through his hair. Perhaps it was unwise of me to invite her into the library, but I left the door open so as to keep her reputation intact. If that is the case, Jasmine looked up from her paper, then how did you find yourself leaping onto a ship with no notion of a plan? Nathan did not wish to talk about any of it. While he knew he was in the right where Lady Elizabeth was concerned, he could not say that for all of the ladies he had been accused of ruining. But it bothered him Jasmine was asking about it, and he did not know exactly why it did. Ian and Tierney knew of his indiscretions, they had talked about it on several occasions. Perhaps it was because Jasmine was of the fairer sex. It felt off to speak of such things with her. He did consider her a friend, perhaps even a better friend than either Ian or Tierney, especially since Ian had married. But still... This conversation was awkward, even uncomfortable for him. But now that he had brought it up, he needed to tell Jasmine the details. I had determined I wanted nothing more to do with Lady Elizabeth. I was trying to be discreet in my refusal of her, trying to spare her from the gossip that would surely accompany a more public set-down. The gossip seemed to have left out that part of the story. Jasmine turned more toward him. How did it make such a turn for the worst? Her brow creased, and she looked genuinely interested, without a hint of judgment. It was almost as if she believed him. Nathan thought back on that night in Cambridge. How had it turned so terribly wrong? The one time he had tried to do what was right, and it had landed him on a ship bound for India. He shook his head. When I told her I did not wish to continue our acquaintance, she said she could not accept it, that everyone was expecting a betrothal. He ran his hand through his hair again, and then she pounced, like the panthers at extra change when they feed them their meat, kissing me quite thoroughly. He smiled grudgingly. I did not realise she had it in her. She kissed you, my lord. The belief he had heard in her voice before seemed to vanish, and was replaced by suspicion. Yes, she is the one who kissed me. He shrugged. It almost renewed my interest in her. He looked over at her. I will not say I did not contribute, but Lady Elizabeth was the one to initiate the kiss. When I did pull away, she merely smiled and said, I accept your proposal, my lord. Nathan looked at Jasmine with wide eyes, and as luck would have it, her father walked in just as I was pulling away from the kiss. So why not marry her? Did you not owe her that much? Nathan's jaw dropped, and give her exactly what she desired, I could not. The woman is manipulative and, to be quite frank, a complete bore. I could not fathom the notion of being leg-shackled to the likes of her, so I told her I would not be marrying her and bolted, as if Kerberos himself were after me. Jasmine laughed, and Nathan jerked his head toward her. I am sorry to have missed that scene, Nathan. I can only imagine Lord Malvin's puffed-out red face at your declaration. A laugh bubbled up out of Nathan's throat, thinking back on it you are precisely right. Jasmine sobered. And what of the others, Nathan? Lady Elizabeth was not the first ruination associated with your name. Nathan dropped his head, raising one shoulder slightly. The others are... mostly accurate.
he whispered the last words, hoping perhaps the wind would carry them away before they reached her ears. When she did not speak, Nathan ventured a glance up at her. She looked out at the water, a small frown pulling down the corners of her lips. His stomach clenched. Her silence was worse than the lecture he'd felt certain she would give him. Do you not believe a man can change? Did he believe such a thing? Still, there was silence. Why did he care so much for her good opinion? She did not know him as well as she thought she did. He paused. Or did she? Had she not seen a part of him that he did not allow to be visible when among the ton, a part that Ian and Tierney did not even know about? She nodded her head, almost as if she were answering a question in her mind. Nathan did not think he wanted to know the question, or the answer, for that matter. She returned her attention to her drawing, focusing on it with great intensity. Do you feel you have changed, Nathan? She chose that moment to look up at him. He felt like a small boy under her scrutiny. I do not know. He shook his head. He had been telling himself he was, that he had changed. But in truth he did not know what would happen when they arrived in India. It was easy to believe he was changed when there was no one around to prove him right. The disappointment returned to her face, and he felt it to his core. You act as if you are merely a puppet, at the whim of someone else's movements. She heaved out a sigh. But you are not a puppet. You can make the decision to change, to be different, better. But you are the one that will have to decide the movements and act upon the ones that help you make that change. Have you even considered marrying? Considered settling down and becoming respectable? Stop acting as if you have no choice but to be the rake society has deemed you. He turned to her, but when he caught her gaze he dropped his eyes to his hands. And what if I don't wish to change? She flinched, and he felt an ache in the back of his throat. What if I don't know how to change? You know what you need to do, Nathan. This voyage should have told you that much. She stood. I think it is time I retired to my room. The air is becoming chilly and I should not like to catch a cold. Nathan nodded. May I escort you to your room? She shook her head. I do not need your assistance. She turned and took several steps before turning back to him. Besides, I believe you have much thinking to do. Nathan grunted. He did not like introspection. He never really cared for what he saw. Perhaps he should have stayed in Cape Town after all. Chapter 14 Justina stood at the railing, watching the scenery go by. Brightly coloured birds fluttered from tree to tree, as large horned cows, she had read that they were called water buffalo, were prodded through the shallow waters on the banks of the river by men wearing little more than a strip of cloth across their hips. Even after seeing the sight a handful of times, Justina still blushed. The ship had left the Bay of Bengal more than three days prior, making its way up the Hooghly River toward Calcutta, According to Evans, they should be seeing the capital of the British colony very soon. For days there had been nothing but animals and natives milling around the water's edge. Justina would never have believed such things could be so interesting to watch. She had seen women, all in brightly coloured clothing, wade into the river to wash clothing. On several occasions she had noticed a crocodile not more than a rod away. The picture had sent shivers down her spine and a worried sickness into her stomach for the women she did not even know. But even now, the banks were changing, revealing large houses, many even larger than what one would see in Grosvenor Square in London. The estates had groves of exotic trees, trees with thick rope-like branches hanging down, connecting the tree to the ground, and green lawns that ran from the back of the houses to the water's edge, making for a sort of patchwork of green along the riverfront. The river itself was crowded with ships and boats of different sizes and designs sailing in all directions. The whole image was both chaotic and calming. This is it. This is Calcutta. Justina smiled at the sound of Nathan's deep voice. Since their conversation after leaving Cape Town, they'd had an unspoken agreement not to speak of Lady Elizabeth and the many ladies before her. It seemed the only way for them to stay friends and neither did they talk about Justina's growing attraction to him. Not only because it would very likely be the most mortifying thing to happen in her life, but also because she was hopeful that once they were not in such close quarters, she would overcome her childish and very ill-advised preference for him. She turned 
and watched him settle at the railing next to her, his haversack draped across his chest. He tilted his head to the side. It is very reminiscent of London. Justina nodded. Yes, it does look similar, but it smells nothing like it. She breathed deeply, tasting more than smelling the mixture of spicy and floral notes in the air. It is lacking the overabundant smell of coal. She pointed to the shoreline, and I should not think you have ever seen that lying on the banks of any river in England. Nathan leant forward and squinted. A log? Of course I have seen logs adrift in England. As if hearing Nathan's words, the log lunged and snapped at a bird walking nearby. Nathan jumped back. Justina laughed. What is that thing? He leant toward the shoreline again. I believe it is a garial crocodile, my lord. No, surely not. That thing is more than a rod long. He looked down at her. I have never heard of a crocodile reaching such lengths. You are well versed in crocodiles, Nathan. Well, I have read about them. But I am sure I would remember if I had read that they could reach such lengths. Justina nodded. These particular crocodiles are the longest in the world. Nathan shivered slightly. There is to be no sea bathing, then. I would not suggest it, she grinned, unless, of course, you are very fast in the water. He shrugged. Perhaps I shall give it at least a fortnight before giving it a go. I should like to get acclimated to my new surroundings first. Yes, of course. Acclimation is important. She looked back toward the shoreline as the harbour came into view. The deck became a flurry as seamen climbed the rigging and the sails dropped down. She would miss these railside conversations with Nathan. Justina sucked in a deep breath. We are here. She glanced at Nathan and bit her lower lip. May I confess something to you? Of course. Have we not already discussed everything over the last four months? Justina looked at her hands, taking a steadying breath. No, they had not discussed everything. He looked at her, his brows crinkling together, nearly forming a point between his eyes. Jasmine, are you well? You look quite pale. Justina nodded. Yes, I am only nervous. She glanced at the city before them. Is that silly of me? I know it looks like London, but I am afraid it will be so very different. And what if... She let the concern dangle. What if Nathan went back to his rakish ways, or even worse, he didn't, but instead found a lady whom he wished to marry? A lady that was not her. She ran a hand over her eyes, trying to wipe the image of him with a faceless woman away. What if he went back to England and left her here, alone, in India? Justina did not know which would be worse, to watch him marry another or to have him leave altogether. She shook her head. She would not be alone. She would have her aunt and uncle here. She needed to remember that. Nathan put a hand on her forearm. It is not silly. I admit to feeling some trepidation about what we will find. But at least we will not be discovering Calcutta alone. We can do it together. He gave her arm a squeeze and smiled. It will not be so worrisome if we do not have to do it alone. Do you not agree? Justina nodded, only because she feared he would question her further if she did not. Evans approached them. The first boat is set to depart, my lord, Miss Tinsdale. Justina took a step away from Evans and Nathan. I am sure my aunt is in need of my help. I shall take the boat with them to the shore. She glanced at Nathan. Are you sure you do not wish to be my uncle's guest until you can find a place of your own? Nathan patted his haversack. Mr. Martin's letter of introduction should go far in helping me secure lodgings. He waved a hand in front of his face, and I am sure there are others here of my acquaintance. I shall have no trouble in finding a suitable place to live. She smiled and nodded. And you will send word when you have secured something. I shall not be at ease until I know my friend is situated. She stared at him wanting to remember every detail of him in the event this was the last time she was to see him. He took her hand in his and bowed deeply, kissing her fingers. I shall inform you immediately. You have my word. As the warmth spread across her fingers, Justina tried to squelch the thumping of her heart. Oh, she was a ninny. She pulled her hand from his and shook her head blandly at him. Well then, be on your way, my lord. She turned toward the staircase, pausing only a moment to watch as Nathan climbed over the gunwale and down a rope ladder hanging over the side of the ship. His head disappeared as he climbed down to the boat waiting beneath him. 
She swallowed past the lump in her throat, knowing she would be attempting the same climb shortly, knowing this was the beginning of her new life. She closed her eyes and took one last fortifying breath. You wanted this, Justina. You can do this. She straightened her shoulders and lifted her chin. This was a grand new adventure, and she vowed right then that she would enjoy every moment of what awaited her. Justina hurried down the corridor to her aunt and uncle's stateroom. She moved to the side as several seamen stumbled past her with their trunks. They dipped their heads, mumbling their apologies. Once the passage was clear, Justina stepped over the threshold into her aunt's room. I am sorry, aunt. I should have been here helping you get the trunks ready. Her aunt shoved Maybell into Justina's arms, causing her to take a step back into the corridor. Not to worry, dearest, but I am glad you are come now. If you would please take Mabel, I, I do not believe I can take her and manage the rope ladder your uncle has told me of. Justina raised her brows. I am to climb down with her in my arms. The notion seemed rather frightening, even for Justina. Your uncle shall go down first and assist Penny and Matthew. I will hold Maybell until you are part way down, then I shall hand her to you. I'm hopeful you'll be close enough to the bottom that your uncle will be able to assist you the rest of the way. Justina thought it sounded a bit haphazard at best, but she did not have a more thought-out plan. But thinking of what was to happen made Justina tighten her hold on the child. She pressed a kiss to the girl's temple. I will not let any harm come to you, my sweet. Maybell put her hands on Justina's cheeks and pressed them together. Justina's lips puckered and she wiggled them up and down. Maybell pulled her hands away, giggling deeply in her throat. She lifted her hands back to Justina's cheeks. Again! Again! Justina continued her silly faces, grateful for the distraction, until her aunt and uncle came out of the room, shutting the door behind them, each holding the hand of a child. Aunt Martin took in a deep breath and cast a look at her husband. He patted her arm and then put his hand on her back, nudging her forward. Come, my love. Calcutta waits for no one. Her aunt's smile faltered and she looked at Justina. I am most grateful you have come, Justina. Justina moved Maybell to her hip and leant into her aunt's side. As am I, aunt. We shall get through this change together. Her uncle propelled them both toward the stairway. I do not intend to spend another night on this dratted ship. Let us hurry to the boats and get situated. Her aunt placed a shocked hand over her mouth. Lawrence, not in front of the children. Justina laughed behind her hand as her uncle raised his eyes to the heavens. Well, then make haste, Mrs. Martin. I do not wish to be left behind. The six of them hurried onto the deck, only to stand behind several couples waiting to leave the boat. Justina looked out at the river wondering if Nathan was still in one of the boats moving towards the banks, but the boats were much too far away to make out anyone with certainty. She moved Maybell to her other hip, part of her wishing she had gone on the boat with him. But what good would that have served? She had not the directions to the home the East India Company had arranged for her uncle. Maybell lay her head on Justina's shoulder and sighed. Justina drooped. How could she wish herself out of her current situation? Had she not come here to assist her aunt, to help with this sweet child? She looked at the chaos that surrounded them and continued well into the streets of the city. Pushing Nathan from her mind, Justina determined not to let him distract her again from why she was here. Knowing nothing would ever happen between them made the decision only slightly easier to bear. Chapter 15 the carriage turned onto a street lined with grand houses. Aunt Martin leant over to Justina and whispered into her ear, We had to live on Charingi Road. Is that not delightful? Justina nodded. She had read about Charingi Road and knew it to be of a similar nature to Barclay or Grosvenor Square. As with many of those houses, these were built in the Palladian style. It was no wonder her aunt was near raptures. This was undoubtedly the coveted address of Calcutta. Her aunt and uncle would live much grander lifestyles here than in England. Justina looked around at the obviously English houses. Did only other Englishmen cover this location, or did the natives as well? From what she had read, she knew Calcutta had been a mere swamp until the British had come and made it what it was today. The carriage stopped in front of a large three-storey home. Balconies spanned the width of the house on both of the upper floors, while Corinthian columns supported the balconies from below. The railings were made of intricately carved wood, washed in a white paint. A wide set of three steps led up to a terrace under the second-floor balcony. As they approached the front entrance, the door opened up to them, 
revealing a man wearing a tightly wrapped green turban. He opened the door wide and motioned them inside before putting his hands together and bowing. Welcome to Calcutta, Martin Sahib. My name is Laraj Dutta. His English was heavily accented, but Justina found little difficulty in understanding him. Maybell clutched tighter to Justina's neck. He motioned to two women who stood to the side, both wearing colourful dresses that looked nothing like the fashions of London. But Justina thought them every bit as stunning. Binodini Tagore motioned the women forward. This is Charulata and Ajit. They are to be your ayahs. He turned and spoke to the women in a language Justina could not understand, sounding to her like a rumble of foreign sounds. Laraj Dutta turned back to Justina and her aunt. They will show you to your chambers. Both of the women stepped forward. The one in the purple dress bowed. I am Ajit, your ayah. Please, follow me to your room, Justina Mem Sahib. Justina nodded, uncertain what to say to the woman in return, but then she remembered herself. Thank you. The woman dipped her head and moved toward the smooth stone staircase that clung to the side wall. Now that she was closer, Justina could see that dress was not the right word for the girl's clothing. It was more like a bodice, similar to the top of Justina's own gown. However, the skirt looked to be wrapped around the lower half of Ajit's body with the end pulled up over her shoulder. A section of her bare abdomen showed where the fabric did not sweep over it. The fabric looked as soft as any silk Justina had touched in her uncle's warehouse. She lifted her hand to feel if her suspicions were correct, but then dropped it back to her side, realising how improper such an action would be. Justina looked back at her aunt, watching as her ayah introduced herself and then followed after them. They all moved up the staircase to the second floor, Justina followed Ajit down a long corridor, while her aunt and Charalata turned the opposite direction. Ajit stopped at a door nearly at the end of the passageway. The children's room is here. The ayah pointed to the room across the way, and this is your room. She pushed open the door and stepped aside to allow Justina to enter. Justina stopped just inside the door. While the exterior and even the entryway had borne some resemblance to a house in England, there were many things that told her she was no longer in England. A large wooden frame covered in canvas hung suspended from the ceiling. A rope was pulled taut as a boy stood and pulled the frame back and forth to create a breeze. Ajit pointed to the fan. Punka, she said. She then pointed to the boy and said, Punkawala. Justina smiled, grateful to this woman for helping her to understand these new things that seemed so strange. Punka. The word felt odd, and Justina was sure she had not spoken it correctly. Her ayah nodded. A woman came into the room and bowed, then reached for Maybell. The girl's eyes widened and she moved to Justina's back like a monkey. Whimpering, she fumbled for a more secure hold on Justina. Justina smiled at the woman. I shall keep her for now. Once she has rested, I'm sure she'll be more amiable to meeting new people. The nurse put her hands together and bowed before leaving the room. That is Amara. She is to care for the children, Ajit said. Justina nodded and dropped her eyes to the bed. It was covered with a fine netting. She had read of the bugs and insects which crawled and flew about India. This net was, no doubt, to keep such bugs away while one slept. She walked over and lifted the netting slightly. The bed leg sat in a small saucer of liquid. What is the purpose of this? Ajit glanced down at the bed legs. It will keep insects from climbing the bed. Justina shivered at the thought. She took in a deep breath. Reading had given her some notion of what to expect once she arrived, but even all she had read had not quite prepared her for what she saw before her. She moved to the windows and opened up one of the Venetian blinds. A wall of thick, hot breeze blew into her face, distracting her briefly from the view beyond. She closed the blinds without looking farther. Justina, Mem Sahib, you look tired. You rest for a time, Ajit motioned to the bed. Justina nodded and walked toward her. Would you mind calling me Justina? Ajit nodded as she lifted the netting and threw back the covers on the bed. After a thorough search, for what Justina did not know, she helped Justina into bed and tucked the netting around the bed. I come help you ready for dinner, Justina Mem Sahib. Thank you, Ajit. I am grateful for your help. She snuggled down, tucking Maybell into her side, but found no comfort in the weight of the covers. Throwing them off herself, she lay as still as she could, 
allowing the soft breeze and swishing sound of the punkah to lull her into a warm sleep. Justina heard strange noises somewhere in the distance. She cracked her eyes open and looked at the blur through the netting hanging over her bed. She stretched out her arms, letting all she had learnt thus far sink into her mind. Had Nathan found some place to let? Would the letter of introduction from her uncle be enough to get him suitable housing? Her chest tightened. If he did find some place to stay, would he come and tell her of it? Or would the friendship they had developed on the ship slip away? He had assured her it would not, but who was to say what would happen now that they were here? Justina felt a heaviness press down on her chest. She would not think on Lord Nathaniel any longer. There was too much that was new around her to concern herself with a man, especially Nathan and his questionable morals. She bit her lip, feeling the unkindness of her thoughts. Knowing the incident with Lady Elizabeth was not as it seemed had made Justina feel better about her feelings for him. But this was not the first time she had dwelt on the notion that the circumstances surrounding the other ladies his names had been bandied about with were precisely as they seemed. It bothered her more than she cared to admit. Gah! She threw her hands down hard on the mattress and felt Maybelle shift. She scooted away from the child so as not to wake her. Had she not just vowed to think of the gentleman no more, what was wrong with her? She heard a stirring off to the side and glanced over but saw nothing. It must have been the punker. Justina smiled. Just thinking the word made her feel as though she may be coming to belong in this place. This place. India. Even in the few hours she had been here, Justina believed she had seen and learnt more than she had in the last ten years of her life. It was humbling and at the same time unbelievable. How could this place, this extension of the British crown, be so completely different from what she had always known? She sat up and jumped back against the headboard. Arjeet knelt on a rug at the side of the bed, her head only visible now that Justina was sitting up. Was that the movement she had heard earlier? At Justina's movement, Arjeet stood and bowed to Justina. Mem Sahib, you have awakened. Justina swallowed, unnerved by finding the woman watching her while she slept. Another difference Justina would surely need to become accustomed to. It is not yet time to ready you for dinner. What shall I ready you for? Her ayah came toward her and lifted the netting. Justina dropped her feet to the floor and moved to slip on the slippers sitting there. Ajit dropped the netting, allowing it to fall onto Justina's lap and snatched up the slippers. No, Mem Sahib, not yet. She held the slippers at arm's length, with the heels down and the soles facing her body. She clapped the shoes together several times, then turned the soles toward the ceiling. Justina's brows creased. You must never slip your feet into slipper without clapping first. The ayah clapped the shoes together again for Justina's benefit. It's very dangerous. What could possibly harm me in my shoes? Justina pushed the netting behind her and reached for the slippers that Arjeet held out to her. Scorpions, Mem Sahib among other things. A shudder passed down her back. She had seen drawings of scorpions in one of the books she had read. They were hideous creatures. Just the thought that one could be in her slipper made her glance inside the one in her hand. Her nose flared in distaste as she peered inside. Her ayah's action suddenly made more sense. Ajit, were you searching the bed for scorpions earlier? The woman nodded. Yes, this house has been empty for several months. Servants have cleaned, but scorpions come where the house is clean or not. Justina made sure Maybelle was sleeping soundly and moved to her dressing table and sat down. I would like to take a walk around the grounds. Is there time enough for that? Ajit nodded and started removing the pins from Justina's hair. What do you wish to wear on your walk? Justina looked at her eye in the mirror. Her nearly black hair was pulled back onto a tight knot and her skin was the colour of a deep tan. She was as handsome as any lady Justina had seen in London. It was odd to have her maid asking which dress she preferred. Her maid, Hastings at home, would have made the selection without asking. It was part of her job to know what Justina wanted without being given instructions. But Justina found she did not mind offering direction to this new maid. She was still wearing the travelling dress she had worn when they left the ship. She had been so tired earlier she had not even changed into a lighter dress but now it clung to her moist skin. It was much too hot to be worn in this climate. Had she brought anything from England cool enough for this place? 
England had been warm when she left, but it was nothing like what she was experiencing now. Perhaps she and her aunt would need to make a shopping trip in the next few days. The wardrobe she had brought with her seemed woefully inadequate. I think the pink dress will be light enough for this heat. The ayah nodded and moved toward the wardrobe where all of Justina's dresses were neatly hanging. It appeared watching her was not the only thing her ayah had done while Justina slept. She returned with the pink dress Justina had requested. Come, Mam Sahib, let me help you from that gown. Chapter 16 Nathan paced the length of the parlour, his hands clasped behind his back. This room was nearly as spartanly furnished as the rooms in the house he had just let. He had thought it was just his house, but perhaps the lack of furniture was indicative of India. The Martins' house seemed grand in every other aspect. It had been nearly a week since he left Justina on the ship and came ashore, and it had been perhaps the longest week of his life. He had wished to see her days ago, but felt himself unable to face her until he could boast permanent lodgings, which had proven more difficult than he had anticipated. Mr Martin's letter of recommendation had helped, but in the end he'd had to use his father's name and influence to secure a place within walking distance of the esplanade. Nathan was not accustomed to being a stranger in society. When he had found himself in such situations, he had always managed to make friends quickly. But that was not the case here. He had figured with Calcutta being an English colony, the society would be similar to that of London or even Cambridge, but it most certainly was not. Most of the English were of merchant class employed by the East India Company, and those not of merchant status were doctors and lawyers, most of whom were also employed by the East India Company. Never had Nathan seen such a haughty group of people, with little reason to be such as he had found here. Most of them lived far greater lifestyles than they could ever hope to live in London. It was no wonder they stayed in Calcutta for years. The door opened behind him, and he spun around to see Justina in the doorway. His chest tightened, even as his shoulders relaxed. She smiled at him, and he felt all of the stress of the last week fade. As she came forward, he noticed her eyes were brighter than he had ever seen them. The brown of her iris reminded him of dark honey. How had he ever thought them dull? He bowed to her. Miss Jasmine, it is so good to see you. He wanted to tell her how much he had missed their conversations, how much he had missed her. But he held back. You seem to be adjusting well to Calcutta. She grinned. Every day I find something new to amaze and delight me. She tilted her head. What of you, my lord? How are you finding India? He motioned to the doors leading out onto the veranda. Shall we take a turn while we talk? It looks as though you still have some shade outside. Jasmine nodded. I would be delighted, my lord. He missed her using his Christian name. She clasped her hands in front of her, so he did not offer her his arm. I thought we had settled on Nathan, Jasmine. A slight smile turned up her lips. I was not sure, now that we are among society, I did not want to presume anything. I should prefer Nathan, at least when we are not out in society. I believe you indicated it would not be proper then. He inclined his head toward her, not that I have ever cared for such things, but I should not wish to embarrass you. They walked to a small structure. It looked like a miniature Greek temple, or something similar to pictures he had seen displayed at the museum in London. Five white marble columns supported a domed roof, but there were no walls, keeping the room inside open and airy. He led her inside and motioned to the bench before moving to sit himself. Jasmine reached out a hand and stopped him. Wait, Nathan. Her eyes were wide with concern and he moved to the side. What is it? She leant over and squinted into the shadows beneath the stone benches. My ayah told me never to sit anywhere outside without checking first for snakes. It is quite common for them to seek out the shade in the heat of the day. Nathan felt a quiver run through his body. He hated snakes. Even drawings in books made his blood turn cold and sent a shudder through him. He joined Jasmine in the search under the bench. At the far side of the small rotunda, a round coil lay in the shadow. Nathan reached out a hand and put it around Jasmine's waist. Slowly the two of them backed away. I was not disposed to sit there anyway. Nathan's nostrils flared as he imagined them sitting above the serpent. Once they were several rods away, Jasmine pulled out of his arm and stepped to the side. Nathan frowned. 
He had not realised he still held her. She seemed to fit so well within his arms. Rather than find another bench, Nathan found himself wary of them now. They walked around the grass and through a grove of trees. He pointed up to something hanging from a tree in front of them. What is that? Jasmine tilted her head back slightly. Oh, it is a mango. Have you tried one yet? Nathan shook his head. No, I have had little time for such pleasures. Jasmine called to a dark-skinned man, working in a garden a ways off. Binodini Tagor? The man came over and placed his hands together and bowed. Mem Sahib. Jasmine smiled at him and pointed to the mango tree. Could you please pick me a mango? The man nodded and then scurried up the tree as if he were a monkey. Nathan's eyes widened as the man plucked several fruits from the tree before climbing back down. Jasmine clasped her hands together. Danyavad, Benodini Tagore. The man nodded and motioned toward a small house located not far from the main house. She nodded. Yes, please take them to the kitchen. I should like to have them with our tea. He bowed to her again. Yes, Mem Sahib. She turned to Nathan. I am happy to be the person to give you your first taste of mango. She looked back toward the cooking hut. I think you shall love it, Nathan. She brought her gaze back to him, and the breeze carried her scent past him. He let out a deep breath. He had missed this. Very much, if he was being truthful. He had never felt the absence of Ian or Tierney as he had Jasmine. Perhaps it was because they did not smell as lovely as she did. Or perhaps it was because they were not as good at conversation as she was. Their voices did not have a lilt to them, nor did Ian's laugh make Nathan feel like the world was brighter because of it. Ian and Tierney were just not Jasmine. Nathan shook his head. Of course they were not Jasmine. What a bacon-brained thing to think. Is something wrong, Nathan? Jasmine's voice brought him around. Pardon, he shook his head again. No, no, everything is fine. Except that I am a complete nodcock. Are you certain? You seemed concerned just now. He smiled. I was just thinking on that snake we discovered. I should thank you for making me aware of such things or I might not survive this country. What do you need as a good valet to help you know such things? She intertwined her fingers in front of her. I find my Aya more important than my Abigail at home. Hastings was proficient at doing my hair and picking the right gown. But of what importance are such things if there is a scorpion hiding in my slipper? Nathan felt his face blanch. Scorpions hide in your shoes. Jasmine nodded her head fiercely. I should never have believed it if I did not see one tumble out of my pink slipper just yesterday. She pursed her lips. My uncle says if I find one, I am to have one of the servants dispose of it, as they are more accustomed to the creatures. Nathan looked down at his hessians. He had not thought to check them before slipping his feet inside. As if sensing his thoughts, Jasmine put her hand on his arm. Your boots should be safe, my lord. But if you choose to wear shoes to the ball next week, you will certainly want to shake them out first. She tilted her head. You are coming to the Haversham's ball, are you not? He cleared his throat. He had not received any invitations as yet. But then, he'd not had a residence until that very morning. He expected invitations to begin arriving at any time. He shook his head. I have not, as yet, been invited. But as I came to tell you, I have secured a residence. I shall be sleeping there tonight. Jasmine smiled widely. Oh, Nathan, I am so happy for you. Where is it located? Her praise made him feel like a schoolboy receiving a pat on the head from his headmaster. Yet it still made him warm all over to think she was pleased with him. I made sure it was within walking distance of the Esplanade. I thought perhaps we could meet there and take a turn about it. I believe it is very similar to walking in Hyde Park. Except I do not believe the danger of a tiger leaping out and eating you has ever been a threat at Hyde Park. She grinned at his wide eyes. I am teasing you, my lord. Ajit, my ayah, says the tigers tend to keep to the jungle areas just outside the city, so I believe we shall be safe in the Esplanade. Perhaps I need an ayah rather than a valet. She seems to be of great benefit to you. Jasmine led him out from beneath a banyan tree. Now you have a house. You will search for a valet, will you not? He nodded. Yes, it appears I am ready to begin living the life of an Englishman in Calcutta. I am happy for it. They stopped walking, both of them seeming content to absorb the scenery around them. This is lovely. Have you drawn it yet? 
Her face turned a shade of pink and she looked away. I have not. There has been little time to do such things. I have been busy assisting my aunt with setting up the house and teaching my cousins. You should come draw it, Jasmine. I'm sure you are one of the few people I know who could do this view justice. She shrugged, perhaps with watercolours. Nathan wished she had her crayons with her, so he could prove to her that she could create this beautiful view even without the variety of colours. He had seen what she could do when they were on the ship. She had created an amazing sunset using only the black, red and brown colours available to her. I believe you could do so, even with charcoals. Jasmine blushed again and Nathan felt his smile grow. It was good to spend time with her again. There is a street market of sorts located not far from here. He turned to face her. Would you care to join me? Harjeet calls it a bazaar. Her eyes lit. I confess I have been most anxious to see it. She looked down at her dress, although I am not sure I am properly dressed for such an event. He gave her a bland expression. What would you change into? Anything else would be much too hot. He ran his eyes over the length of her and was pleased to see the blush which had not completely left her face deepen. But if you would prefer to change, I shall wait. He looked around him and then leant in toward her. Truthfully, I have little else to do today. If I must wait an hour for you to return, I shall do so. She looked down the front of her dress. I suppose there is nothing wrong with this dress. Let me tell Aunt Martin of our plans. She may be in need of something from the market. He held his arm out for her to take and was pleasantly surprised when she placed her hand atop it. He breathed in, deeply, truly happy in the moment. The thought made him pause a step before resuming his walk. Had he ever felt this truly contented before in his life? Jasmine dropped her head forward, trying to catch a glimpse of his face. Have you changed your mind, Nathan? Would you prefer to go another day? He shook his head. No, it is quite the opposite. I was just thinking about how happy I am. I know I should be distraught over my current circumstances, but I find I am not. I am perfectly content. Jasmine gave him a long look, but he was not sure what she meant by it. Did she not believe his claim, or was it that she felt the same? He did not know what precisely it was about India that made him so happy, but something did, and he planned to embrace it fully. Let us take tea first, and then we can explore the bazaar at our leisure. Jasmine led him into a small parlour. A man stood in the corner, pulling on the rope to move the punkah. A servant came in moments later, carrying a tea service and a plate of bright yellow flesh. Nathan assumed it was the mango Jasmine had spoken of earlier. Mrs Martin came into the room as Jasmine poured out the first cup of tea. Oh, Lord Nathaniel, we were beginning to wonder after you. Mrs Martin sat down next to Jasmine and took over the task of pouring the tea. Jasmine picked up a small plate and placed several slices of the mango fruit upon it before offering it to Nathan. I think you will find this quite delicious, my lord. Nathan speared a slice with his fork and raised it to his nose, sniffing it. It smelt sweet. He tentatively put it into his mouth, taking a small bite. It had a soft texture, similar to butter, but unlike butter, the mango's juices dribbled down Nathan's chin. He wiped at it with a serviette, as the sweetness, with a hint of citrus, filled his mouth. This is delicious. He put the rest of the slice in his mouth. Jasmine clapped her hands. I am so glad you like it. I find it so refreshing in the heat of the day. Mrs Martin sipped at her tea. Have you found a place to let, my lord? Nathan nodded because his mouth was still full of mango. Hurrying and swallowing the last of it, he wiped at his mouth again. Yes, it is very near the esplanade. Oh, you are not able to find anything on Chowringi. That is too bad for you and us, my lord. Nathan's lips twitched. It seemed even Mrs Martin was not immune to her elevated status here in Calcutta. No, unfortunately. He glanced at Jasmine. She held her teacup to her lips, but he could see her smiling behind it. But I am in close proximity, so I shall be able to call on you, my dear friends, whenever I am missing your company. Mrs Martin brightened. Oh, I am most happy to hear it. Justina has been quite lonely without you these past days. Aunt Martin! Jasmine scowled at her aunt. Such a thing to say. She put down her teacup and stood. Lord Nathaniel has asked me to accompany him to the bazaar, 
As the children have completed their schoolwork, I had hoped you would permit me to accompany him. Her aunt waved her away. Of course, dearest. See what there is available and report back. I have no notion what is even for sale. Jasmine glanced at Nathan. Of course, aunt. Moments later, they were strolling along Charingi, headed toward the marketplace. The afternoon was sweltering, but Nathan barely noticed it. Jasmine was shaded by a parasol, and colourful birds squawked and fluttered about in the treetops. What was a little heat when there was so much beauty around him? The trees themselves were, in many cases, a work of art. As they drew closer to the bazaar, the crowds of people thickened, many of them dressed in the colourful clothes of the natives as they hollered and yelled about the items they had for sale. Nathan did not understand a word, and yet his stomach fluttered and his eyes grew wide. It was the most incredible thing he had ever seen. A tittering sort of music floated through the air above the mayhem of the crowd. Nathan turned to Jasmine. Do you hear that? She grinned and nodded as they weaved their way through the crowds of people and at times cows that filled the street. They followed the sound until they came to a man sitting on a roughly woven rug laid out on the ground with his back up against a wall. He played a long pipe with an enlarged section toward the top. It looked to Nathan like a clay-type pot with a pipe running through the top and bottom. The instrument was carved with an intricate pattern and the man swayed back and forth as he blew into it. Nathan closed his eyes as he listened to the music the man played. A hand closed around his upper arm and a sort of choked scream sounded. Nathan's eyes jerked open and he turned toward Jasmine. Her eyes were wide as she pointed toward two baskets sitting in front of the musician. His mouth dropped open as he saw two large snakes with wide necks stretching up and out of the woven basket. They swayed to the music as the man played, following his every move. Nathan stepped in front of Jasmine, putting himself between her and the serpents. He took several steps back, walking in step with her. He did not know how fast the snake could travel if it were to leave the basket, but he was not willing to take the chance that it might break free and strike Jasmine. Several people took their places watching the snake musician, creating a sort of barrier between the snakes and Jasmine. He grabbed hold of her hand and pulled her farther down the street. When they could no longer hear the music, she pulled Nathan to a stop. He released her hand and stepped in front of her, staring her in the eye. Are you well? I can return you to your home immediately. She ran a shaky hand down the front of her gown. No, I am well. I was just startled is all. I had no idea such creatures would come out of those baskets. She took a deep breath and nodded toward a stand full of colourful rugs, fabrics and wraps. Let us continue on with our original plan. He held her gaze for a moment longer, still seeing the fear in her eyes. He felt the sudden urge to reach out and pull her into an embrace, to hold her in his arms and tell her everything would be well. But he did not. Instead, he held his arm out to her and motioned for her to lead the way. All the while, he wondered where such thoughts had possibly come from. Chapter 17 Justina pulled the small book of blank paper toward her and added the sums in her head. Very good, Penny. You have quite a mind for numbers. I bet you will be of great help to your father in his business if you continue with your studies. Penny beamed up at her and took the book back, working on the next problem Justina had given her. Matthew slid onto her lap and nudged his hand into hers. He was doing better at holding his chalk, but when he was overly tired or feeling anxious, he often resumed the practice they had started on the ship. Justina snuggled her cheek next to his, and slowly they worked the chalk together. She could hardly believe she had lived in Calcutta for nearly a month. Her fears that Nathan would forget her entirely had proven unfounded. He came to visit most days, or would, at the very least, meet her in the esplanade. If she did not know better, she would have allowed herself to think Nathan might be courting her. But she did know better. She lifted her eyes as her aunt scurried into the room. Dearest, I have wonderful news. She waved a paper wildly in the air above her head. We have done it. We have been invited to the Governor-General's ball at month's end. Can you believe our good fortune? Justina would be just as happy to sit at home and read a book she'd bought from one of the few English booksellers. But this was what her aunt desired above all else. 
The invitation to Lady Stonebridge's card party this evening had been a great achievement for her aunt to secure, but the Governor-General's ball was to be the event of the year. It was all her aunt had spoken of since arriving in Calcutta. You do not seem excited, dearest. Is it not the most delightful news? Justina smiled at her aunt. Indeed, it is delightful news. I think we should visit Peterfeld's Emporium this week. Surely they have had new gowns arrive from London since last we visited. But, aunt, we have plenty of gowns from London which we have not yet worn. I do not think it necessary. It most certainly is necessary. I have heard tell that this ball will be the grandest event of the year. It is a great honour to have been invited. Yes, I have heard that as well. It is a great tribute to you, aunt, that the Marchioness has singled you out. Justina released a shallow sigh. If you think it best for us to visit Peterfeld's, then I shall be happy to accompany you. Her aunt sat down at the table next to Penny and glanced over at her book. How are your sums coming along, Penny? Very well, Mamma. I have begun subtraction. Aunt Martin patted the girl's hand. Very good, my dear. Very good. Penny understood the dismissal and returned to her work. What do you have planned for us today? Justina put Matthew on the chair to her other side. A servant poked her head into the schoolroom. Mem Sahib, the baby awake. Aunt Martin sighed. Where is the nurse? The servant shook her head. I know not, Mem Sahib. Justina put her hand on the woman's arm. I shall go and fetch her aunt. You stay and rest for a moment. Thank you, dearest. I don't know what I would do without you. The parlour of Lady Stonebridge's home reminded Justina of the Prince Regent's pavilion at Brighton. It was decorated to the point of being garish and obviously shouted to those who visited of the wealth the family possessed. Although Justina grudgingly acknowledged the Indian influence in the peacock blue walls with gold accents that dotted the room. Other than the wall colour, the room could have been straight out of a townhouse in London. Couches had been pushed to the perimeter of the room to clear space for at least a dozen tables. To the far side of the room, a table sat laden with refreshments of all different kinds. Is this not a grand room, Justina? Aunt Martin spoke from her side. Yes, I had no idea it would be quite so... I agree, dearest. Her aunt was in earnest. Justina covered her twitching lips with her hand. Her aunt was an enigma. At times she was quite sensible, and then there were times such as these when she acted as if she was completely cotton-brained. Justina shook her head. As much as it baffled her, she dearly loved her aunt. Excuse me. A young lady passed in front of Justina and moved farther into the room. The lady looked to be several years younger than Justina, no more than twenty by her estimation, and was accompanied by a woman who was likely her mother. Her long black hair was knotted at the back of her head, with a string of tiny pearls wrapped around it. The girl's creamy skin was to be admired, and for a moment Justina wished that she cared more for bonnets. The lady glanced over her shoulder and caught Justina's eye, which made Justina look away. How did it appear for her to be caught staring at the lady? Perhaps we should find a table, aunt. Her aunt waved at a matron across the room. She turned and looked at Justina. Dearest, would you mind too terribly if I joined Mrs. Patton for the first round? Justina looked longingly at the sofa across the room. The thought of sitting on the stiff fabric chair, her dress clinging to her legs in the heat, did not sound appealing. But it was more so than sitting at a card table for hours on end. She was not fond of cards, as a rule. Justina looked around the room and wished, not for the first time, that Nathan had been invited as well. She knew at some point they would need to cease spending so much time together, but she did not like to think about when that time would come. She was also certain it was only a matter of time before his eye was turned toward a lady or two. She made her way to the settee sitting next to a window. The blinds were closed so as to not draw insects toward the lights, but a hint of a breeze could be felt between the slates. Justina sat down and leant toward the window. Pardon me, she opened her eyes and looked up to see the young lady with the creamy skin standing before her. Are you Miss Tinsdale? I know we have not been introduced, but I have hoped to make your acquaintance. She looked at the space on the sofa next to Justina. Please, join me. Justina looked at the young woman. She was quite certain she had never lain eyes on her before. That the lady knew of Justina's name was curious, to say the least. It was not as if she was so very well known as to draw the attention of all Calcutta society. 
My name is Miss Verity Kendall. I have just arrived from England with my parents. She folded her hands primly in her lap. Justina dipped her head. It is very nice to meet you, Miss Kendall. Justina furrowed her brow. I fear I am at a disadvantage. How did you know my name? Have we attended other such events together? She nodded her head. I saw you at the Henderson's Musicale last week. As soon as I saw you, I knew we were destined to be dearest friends. Justina smiled. She had seen such relationships form in England, but never had it happened to her. It is so kind of you to single me out. She gave an awkward laugh, as you have certainly already discovered, one cannot have too many friends in Calcutta. Miss Kendall put her hand on Justina's and laughed. Oh, you are so right, Miss Tinsdale. But if I am only able to claim your friendship, I shall consider myself lucky. The girl's flattery was doing it much too brown, and it put Justina on edge. Still, she tried not to judge the girl too harshly. She was probably just nervous. Justina looked to the card tables spread around the room. Many of the tables already had their required players, but a few were still short a player or two. Are you not interested in playing cards? There are still several tables with seats available. Miss Kendall waved her hand in front of her. Oh, I am not overly fond of card games. I confess, I would much prefer to stay and converse with you. Oh, how fortunate am I. Justina did not know why she did not particularly care for this young lady. You mentioned friends. Have you been able to secure some friendship since coming to India? Miss Kendall gave her a wide-eyed, innocent look, and it made Justina dislike her all the more. I have been fortunate in my acquaintances. I made a very dear friend on our passage here, and I have acquired several others since our arrival. Justina looked out over the tables, reconsidering her earlier notion about playing cards. Miss Kendall smiled widely. I saw you were speaking with Lord Nathaniel at the Musicale. Is he one of the friends you have made since arriving? Justina squinted at her. What was she about? I believe Lord Nathaniel and I are friends. At least, I consider him such. But you would need to consult him about his feelings towards me. Justina felt her face heat at the inference that Nathan had feelings for her. Not that he has feelings for me. I was simply meaning that I consider him a friend, but I should not endeavour to speak for him. What of Miss Parker? Justina breathed in through her nose. Surely the girl was simply trying to learn and make a few friends. Justina should be more sympathetic toward her, but something felt off about their interaction. Yes, Miss Parker and I are acquainted. Justina scooted closer to the arm of the couch, trying to put some distance between her and Miss Kendall. A bead of perspiration ran between her shoulder blades, soaking into the fabric of her dress where it tied at her back. If only she could plead a headache and return home. My apologies, Miss Kendall said. While I am not fond of cards, you may be, and I am keeping you from the tables. How thoughtless of me! She half smiled, half pouted and Justina wondered if such a look was achieved by constant practice in front of the mirror. The girl continued on. I was just so anxious to meet you I did not remember my manners. Justina swallowed as her stomach twisted. What was wrong with her? This young woman was simply looking for friendship in a strange place, and Justina was treating her as an enemy. What had made her take such an instant dislike of Miss Kendall? Was it because she had asked after Nathan? Pasting a smile on her face, Justina gave the young lady an appraising look. Her jaw ached with the pressure of her clenched teeth. Miss Kendall seemed just the type of woman to draw Nathan's eye. Flashes of colour popped before Justina's eyes. It was only a matter of time before this happened, before he found someone besides her to spend his time with. Should she not be grateful she'd had nearly six months with him? Pushing aside her jealousy, that is what she was feeling, was it not? She took a calming breath. While I do not profess to know everyone in society here in Calcutta, I would be happy to introduce you to those with whom I am acquainted. I also know how it feels to be without friends. Miss Kendall put her hand back on Justina's arm. Oh, Miss Tinsdale, you are too kind, but I shall be eternally grateful for your assistance. She looked around the room. I did not see Lord Nathaniel here tonight. She looked at Justina inquiringly. Or did I miss him? Justina shook her head, trying not to misinterpret everything Miss Kendall said. No, he is not here. A pity. I should have liked to have been introduced to him. She squinted toward a man in the corner. 
The only man I am acquainted with is Mr. Keats, but I find his company quite stifling. Justina knew of Mr. Keats, had even danced with him a time or two. There was not anything so terribly wrong with him, and he had a respectable shipping business. Why did Miss Kendall think herself so above this man? Stop it. Justina scolded herself. She needed to stop trying to find fault with this woman. Lord Nathaniel will be attending Lady Sutherland's musicale on Sunday. Have you received an invitation? Miss Kendall scowled. No, I have not. Interesting that Miss Kendall would be able to secure an invitation to this party, which was by far more exclusive and sought after than the Sutherlands. As if sensing what Justina might be thinking, Miss Kendall looked over at her. My mother and Lady Stonebridge are dear friends. They grew up as neighbours and were as close as sisters at one time. So this girl was not completely without influence here. If she had the backing of someone as prominent as Lady Stonebridge, why did she need Justina's help in making friends? May I share a secret with you, Miss Tinsdale? Justina nodded, even as she felt the imprudence of being in Miss Kendall's confidence. I knew of Lord Nathaniel before coming to India. I have attended several balls where he was in attendance. I had hopes of him asking me for a dance at the last ball before I left London, but imagine my disappointment when he was not to be found and no one knew of his whereabouts. Again, the pouty lips made an appearance. Gah, Nathan would be driven to distraction by such a look. Imagine my surprise when I arrived in India and found none other than Lord Nathaniel himself. Yes, that is quite a lot of imagining, is it not? Justina looked away, afraid Miss Kendall would see the anger, but mostly the fear and jealousy written all over Justina's face. Miss Kendall let out a tittering laugh. I find I can hardly wait to meet him at the next ball. With so few ladies present, surely he will single me out. Justina clenched her teeth harder. If she spent much more time with this lady, her poor teeth would be nothing but dust. If you hope to win his attentions, I would suggest you stop with the tittering laugh. He is not amused by such things. Miss Kendall's face dropped into a frown. Oh, I had no notion. Perhaps it is why he had already disregarded me. Justina immediately felt bad for the unkindness of her words. I am sorry. I did not mean to speak harshly. She rubbed at her temple. It seemed she would not be lying about the headache should she choose to tell her aunt and cut their evening short. But I have such a headache. Oh, Miss Tinsdale, shall I go and fetch your... She trailed off, obviously not knowing who Justina had come with. My Aunt Martin. The young lady rose, but Justina grasped her arm and pulled her back down. No, she was so looking forward to tonight. I cannot cut her evening short. She leant back, resting her head back on the sofa. I believe if I rest and close my eyes, I shall be well. Miss Kendall cleared her throat. I, I know you are not well, but perhaps, with your eyes remaining closed, of course, you could tell me more about Lord Nathaniel's likes and dislikes. I should not like to displease him if he should ever single me out. Justina felt a burning in her chest and throat. She forced the heat down and counted to ten. What to tell Miss Kendall? Should she tell her that his laugh the real one that came out only when he was truly joyful, was like butter on a slice of bread fresh from the oven, or that his eyes crinkled slightly when he thought you were in jest. Perhaps you should tell Miss Kendall that the true Lord Nathaniel was nothing like what he pretended to be in society. For a moment, Justina considered telling Miss Kendall to leave Lord Nathaniel be, to go in search of another gentleman. Nathan was slowly losing his old self and becoming the man that he should always have been, he did not need the likes of Miss Kendall to make a muddle of it all. He does not like manipulative women who pretend to be something they are not so as to get what they desire. Miss Kendall sighed. Justina cracked an eye open, but the light was too painful so she closed it again. But is that not what all the ladies of society do, Miss Tinsdale? Miss Kendall actually sounded sincere, which only served to make Justina's head throb all the more. Chapter 18 Nathan sat on the terrace awaiting Justina and her aunt and uncle. The tatties, thin strips of bamboo, moved ever so slightly, only letting slivers of sunlight through. A servant brought a cup of mango juice and set it on the table in front of him. Juice, Nathaniel Sahib. Nathan smiled and nodded. 
Daniel vowed. He put the glass to his lips and drank deeply. Lord Nathaniel, I hope we have not kept you long. Mr. Martin and his wife stepped through the cascas hanging in the doorway. The wet matting was meant to help cool the air, but the feel of it on his cheeks and neck as he pushed through it still gave him the shivers. Of course not, and your servants are as accommodating as ever. I have already received a glass of mango juice. He lifted the glass in a sort of toast. He put the glass on the table and looked between the couple. Where was Jasmine? Miss Tinsdale is joining us this morning, is she not? A sudden thought made his stomach clench. She is not unwell, is she? There were so many dratted insects, all of them poisonous, it seemed. It was completely feasible that she was ill. I am quite well, my lord, as you can see. Jasmine stepped through the cascas onto the veranda. Nathan's stomach flipped. She looked lovely in a pale yellow gown, the colour emphasising the tan of her skin. She would never be mistaken for a native, but he found the colour suited her. She smiled, and his breath caught. I am happy to see it. Pulling himself together, he clapped his hands. Are you ready for this adventure? Jasmine grinned at him as she pulled her last glove on, intertwining her fingers and pushing them deeper into the gloves. I do not understand why you cannot tell me what we are to be doing today. It seems rather childish. Mrs. Martin tusked. Pish! I think it very dashing that Lord Nathaniel wishes to surprise you, Justina. You could use a little whimsy in your life. She straightened her bonnet and placed her hand in the crook of her husband's arm. Shall we be on our way? Jasmine tugged on her bonnet and jerked the ribbons into a bow beneath her chin. Very well. I shall try to enjoy myself. They walked around the house and through a gate at the side, pushing onto the walkway of Charingi Road. A carriage was waiting in front of the house. Jasmine raised a brow. It is not within walking distance. Nathan grinned, loving that she had no notion of what he had planned. He could see the curiosity and impatience at war within her gaze. It is not far, but I did not wish to tire you out before we have even arrived. Mr. Martin handed his wife up into the carriage and then climbed in behind her. Nathan stood at the door and waited for Jasmine to approach, but she stood rooted in place. Why do I feel as though I should be nervous, Nathan? she asked in a fierce whisper. He walked over to her and grasped her hands. If anything, it seemed to only increase her apprehension. Perhaps he should just tell her he did not like seeing her this way. You have nothing to be nervous about. He leant in and whispered in her ear, I will never let anything happen to you, Jasmine. Trust me. She pulled her head slightly back and stared at him. So many emotions flitted through her eyes, he could scarce determine even one of them. She pulled her hand out of his and gave one firm nod of her head. I do trust you, Nathan. She took a breath and mumbled, even if it is not prudent. Now why should she think it was not prudent to trust him? Did she think he would let harm befall her? Maybe she was speaking of this particular outing only. Whatever her meaning, he did not like the implication. She held out her hand and allowed him to hand her into the carriage. Nathan grimaced. Just getting her in the carriage felt like a victory. Nathan climbed in and was disappointed to see Mr. Martin on one side of the carriage and Jasmine and Mrs. Martin on the other side. He grunted. It seemed Mr. Martin was to be his confidant during the ride. He had intended to whisper hints about their adventure to Jasmine as they journeyed there, but it seemed best to keep his whispered comments to himself, as Mr. Martin would certainly not see the humour in them. Jasmine twisted at the tips of her gloves, her anxiety obvious. Miss Tinsdale, why are you so nervous? What happened to the lady who made this journey from England with such fervour? She knew where she was going on that voyage. She looked pointedly at him. That lady does not appreciate surprises, he wished he was sitting next to her so he could reassure her, but he could not do that from across the carriage. He leant forward, trying to keep his voice low. Jasmine, look at me. She pulled her eyes from the window and stared at him. You said you trusted me. She nodded. Then there is no reason for you to be apprehensive about this surprise. I will make sure nothing happens to you. She nodded again, and he was relieved to see her shoulders relax, but she kept her gaze on him, as if he was her anchor. Nathan liked the thought of being her anchor. Mr. and Mrs. Martin kept up a steady stream of conversation on the journey. Jasmine, however, did not seem herself today. 
In point of fact, for the last few days she had seemed distracted, even irritated. Was it with him, or was it something else entirely? The carriage stopped before an ancient-looking structure. The wall of pillars and arches made it look as if it were the entrance to a temple of some sort. In truth, Nathan had no idea what it had served as in its former life. He helped Jasmine from the carriage, and she stood next to him, examining their surroundings. Banyan trees drooped low around the columns, looking as a curtain of sorts around the edges. In the distance, the chatter of monkeys could be heard. Jasmine looked up at him. Are you certain we are safe here? He nodded, feeling only a hint of hesitation. He believed they were safe. While he had not actually been here in person before, he had heard talk of it from his valet and cook. But now that he was here and responsible for Jasmine as well as Mr and Mrs Martin, uncertainty crept into his mind. Was this a place where tigers might wander? Surely his valet would not put Nathan in harm's way without first warning him. He nodded his head again, this time with more confidence, and put a smile on his face. We are perfectly safe, I assure you. He looked toward the pillared wall, but there is no need for us to continue standing about here. Let us move inside and proceed with the event of the day. He extended his arm out to her, and she placed her hand there. Why did she not tuck her hand into the crook of his arm, as her aunt did with her uncle? He wished she would. He could imagine what it might feel like to have her hand securely tucked into his arm. A warmth crept up his neck and into his ears. He guided her through the triple set of columns until they entered a large grassy courtyard where he was gratified to hear her deep intake of breath. Oh, Nathan! He grinned, knowing she was moved because she had not used his title even while in the presence of Mr and Mrs Martin. They are magnificent! A slow smile spread across her face, her eyes riveted to the four large grey beasts walking about the grassy courtyard. Oh my! was all Mrs Martin said and she pulled a handkerchief from her reticule and fanned at her face with her hand. Nathan put his hand on the small of Jasmine's back and nudged her forward. She stiffened slightly. Come, I believe you told me once that you wished to ride upon one of those beasts. The elephants' heads and trunks, as well as their large ears and legs, were painted in a colourful floral pattern. A woven rug hung down on both sides, with a small wooden box strapped to the back, reminding Nathan of a saddle. Several men in turbans walked around with the elephants, talking to them and giving them commands. Jasmine stopped walking just short of the grass. I know I said this is what I wanted to do. Her breath came out faster and more ragged, but now that we are here, I am not certain I can follow through. She turned to Nathan with wide eyes. They are very large. Nathan laughed. But they are perfectly safe. Look at how tame they are. Jasmine sucked in another deep breath, catching her bottom lip in her teeth as she exhaled. She turned to her aunt. I said I would die trying to get you on an elephant, aunt. What do you say? Her aunt's eyes went wide and she shook her head. I believe the only way you will get me atop one of those things is if I am dead. To show herself in earnest, Mrs Martin took several steps back, placing herself firmly within the pillared walls. Jasmine frowned at her aunt, but then shook her head and turned her attention back to the elephant's. Must I go alone? Mr Martin stepped forward. I will accompany you, Justina, if you prefer. Nathan looked at the man with a furrowed brow. Surely the portly gentleman would be of little help should a problem arise while riding the elephant. Nathan leant down and whispered into Jasmine's ear. If you are frightened, I think it best if I accompany you. I would feel terrible if something happened and I was not there to help you. Her eyes widened. Do you expect something to happen? No, no. He shook his head, wanting to kick himself for making her doubtful. I have been assured it is perfectly safe. She turned, offering him a coy smile. You would accompany me. That is very gentlemanly of you, my lord. Lud, she was handsome, with her eyes so wide with excitement. I am nothing if not a gentleman. Besides, I should not like my dearest friend to be frightened. A shadow passed over her face, and Nathan looked up to see if a cloud had passed over the sun. It still shone down brightly, making him think he had only imagined the change in her. Have you changed your mind? Would you prefer to ride alone? He hoped she had not. The thought of riding with her had firmly planted itself in his mind, and he found he liked it. She bit her lower lip again, and Nathan's eyes were drawn down. 
Had they always been such an appealing shade of pink? No, I still wish for you to accompany me. The enthusiasm in her voice seemed less than it had been only moments before. She crossed her arms over her middle. Let us mount the beast before I lose my confidence. He grinned, excited that she was going to actually follow through. He had begun to doubt her. They walked farther out onto the grass and waited for one of the turbaned men to direct them. Three men guided elephants over to Nathan and Mr. Martin. The first man placed his hands together and bowed. Sahib, you wish to ride an elephant? Nathan nodded. Yes, the young lady and I should like to ride together, and her uncle, he motioned to Mr. Martin, wishes to ride himself. The third man led his elephant away. The man nodded and clicked his tongue. The elephant knelt down on his front knees first, before dropping all the way to the ground. The man reached up and opened a small door on the wooden box. Kneeling one knee on the ground, he motioned for Jasmine to step up into the box. Nathan's brow furrowed. That did not seem proper in the least. It would require Jasmine to hold the strange man's hand. Besides, the possibility of him catching a glimpse beneath her skirt seemed highly probable. A burning started in his stomach. He stepped forward. I shall assist the lady onto the elephant. He stepped forward and placed his hands around Jasmine's waist. She jerked her head around, catching his gaze. Not to worry, Jasmine. I will help you up. She squinted at him, studying his face, but then turned and looked forward. Nathan tightened his hold. How had he never realised what a pleasing figure Jasmine had beneath her gowns? The perfect curve of her hips allowed him to hold her tightly and lift her up into the box. He was more than a little disappointed to let her go, though he'd already held her longer than was entirely proper. He liked the feel of her in his hands. She stepped inside and sat on the flat bottom of the box. She did not meet his eyes as she took a moment to arrange her skirts. Nathan noticed the pink colouring her cheeks and neck. Had she noticed his hands had lingered? Nathan shook his head. What was going on with him? It was almost as if he were... Nathan stumbled as the thought continued through his mind. He reached out to steady himself on the elephant's side as he stepped up onto the Indian man's knee. Glancing up, he saw Jasmine smile down at him, and it struck him. He was in love with her. He settled in behind her as the man clucked his tongue and the elephants leant from side to side as they prepared to stand. He placed his hands at his side, not fully knowing what to do with them. Jasmine gave a startled intake of breath and Nathan moved closer to her, wrapping his arms around her waist and pulling her against his chest. Her breath hitched and his nerves tingled at the feel of her breath going in and out. Several more clicks and the elephant pushed to its feet. Nathan had no idea how the animals knew what to do, as all the clucks seemed to sound the same to him. What he did know was that he was distinctly aware of each shift and breath Jasmine made in his arms. The animal lumbered around the courtyard, causing the box to sway back and forth. Nathan tightened his hold, and she tensed. Was it because she was scared of the animal, or of him? He leant forward, whispering in her ear, If you are too frightened, I shall ask that we be let off. She shook her head. No, I am quite enjoying it, actually. As if to illustrate her point, she moved out of his arms and over to the side of the box, where she looked down at the ground beside them. Nathan was both happy and irritated. She seemed to be enjoying the experience, but must she move so far away from him to do it? Chapter 19 Justina looked at her reflection in the mirror as Ajit arranged her hair. Was this the same timid, shy girl who had left England more than six months ago? She grinned. No, it was not. The woman looking back at her had ridden atop an elephant, Lud, who would have believed such a thing? Her heart thudded loudly in her ears, as it did whenever she allowed her mind to remember that day with Nathan. Riding the elephant had been a thrill but it was far overshadowed by the memory of Nathan's hands on her hips or the closeness they had shared until it became too much for her to bear in the box. Her thoughts lingered on his whispered voice in her ear and the heat from his body when he had pulled her close to him. Just the memory of it brought heat to her cheeks. If she was not careful, she would be in need of her fan before she ever got to the musicale. She clenched her teeth. Why did she do this to herself? It was one of the reasons she refrained from thinking on that day. She knew they were only ever to be friends. Had he not reiterated that fact mere moments before they mounted the elephants? 
And yet she could not help but wonder, when she allowed it, what it would be like to be loved by Nathan. Justina sighed. Mem Sahib, you are not pleased with your hair. I shall start again. Oh, no, Ajit. Justina jerked around before her ayah could remove any pins. I am very pleased with what you have done. It is quite lovely. Her ayah frowned. Then why are you sad, Mem Sahib? Justina shook her head. I am not sad. I was simply thinking. I'm sorry if you took that to mean I was displeased with you. Are you certain you are well? Ajit watched Justina in the mirror. I should like to wear the deep purple silk gown, Ajit. Justina smiled, hoping her ayah would believe her and cease this line of conversation. The woman nodded and moved away to fetch the dress. Justina took the time without watchful eyes to take a deep breath and steady herself. Nathan would be attending the musicale tonight, and Justina needed to have her emotions under control before seeing him. Ajit returned with the dress, and Justina pushed away from the table. She moved over to where Ajit stood and allowed the woman to assist in removing her afternoon dress. A knock sounded at her door. One moment, please, Justina called. Ajit quickly pulled the new gown over Justina's head and fastened the few buttons up the back. You may enter now, Jasmine said to the closed door. Her aunt pushed in and stopped just inside. Oh, Justina, dearest, you look quite lovely in that gown. She walked around Justina, eyeing her with a critical gaze. But then your mother always has had an eye for fashion, has she not? Justina smiled. Her mother's eye for fashion had not always been a welcome talent. It had cost her father a fortune, and at times had driven Justina nearly to tears. Yes, you are right. Justina caught a glance of her reflection in the mirror, and decided on this occasion she was very grateful for her mother's gift. The gown was the colour of an eggplant, and it was the perfect colour for Justina, making her hair appear darker and richer. It even brought out the deeper flecks of brown in her eyes, making them appear, in Justina's opinion, more alluring. Would Nathan find them alluring? She closed her eyes, willing away the hope that he would. Her aunt placed a finger to her lips. But I do not think it is right for tonight's event. This is the gown you must wear to the Governor-General's ball. She moved to the wardrobe and pulled out a lighter lilac dress that they had purchased several days ago at Peterfeld's. It was not a gown Justina would have picked for herself, nor would her mother have approved. But Aunt Martin had been so overwhelmed with the beauty of the dress she had insisted they buy it. Justina had not the heart to tell her aunt no. She had tried on and even purchased enough lilac-coloured dresses in her life to know that the colour made her look dull and pale. It was too bad, because as a colour Justina loved lilac. It reminded her of bright spring days, just after a rainstorm, when the scents and colours of the lilac bushes were strongest. On her last season she had ignored her mother completely and bought several dresses merely because she liked the colours. Lilacs and yellows dominated the wardrobe, with several pale greens and peach gowns sprinkled in. Justina refused to believe the claims of her mother about the disservice such colours did to her appearance. Only the peach gown had been slightly flattering, until she had heard the whispered opinions of other ladies at the various balls. It had been a humiliating and humbling season, a season of failure her mother had been quick to blame on the ill-chosen wardrobe. Justina sighed, and Arjeet stared at her. Placing a wide, mostly false smile on her face, she clasped her hands in front of her. You are correct, aunt. This gown will be much better suited for the ball. She turned to Ajit. Would you mind too terribly much changing out the gowns? As you wish, Mem Sahib. Ajit took the dress from Justina's aunt and laid it on the bed next to them. She then slowly worked the buttons on the back of Justina's current gown. Ajit, we shall be late if you do not move faster. Aunt Martin turned to Justina. Shall I send for Charulata? She is very proficient and much quicker. Justina shook her head. No, aunt. I am very pleased with Ajit. She caught the ayah's gaze. The woman was waiting for Justina to change her mind and stay in the darker purple gown. I am sure Ajit is just ensuring the gown does not get snagged. I think it is very prudent of her to take her time on the buttons. She will be able to make up time in other areas. She gave her ayah what she hoped was a grateful stare. As you wish, Mem Sahib. Justina followed her aunt and uncle into Lord and Lady Sutherland's house, noting the similarities and differences between their own house and this one. It was increasingly obvious that those in trade lived a much grander life here in India than they did in London. It was no wonder so many of them stayed indefinitely. 
it was also no wonder that the nobility came and went almost as quickly as the boats in the harbour. It was, no doubt, difficult for them to see people of such low breeding living in such lavishness. The butler announced them to a rather crowded and noisy room. Most of the occupants either did not hear or did not care that Mr and Mrs Martin and Miss Tinsdale had arrived. Justina gave a slight shrug of her shoulder. It appeared there were still some things that were the same as in London. Justina looked around the room, not looking for Nathan per se. Just the same. When she spotted him across the room, her pulse quickened. He looked extraordinarily handsome. A pale blue waistcoat peeked out under his buttoned black tailcoat. Even from this distance, she could see his valet was very skilled at tying cravats. Not that Nathan's cravat had been lacking before his arrival in India, but tonight he looked especially fine. His eye caught hers, and he smiled. Saying something to the gentleman he conversed with, he stepped away from them and moved toward her. He reached her where she stood next to her aunt and dipped his head to her uncle. Mr Martin, Mrs Martin, how good it is to see you tonight. Her uncle clapped Nathan on the back and grinned. Yes, yes, well, I, I should prefer to be at home in my book room, but I promised Mrs Martin I would get out in society more often. He glanced around the room with a raised brow. And this seemed as good a place as any. You are looking well, my lord. Aunt Martin curtsied to Nathan. Very handsome indeed. Nathan grinned and bowed to her aunt. I could not look half as handsome as you, Mrs. Martin. The colour of your dress is most becoming. She placed a hand to her mouth and giggled. Giggled? Justina looked heavenward. Lud, this was a ridiculous scene. Nathan turned to her and she curtsied. My lord. He made a magnificent bow, glancing up at her from under his lashes. Miss Tinsdale, you look lovely this evening. She grinned and raised a brow as he finally straightened. She leant into him and lowered her voice. And now I know you are a liar as well, my lord, for I know this colour does nothing for my complexion. My mother has told me of this fact numerous times. Her aunt and uncle moved away to visit with other members of the Calcutta elite. And perhaps it is your mother telling a Banbury story, for I have not seen another your equal here tonight. He drew his brows together. Wait, as well as what, Miss Tinsdale? She felt her face colour up. I believe we both know what else you are, my lord. He tilted his head, his brows slowly arching. Please, tell me. I am not certain I know your meaning. Justina scowled at him. Charming, my lord. We both know you are charming. He grinned even wider. And I thought you were impervious to my charms, Jasmine. He extended his arm and led her over to a row of chairs. I'd thought to sit here, unless you would prefer some place else. Justina shook her head. I have no other preference. Undoubtedly, all her thoughts and feelings for him were written across her face. Miss Tinsdale! Justina froze, the voice causing a growl to sound from her lips. Nathan turned around and looked, leaning down close to Justina. It is a young lady I have not yet met. Do you know her? Did she detect a hint of interest in his voice? It was just as Justina feared. Miss Tinsdale, I thought it was you. I am so happy to see you again. Miss Kendall looked from Justina to Nathan and then back to Justina, an expectant look on her face. Good evening, Miss Kendall, Justina said, her voice devoid of all enthusiasm. They stood still, neither one speaking. Miss Tinsdale, I do not believe I have had the pleasure of making this young woman's acquaintance. Would you be so kind as to do the honour? Nathan nudged her. Justina bit the inside of her cheek. There had been interest in his voice. She could practically feel Nathan's gaze raking over the lady. It was going to be just as she had predicted. Lord Nathaniel Westlake? Justina waved her hand toward Nathan. Meet Miss Verity Kendall. She moved her hand to encompass Miss Kendall. Justina heard the dullness of her voice, unable to muster any sort of excitement for this introduction. Nathan bowed and pressed a kiss to Miss Kendall's hand. The pleasure is all mine, Miss Kendall. Would you like to join us for the musicale? Justina's hands fisted at her side. How dare the young woman intrude on her time with Nathan? Justina searched the crowd for her aunt and uncle. She could not possibly sit through the whole of the evening next to these two. She spotted her aunt and uncle already seated up several rows. But there were no more seats near them. Another growl sounded deep in Justina's throat. Nathan turned and looked at her. Are you well, Jas... Miss Tinsdale. 
He looked concerned, but not overly so. She was unable to answer, as Lady Sutherland stood and motioned the crowd to be seated. Nathan placed his hand on the small of her back and ushered Justina into the row of chairs. Her mood soured even more when he removed his hand from her back. He sat next to her, and she was gratified when he moved closer to her than he did Miss Kendall, who took up the aisle seat. He leant over to her. Is something amiss? Did I say something to upset you? Justina shook her head, but she sat ramrod straight in her seat, barely hearing the pieces as they were played. She did, however, notice the two times Nathan leant over to whisper in Miss Kendall's ear. After the Miss Parker's number, he leant toward her once more and whispered, Truly, Jasmine, are you well? I am becoming quite concerned. I am well, Nathan. It, it is simply stifling in here. I am eager for an intermission. It seemed to appease him for the moment. When at last the intermission came, Justina did not think she could last a moment longer. She needed to escape, to be out of Nathan and Miss Kendall's sight. Miss Tinsdale! Justina heard Nathan call after her, but she could not face him. She moved to the first set of doors leading out to the veranda, hurrying out in the increasing darkness. The air was oppressively hot, the moisture making her immediately damp and sticky. Justina moved to the shadows at the side, preferring the displeasure of the heat to the scene inside. People from the parlour filled the veranda, bringing with them the oppressive feel she had been trying to escape. She moved back inside, believing the withdrawing room could not possibly be as crowded, as it seemed every person in attendance had moved to the veranda. She was partially right. The withdrawing room was relatively empty, but the air felt even heavier in here than anywhere else. Perhaps it was the lack of ventilation or cascas, as the door to the room was kept shut to ensure privacy to those within. Justina was not in need of the facilities, but rather the privacy the room offered. Several screens had been set up, separating the room into half a dozen smaller sections. Justina went to the farthest partition at the back of the room, leaning against the wall and dropping her head back. The quiet of the room was a welcome reprieve. She closed her eyes and pushed everything from her mind. Vaguely she heard the door of the room open, but she paid it little mind until voices drifted back to her. Justina opened her eyes and straightened. One of the voices unmistakably belonged to Miss Kendall. To whom she spoke, Justina did not know. From her place at the rear of the room, she could not tell if they chose a partition or if they sat on the couches close to the entrance. Regardless, their voices carried throughout the room. I see you have made his acquaintance, the unknown lady spoke. Justina moved quietly away from the wall and leant closer to the screen. Of which gentleman was she referring? It is just as I planned. There was a smile obvious in Miss Kendall's tone. Justina wished she could reveal herself and slap it from the lady's face. Whomever this gentleman was, Justina doubted he deserved Miss Kendall's gammons. Miss Tinsdale was very informative on those traits Lord Nathaniel finds displeasing. I have eliminated all of them from my character. If I do not have a proposal before the rains come, then I shall be at a loss to know why. I do not understand why you should desire him as a husband. The man has a most dissolute reputation. The distaste was obvious in the other woman's voice, and Justina felt her hand fist at her side. He is worth three thousand a year and has a large estate in Cambridge. Miss Kendall sighed. A woman can put up with much for that kind of money. Justina's throat tightened. The woman was trying to trap him into marriage. The door closed, eliminating Justina from hearing any more of the conversation. She peeked out from behind the screen. Justina's stomach twisted. She should inform Nathan of the kind of woman Miss Kendall was so he might avoid an association with her. It was for his good. She had no other motive behind telling him but his happiness. Yes, it was for his happiness. She checked her hair in the mirror, hoping to give Miss Kendall enough time to move far away from the retiring room. Justina did not wish to run into her outside the door and have her realise her conversation had not been private. Poking her head out the door, she looked in each direction. Miss Kendall was nowhere in sight. She moved out into the corridor and ran a nervous hand down the front of her dress, feeling slightly like a spy. Walking with purpose, Justina moved back to the parlour, searching the room for Nathan. Her eyes narrowed when she saw him speaking with Miss Kendall. He glanced in her direction and turned toward her, but Miss Kendall put her hand on his arm and he stopped. Nathan threw her a sheepish glance before turning his attentions back to the young lady. Oh, dearest, there you are. Justina turned toward her aunt's voice. I have been looking everywhere for you. 
Aunt Martin held a hand up to her head. The ache in my head has become unbearable. As much as I am loath to leave early, I fear I cannot stay a moment longer. She thrust Justina's wrap into her arms. Your uncle has already called for the carriage. It is no doubt already waiting for us outside. Chapter 20 Nathan gripped the flowers tightly in his hand. His valet had assured him they were the most beautiful and fragrant that India had to offer. Nathan had insisted the man tell him the name of each flower in case Jasmine should ask when he gave them to her. The deep pink hibiscus was by far Nathan's favourite in the way of colour, but the musk roses had a more desirable scent. He moved them to his other hand as he walked down the length of Charingi Road toward Jasmine's house. She had left so suddenly the night before, he had not had a chance to speak with her after the intermission. When he had discovered her departure, he had been anxious as to her well-being. She had been increasingly quiet as the musicale had progressed. Nathan's only notion was that she had taken ill, but he had been relieved to discover that it was Mrs Martin who caused them to leave early. He grinned at the thought of seeing Jasmine and picked up his pace, wishing to get there as quickly as possible. He pulled out his watch to check the time. Half past seven. He was early for visits, but he could not wait any longer. He mounted the few steps that led to the front door of the Martins' townhouse and knocked on the door. Laraj Dutta was quick to open the door. Nathan bowed. I am desiring to see Miss Tinsdale. Is she at home? This way, Nathaniel Sahib. He led Nathan up several flights of stairs and into the nursery. She is with the children. You may wait for her here. Laraj Dutta disappeared, leaving Nathan alone in the room. Why was the nurse not seeing to the children? Nathan had understood that Jasmine was only required to teach them, not to take care of them. A humming drifted through the crack in the door on his right. Nathan set the flowers on the table and moved over. The room was darkened, but he could make out Jasmine in the rocking chair, with Matthew on her lap. She hummed a song, her fingers running through Matthew's hair. The boy's eyes were closed, but from the stuttered breathing, Nathan suspected he had been crying. When Matthew heaved an especially hard breath, Jasmine pressed a kiss to his hair. It was just a dream. I will protect you, Matthew. I won't let anything happen to you. The boy snuggled in closer to her, and she resumed her humming for a moment. As his jerky breath calmed, she once again took to combing through his hair with her fingers. My sweet Matthew... You will never break my heart with your careless actions and flirtatious ways, will you? She sighed, sending his hair fluttering about. If only I could find such a man. Nathan took a step back. While she had not said his name, the description spoke of him. She had not meant it to be an attack, but it felt as if it were precisely that. What had he been thinking in coming there? Had he actually thought to declare his love? The woman in that rocking chair was the best sort, a diamond of the first. With numbing clarity he realised the truth. He would never be good enough for Jasmine. With his history of damaged reputations, how could he ever think to aspire to one as flawless as she? He, a rake of the worst kind. How had he ever thought a future between them was possible? Several more steps backward, and he bumped into the table. His eyes darted to the door, but Jasmine did not appear immediately. Not wishing to be seen, for he had no notion what he would say to her now, Nathan strode quickly around the table and out of the nursery room door. He took the steps two at a time, and was at the front door before Lara's Dutta had a chance to open it for him. Nathaniel Sahib, you leaving so soon? Yes, yes. Nathan's words rushed out. There was still a chance Jasmine could appear before he had a chance to leave. Miss Tinsdale appears to be very busy with the children. I shall not bother her tonight. He dipped his head. Good evening, Laraj Dutta. Nathan did not slow his pace until he was several houses down the block. He looked back at the Martins' townhouse, and his chest squeezed. Leaning his back against the corner of a house, he dropped his elbows to his knees and cradled his head in his hands. What was he to do now? How was he to react when in Jasmine's presence... Perhaps it would be best if he quit spending time with her altogether. But that thought nearly brought him to his knees. He needed to see her almost as much as he needed air to breathe. He took in a deep breath. He must act as if everything was as it had always been. They would continue on as friends and he would have to be content with that. 
while he did not know how he was to perform such a feat, he knew it was his only choice. Nathan strolled down Chowringi Street, his stomach twisting tighter with every step he took toward Jasmine's house. It felt so similar to his trip last evening, and yet everything was different. He'd had little sleep, and his eyes burned behind his lids. But when he had completed his breakfast, he found he could not stop himself from making his morning visit. He trudged up the front walk to Claridge House, gathering his courage and wits about him before he faced her. Raising a hand, he knocked firmly. The butler opened the door and bowed to him. Good day, Nathaniel Sahib. Nathan dipped his head to the man. Good day, Laraj Dutta. Is Miss Tinsdale at home? The man nodded his head and led him down a corridor to the morning room. The door was open wide, and Nathan could see Mrs Martin sitting on a settee directly under the punker, working on a stitchery. Jasmine was sitting on a high-armed bench, her favourite spot by the back window. It was where the light was good, but it was not in direct sunlight. Her legs were pulled up, supporting something in her lap. She stared intently at whatever she had perched there, the tip of her tongue sticking out of the corner of her lips. Laraj Dutter opened his mouth to announce Nathan, but Nathan put a hand out to stop him. He shook his head and put a finger to his lips. A jumpy, erratic pulse thrummed through him. He wished to watch her a moment longer, before he had to put on his mask, his show of mere friendship. Watching her in her element, he felt a sense of home, of utter happiness. He sighed. It was a sense that was not to be his. Jasmine tipped her head to the side, examining whatever was in her lap. He suspected she was drawing. Nathan smiled as a tingle ran from the tips of his finger through his entire hand. He flexed several times. It was in these quiet moments of observation that Nathan wondered at his first judgment of her. Jasmine was actually quite handsome, especially when caught in the light of the window. He could not account for his earlier assessment of her. It felt like a lifetime ago, by an entirely different man. He tugged at his waistcoat, his body shaking with shame. She deserved someone who recognised her beauty and worth from the moment he laid eyes on her. He cleared his throat and she gave a startled jump, her head whipping around to see him. Mrs Martin gave a small gasp somewhere off to the side, but Nathan only wished to see Jasmine. Lara's Dutta let out an exasperated sigh. Nathan chuckled and shot the man an apologetic smile. Oh, Lord Nathaniel, I did not hear Lara's Dutta announce you. Jasmine shut the cover on her book with a snap and set it to the side of the bench. Wiping her fingers on a nearby rag, she tossed it onto the book and stood. You did not hear it because I did not allow him to announce me. He continued to grin at Jasmine because he was not sure what else to do with his face. Smiling seemed like the best course. I was too enthralled with watching you to allow him to interrupt. Did he sound serious? Or had he put enough jest in his voice to not alert her to his feelings? Surely... They were evident in his gaze. If you are angry, please be so with me and not Lara's Dutta. Jasmine smiled at the servant and then turned her gaze on Nathan. Oh, I could never be unhappy with Lara's Dutta. He is a dear. But you, she raised a pert brow, you I do not find so difficult to imagine stirring up my anger. Nathan placed a hand to his heart. You wound me, Jasmine. She cleared her throat and glanced over to the settee, where her aunt sat with her stitchery settled in her lap, her eyes riveted on Nathan and Jasmine. Good day, Mrs Martin. And how are you this fine day? I hope you are recovered from the headache that forced you from the Sutherland's musicale prematurely. Nathan forced his eyes to remain on the older woman, even though he wanted nothing more than to look on Jasmine some more. I am sufficiently recovered, my lord. Thank you for inquiring. She shifted her gaze between the two of them one last time. I do not understand why you feel the need to be so formal around me, Justina. I have known for some time that you have long since quit the use of formality when in each other's company. She cast her eyes heavenward as she stood. I have menus to discuss with the housekeeper. She cast Justina a knowing look before quitting the room. Nathan did not fail to notice that Mrs Martin had left the door open behind her. Jasmine motioned toward the settee. Would you care to sit down, Nathan? There was a strain in her voice. Was she well? Perhaps she was simply tired. I waited for your return after intermission at the Sutherlands the other night. I hope you were not unwell also. 
His brow furrowed. He had heard Mrs. Martin was the cause of their departure, but now that he looked at Jasmine, she did look a little pale. He took several steps toward her, bringing her within reach. He studied her, looking for any indication she was ill. Jasmine put a hand on his arm. I am well. It was my aunt who was suffering from a headache. He let out a slow breath. I am glad for it. She pulled away, clasping her hands together in front of her. And you have been well since. She smiled. Yes, very. He moved over to the bench by the window. Were you drawing when I came in? Yes, I was. She smirked. After discovering the fourth knot in my thread, I cast my stitchery aside and took up my drawing. He let out a chuckle, the tension in his body easing. She was so easy to be with. I can imagine your ire. He looked at the book on the bench. Drawing does seem to calm you. She nodded. May I see what you are drawing? He turned his head back to her. Will you show it to me? She swallowed, a sudden look of nervousness darkening her features. I am certain you have better things to do than critique my artwork, Nathan. Her fingers twisted to the point of being white. But I do not. He leant forward, reaching for the book. Like a shot, Jasmine snatched the book before he had a chance to reach it. The crayons fell to the floor with a crash. Jasmine grimaced, thunder and turf. I'm certain that broke several of the crayons. Nathan raised a brow at her exclamation. Was procuring the book before me truly worth the damage to your crayons? What are you hiding, Jasmine? He kept his tone light and teasing. I am hiding nothing, my lord, she snapped, a little too quickly. She took in a deep breath and bit her lower lip. Very well, if it is so important to you. She motioned him back over to the sofa. Once they were both settled, she opened the book to the first page. The lighting was not as ideal on this side of the room, but Nathan did not mention it. She might very well deny this peek at her art if he did. The first was the horizon she had drawn that first day after they left the Cape. He touched the page. So much had changed since that day. You have seen the first few pages. She flipped past the other pictures he had sketched on the ship, stopping on a picture Nathan had not seen before. The view of the river and the groves of trees from the back of the house was intricately drawn. Nathan was amazed at the depth she was able to achieve with only the four colours in her pack of crayons. That is the view I mentioned to you several weeks ago, is it not? She nodded, and as I said, it would be much better in watercolours, but I have not found any for sale yet. She needed watercolours, of that he was certain. If she could accomplish this much with minimal colour, Nathan could only imagine what she could do with the entire rainbow. He reached forward and turned the page. She cringed slightly. An elephant, with colourful flowers and swirls, filled the page. Why should she not want him to see this? These are not watercolours. How did you achieve the colour? He went to run his finger over it, but she pulled his hand back. He basked in her brief touch. It is done with chalk, but it is not stable. If you run your fingers over it, you could still smudge it. He glanced at the package of crayons in her hand. Then this is not what you are working on. She closed the book. I do not remember which picture I was working on when you happened upon me, Nathan. She moved the book to her side, the side opposite of Nathan. Then, as if to prohibit any sudden stealing, she moved her body so as to block the book completely. What have you been up to these past days, my lord? Nathan narrowed his eyes at her, but she only pursed her lips into a tight line. I met with a man the other day, a Mr. Wixom. He leant back against the wall and folded his arms across his chest. He has a business venture he wished to discuss with me. Oh? What type of business? Her eyes brightened, and she relaxed against the wall as well. He needs investors for a shipping business he is starting. He has the contacts and the goods already in place, but needs the money to purchase a ship. And do you have such money? Nathan shrugged. I cannot fund the entirety of it, but I could contribute a substantial amount. It would make me a partner in the business. Jasmine sat up and leant toward him. Are you going to do it? It sounds risky, but... She looked around the room. As I well know, shipping can be a very successful venture. Nathan sighed. He had never considered speaking business with the fairer sex, had never known one of them with sound enough thinking to even consider asking their opinions. But Jasmine had a very logical brain in her head. Perhaps she could be an asset in helping him make the decision. 
I told him I wished to think on it a few days. I will give him my answer tomorrow. What have you decided? He puckered out his lips and dropped his head to the side. In truth, he had not decided anything yet. What do you think I should do? Her mouth ticked up at the corner. Was she pleased he had asked her opinion? Is his plan well thought out? Nathan nodded. I believe it is. But I confess I have never looked into shipping as a means of earning money before, so I am not certain I am a good judge. She sat back against the wall and pulled her bottom lip in between her teeth. The action nearly made Nathan forget what they were talking about, so focused he was on it. Perhaps you should speak with my uncle. He would surely have an idea of whether or not it is a sound investment. Nathan nodded. That seems the most prudent plan. I shall make arrangements immediately. Grudgingly, he stood to leave. Thank you for coming, Nathan. She stood up next to him, her voice uncertain. She looked at the floor, and thank you for the flowers. They are lovely. Nathan swallowed. He had forgotten about the flowers. Why did you not stay and visit, or even make yourself known? Matthew needed you. You did not need my presence there. She dipped her head. She wished to say something, but she held back. Yes, well, thank you all the same for the flowers. You're welcome. He lifted his hand to touch her cheek, but realised his folly and dropped it to his side. She opened her mouth, but closed it just as quickly. Instead, she seemed to settle on a smile. I think my uncle is in his bookroom. If you would care to speak with him today, I can see if he is available. With a nod of his head, their time together was finished. Chapter 21 The door to the carriage opened, and Nathan stepped out, waiting on the walkway for Justina. She allowed him to hand her down, and then placed her hand on his arm. He leant in, I do not believe it would raise too many brows if you actually held on to my arm, Jasmine. The ground looks to be uneven in places. What if you should trip? She looked up at him. He had been acting odd these past few days. In truth, something had changed that day they rode the elephants. But since the Sutherland's musicale, he had been different indeed. At times he was as attentive as he always had been, but at other times it was as if he was far away. And now he was suggesting she hold on to his arm. Not just place it there, as so many in society did, but actually grip it. It felt so personal and intimate. It left her feeling confused and on edge. She held on to the crook of his elbow lightly, and they walked toward the esplanade. It was crowded with people, but the far north end of the Maidan was open and green. She could just make out Miss Parker's servants up ahead, spreading out rugs and benches. They walked down the course toward the grassy area. Several cows meandered past her, stopping to graze on some of the longer patches of grass. She laughed at the sight. Nathan turned to her, a question in his look. She inclined her head toward the nearest cows. Can you even imagine such a sight in Hyde Park? Nathan chuckled. It is a sight I have not yet grown accustomed to. They reached the area of the picnic, where a handful of people had gathered. Miss Parker came over. Oh, Miss Tinsdale, I am so happy you have come. And you, Lord Nathaniel. Thank you for having us. Justina pulled her hand from his arm, not wanting to give the wrong impression. It would not be fair to Nathan for people to assume they were connected. Miss Parker motioned to two gentlemen in regimentals standing to the side. Have you met Lieutenant Markham and Lieutenant Barrett? The two men came over and doffed their shako hats as they bowed to her. Miss Tinsdale, it is indeed... A pleasure. Justina was not sure which of the men spoke, as she was not sure which was which. But she smiled and dipped her head as she gave a curtsy. The pleasure is all mine, gentlemen. Miss Parker put her hand through the arm of the man who had spoken. Lieutenant Barrett has been in India for nearly a year. Justina looked at Lieutenant Markham. And what have you, Lieutenant? How long have you been here? The soldier smiled as he placed his tall, bucket-looking hat back on his head. I have been here for nearly six months, miss. Miss Parker led Lieutenant Barrett off to greet other guests, leaving Justina and Nathan to speak with Lieutenant Markham. And how do you like this assignment? She tried to be pleasant and congenial, but she was so aware of Nathan and his every movement, it was difficult to keep her mind on the conversation. The lieutenant looked around him, and then at her. At present, 
I like it very much. His face coloured, and Justina felt her own warm. She darted a glance at Nathan to see if he had noticed. From his downturned lips she thought he might have, but why should he be angry at the lieutenant for flirting with her? Nathan cleared his throat, and Justina jerked. Oh, <laughs> Lieutenant Markham, may I introduce my dear friend, Lord Nathaniel Westlake? The two men bowed to each other, but Justina could see them assessing one another, tension humming between them. Justina coughed, drawing the gentleman's attention to her instead of each other. I find I am much in agreement with you, Lieutenant. I have been here for nearly three months and I still find things to amaze and delight me. Miss Tinsdale! Justina felt her stomach roil as she heard Miss Kendall's nasally whiny voice. Why had she not noticed those attributes before? I was hoping you would be attending this little party. Justina flicked her gaze to see if Nathan had turned to watch the lady approach. He glanced over to Miss Kendall, but then his gaze returned to the lieutenant. The lady's hand lay upon the arm of Mr Keats, the gentleman whom Miss Kendall had spoken so harshly of on their first meeting. Lord Nathaniel, I did not realise you would be in attendance. The sugary, sweet tone dripped from Miss Kendall's lips like treacle as she took several steps away from Mr Keats. Miss Kendall. Nathan bowed toward the newcomer and placed a hand on Justina's back. Was he staking his claim in front of these gentlemen? Justina felt her face heat. If only it were so. But when he gave her a slight nudge with his hand, she realised he was just trying to get her to respond to Miss Kendall. Good day, Miss Kendall. Justina greeted through clenched teeth as Nathan's hand fell away. Miss Kendall waved a hand at the gentleman. Miss Tinsdale, may I present Mr Keats? Her voice held a bored tone. She did not bother to introduce the rest of the party. Justina curtsied, as her mother had taught her to do. We are already acquainted. It is a pleasure to see you again, Mr Keats. He reached for her hand and brought her fingers to his mouth, leaving a wet spot upon her glove. Justina knew little of the man, except for the information she had gleaned from the single set they had danced, but she thought to at least try to like him, in spite of his obvious preference for Miss Kendall. So far, she found little to recommend him. Lieutenant Markham cleared his throat, and Justina willingly turned her attention back to him. Miss Pendleton strode forward. Justina had been introduced to her a time or two, but she did not know the girl well. From the narrowed look and sneer she turned upon Nathan, it was obvious she was aware of him. Ah, Lord Nathaniel, how are you enjoying your time in India? Nathan leant back, a slight edge in his voice. I am quite enjoying myself, thank you. She snickered. As am I. I was told India was the place to come if one needed a new start. What is your opinion, my lord? Have you been given a fresh start? Justina raised her brows. This was the woman who had been speaking in the retiring room with Miss Kendall at the musicale. Nathan took a step back and placed his hand on Justina's arm. She did not know if it was for his benefit or hers. Indeed. When one chooses to travel, I do not believe they ever come away without being changed by the things they have seen and felt. Justina grinned. Nathan had hardly chosen his destination, or even that he was to travel in the first place. I believe people think they have changed when they experience new things, but eventually everyone returns to being who they were before. Do you not agree, Miss Tinsdale? The smile fell away from Justina's face, and she glanced between Nathan and Miss Pendleton. Did they know each other better than Justina realised? Miss Pendleton spoke almost as one with a history with Lord Nathaniel. The thought sickened her. Justina took a step away from Nathan, unable to stand his touch. It seemed she could not get away from his past, no matter how hard she pushed it from her mind. Would she ever see beyond his past transgressions? A part of her hoped she would not for clinging to his faults was the only way she was able to ease the pain of knowing he would never care for her as more than a friend. I believe a person can change, if they truly desire it, but it has more to do with the heart than with their surroundings. She flicked a glance at Nathan. He stared at the ground, his jaw working. The new surroundings only help to test the person's resolve, not change the person. Miss Pendleton looked at Justina pityingly, as if she knew Justina's heart. I think you too naive, Miss Tinsdale. She then glared at Nathan. 
My cousin, Lady Elizabeth, believed a person could change. But all she discovered is that a rake will always be a rake. She turned and moved to the far side of the group, leaving discomfiture in her wake. Justina could not see Nathan's face, but if his neck and ears were any indication, his face was crimson. Miss Parker cleared her throat, glancing nervously about the crowd of people. The food is ready, but as there are already bugs crawling about the rugs, I think perhaps it best if we keep ourselves to the benches. It will be a tight fit, as I was not planning on everyone having to use them. Her lips turned down in a pout, before puffing out in a little grunt. I never had such a thing happen in Kensington Park. Justina wanted to go to Nathan, to ensure he was well, but she feared the attention from it was something neither of them desired. She patted Miss Parker on the arm. Perhaps we could eat in shifts. I am sure there are those who would do just as well to take a stroll before they eat their afternoon meal. I suppose that could work. She looked around the crowd and numbered people off. Justina was numbered with ones. She watched closely to see that Miss Kendall was a two. That was one bright spot of the day. Lieutenant Markham was numbered a one, as was Mr Keats. But she let out a small gasp when Miss Parker numbered Nathan a two. Nathan and Miss Kendall would be walking and then eating together. Unless Miss Pendleton's accusations had dissuaded Miss Kendall. But Justina had her doubts. If you are a number one, you will remain here and eat, using the benches so as not to be forced to eat with the crawly creatures. If you are a number two, you will take a turn first and then return to eat. Are there any objections? Miss Parker turned in a circle, watching all of her guests. A murmur of agreement sounded as people paired off for the walk. Justina stepped closer to Nathan and leant in. Are you well? He cleared his throat, but did not meet her eyes. Of course. Why would I not be? When he glanced at her, she saw the lie in his eyes. Perhaps I could speak with Miss Parker and have you changed to a one. Miss Kendall bounced over to him, wrapping her hand around Nathan's arm. Justina had suspected Miss Pendleton's attack would not save Nathan from Miss Kendall, but still Justina scowled at the young lady. Miss Kendall was all smiles and giggles. Had not the lady said she had made an effort to remove the undesirable traits from her character? Nathan looked down at the young lady's hand and then at Justina. There is no need to make a fuss. He scowled at Lieutenant Markham. Besides, it looks as if you have a gentleman of upstanding character, no doubt, to provide you with conversation. Pain stabbed through Justina's heart. But what could she do? It looks as if we were both provided with a partner. To think she had been anticipating this outing. Nathan led Miss Kendall away from the group, and Justina glared at their backs. Lieutenant Markham brought Justina a plate. How are you acquainted with Lord Nathaniel? She pulled her eyes to the lieutenant, just now realising that she was staring at Nathan and Miss Kendall's retreating forms. She dropped her eyes, her face hot. She did not know if the embarrassment at being caught or of being so rude was strongest. She timidly raised her eyes. I am sorry. Yes, Nath Lord Nathaniel and I are dear friends. The lieutenant nodded. Only friends? Her face heated even more. Yes, it is quite certain that is all it will ever be. His shoulders dropped slightly. I understand. But his voice said he did not understand at all. They both ate in silence, and Justina forced herself not to look in Nathan's direction. It took every drop of willpower she had. The lieutenant put his plate to the side. It looks as though it is time for us to take a turn. He held out a hand to help her up from the bench. For a brief moment, Justina wished the lieutenant was Nathan. Stop it, she growled to herself. He is a respectable man and he wishes to spend time with you. Stop pining for Nathan. She smiled up at him and grasped his hand. Thank you, lieutenant. Nathan and Miss Kendall were just emerging around a corner of Fort William. Justina watched them from beneath her lashes. The lieutenant cleared his throat, and Justina startled. He extended his arm to her, but his earlier smile had disappeared. The food in her stomach soured as it rolled about. She was with the lieutenant, and he deserved her full attention. She needed to remove Nathan from her thoughts. They walked for several rods in silence before the lieutenant turned his head toward her. You said you have been in India for three months. Yes. 
She could hardly believe it had been that long, although at times it felt like forever since she had last seen her mother and father. And how do you like Calcutta? Is it to your liking? He looked straight ahead. Oh, I like it very much. There are many things that are so very different from home that have taken some time to acclimate, but even still, I find nearly everything fascinating. She glanced over at him, seeing only half of his face from behind her bonnet. I have even ridden an elephant. No one in Latham would ever believe such a thing. Lieutenant Markham laughed. It was very pleasant, even if it did not melt over her like Nathan's did. I believe you are still having some difficulty believing it yourself. She grinned. You may be right. It was all so unbelievable. At times I think I may have imagined it. She did not elaborate that Nathan holding her had been the most exciting part. They turned at a jut in the walkway, and Justina caught sight of Nathan and Miss Kendall sitting down to eat. Nathan held the lady's plate while she arranged her skirts on the bench. Justina's footsteps slowed. Miss Tinsdale, are you spent? Shall we find some place to sit down? The lieutenant stopped at her side, his face drawn. No, I, I just thought I saw someone I know, but I believe I was mistaken. She began walking again, promising herself she would not look in Nathan's direction again. Where were you stationed before Calcutta, lieutenant? In the West Indies, he grinned. It seems I traded one India for the other. She smiled. What do you miss most about the West Indies? The squawk of a bird off in the distance drew Justina's attention and she looked back over towards the picnic, but she did not see where the noise came from. The lieutenant sighed. How did you make the acquaintance of Lord Nathaniel? Oh, lud. We attended several events together in England. She paused. Should she expand on that information? It was not a great secret that they had become friends on the voyage here. Many people knew of that fact. But it was on our voyage here that we truly became friends. A clap of thunder sounded, and without warning, rain began to fall with a fierceness Justina had never before seen. She tried to shield her face, but the rain came down at an angle and with such a force that it stung her skin. The Maidan became a disarray of people and animals, each trying to find a place to hide. Women shrieked and men cursed as everyone ran for shelter. The lieutenant grabbed Justina's hand and ran toward Charingi Street. Come, my carriage is up ahead. I will see you home, he hollered back to her. But... She looked back to see where Nathan was, but he was not to be seen in the blur of people. The lieutenant pulled her along, but not so fast as to make her lose her footing. When they reached the carriage, he jerked the door open and handed her inside. She sat on the bench, water dripping from her bonnet and her wrap. Thank you, lieutenant. She looked around the carriage. Are you not coming along? He shook his head. I am well suited to such weather. I shall see if I can offer my assistance to Miss Parker. He dipped his head. It was a pleasure, Miss Tinsdale. Justina smiled at him, liking him even more for his blatant lie. The pleasure, Lieutenant, was all mine. I do hope our paths will cross again. He closed the door and rapped on the side of the carriage. Slowly it began to move. Justina sat back, leaning her head against the bench. The Lieutenant was a perfectly wonderful man from all she had seen of him, and yet... All she could wonder was if Nathan had found cover from the rain, and with whom. Chapter 22 Nathan stepped inside the entry of Claridge House. He had come to a decision. He would never be a man worthy of Jasmine's affections, but he could prove to her that he was a changed man. A large bouquet of flowers sat on the table opposite the staircase, Nathan stared at them. Had the lieutenant from the picnic yesterday sent them to Jasmine? Did he have intentions toward her? His fist clenched at his side. He had never had to share Jasmine before, and he didn't like it. A sense of protectiveness settled over him, but he willed it aside. It was not his place to feel such things for her. If he was quick in his stop at the Martins, he could speak to Jasmine before he continued on to Miss Kendall's house, for she was the next step in his plan. Lara's daughter returned to the entryway. I am sorry, Nathaniel Sahib, but Justina Memsahib is unwell. She is not accepting visitors today. Nathan's pulse raced. She was ill. What was wrong? Was she in danger? The questions came faster than his brain could process them. She is unwell. 
What is her ailment? His pulse quickened. Mrs. Martin passed on the upper floor landing. She glanced down and her eyes lightened. Ah, oh, Lord Nathaniel, how are you today? He smiled, but it was simply out of formality. Why was the woman making such trivial conversation when Jasmine was ill? I am well, Mrs. Martin, but I understand that Miss Tinsdale is not. She nodded, her face drawn slightly. Yes, she came home from the picnic soaked to the skin. She started with a cough early this morning. She clasped her hands together as she descended the stairs. The woman acted as if it was nothing of concern, but Nathan could not feel the same until he saw Jasmine for himself. The air felt thin. Please, may I see her? Mrs. Martin started to shake her head, but then seemed to relent. I will see if she is able to come down to the parlour, my lord. He made his way down the corridor, this house feeling more like home than his own did. Pushing into the parlour, he sat on Jasmine's bench near the window. When she did not come down immediately, he stood and began to pace the room. He felt the shift in the air more than he heard the door open behind him. Nathan turned and nearly had to sit down at the sight of her. She was dressed, and though her face was drawn and slightly pale, she looked to be well. More than well, if he were being truthful. She looked beautiful in her cream-coloured gown. For a moment, Nathan questioned the prudence of his plan. She sat on the bench and looked up at him. I am sorry to have left you yesterday. I hope you were able to find shelter or get to your carriage. The Nathan put a hand up. You need not explain. I am relieved you are well, although I am concerned you have developed a cough. It is nothing to be concerned about. She gave a half grin. If Aunt Martin is not concerned, then I am sure it is nothing to worry about. She worries after me excessively. I am pleased to see you are not ill. Nathan twisted his beaver around in his hands. I had hoped to discuss something with you. Oh? Her face brightened. Did you make a decision on the business venture? He squinted at her a moment. Oh, yes. I went over the information with your uncle, and he believes it a good investment. I met with Mr. Wixom yesterday. She smiled. Oh, Nathan, that is delightful news. Y yes, he stammered. Now that he was here, with her, the reason for his visit did not seem prudent. But he had thought it through and believed it to be the best course of action. He swallowed and looked at his hat. I have made another decision, and I wished to get your thoughts on it. She smiled encouragingly. What is it? I shall help you if I am able. Nathan rubbed his hand along the back of his neck. I have decided to ask Miss Kendall to court. Jasmine's face blanched of what little colour she had, and she seemed unable to look at him. I did not know you had a tendre for the lady. Nathan shrugged. I do not love her, if that is what you are implying. It is more a marriage of convenience. She has a sizable dowry, and I wish to be married. She sputtered. You wish to be married? When did this desire seize you? Nathan knocked his hat against his empty hand. Did you not tell me I should marry and make myself respectable? I believed you would be happy about my decision. She closed her eyes and took in a deep breath. But must it be her? She has been pursuing you only in the hopes of marrying you for your money and your estate. He stared at her with wide eyes. Is that not why I am marrying her? For her dowry and respectable name, it is a good match for us both. Her lips trembled even as she smiled at him. I only wish you to be happy, Nathan. If Miss Kendall can provide that for you, then I shall say no more. How could she be happy for him when she looked so utterly sad? The bottoms of her lids were filled with tears, and her lips continued to twitch. Did Jasmine despise Miss Kendall so completely? Jasmine stood. Does this mean you are to return to England? Nathan raised one shoulder and then dropped it. I do not know my plans at present. I have not yet approached Miss Kendall with the offer. She folded her arms across her middle. I hope you will inform me of things as they progress. Of course, you are... Yes, I know. I am your friend. Nathan glanced at the clock on the mantel. If I am to see Miss Kendall today, I should be on my way. He took several steps toward her. They were within an arm's length of each other. He wanted to reach out, to tell her he was hers if she wanted him. But he knew it could not be. Not with the past he carried. 
Nathan moved quickly down the corridor and toward the door. As Laraj Dutta opened it wide, Nathan nearly leapt out onto the landing. He sucked in a deep breath, but it still did not seem to fill his lungs to capacity. He leant against the railing, this time filling his lungs and bringing his heart to a more regular beat. Why, if he was making the correct decision, did he feel so empty inside? Pushing himself up, he moved down the stairs. He stopped at a flower cart and continued toward Miss Kendall's home. His mood was less enthusiastic than it had been before stopping at Jasmine's, but this was to be it, the beginning of his future. Nathan fisted the flowers in his hand as he stopped in front of a yellow townhome, located just off the fashionable Chowringi Street. It boasted accents of creamy white along the railings of the upper balconies. Nathan believed this house may have been one of the original grand houses of Calcutta, before fashionable had changed its address. He should have felt nervous, but he was not. After all, this visit was only a simple call on the lady who would not be making any offers yet. Nathan waited for the butler to answer the door, and then again after he was led into a parlour. He stood just inside the threshold and looked around the room. It was not shabby, but neither was it grand. A door shut down the corridor, and Nathan turned just in time to see Mr Keats stride past the parlour. His mouth was turned down, and his shoulders slumped. Nathan poked his head out of the door and caught sight of Miss Kendall and her mother. Miss Kendall's eyes widened slightly, and her mouth dropped open. But as quickly as the expression had appeared, it was replaced by a smile. Nathan felt nothing. There was no excitement, but neither was there distaste. Should there not be some emotion toward the lady he intended to marry? Nathan shook his head as the women entered the parlour. Lord Nathaniel! Miss Kendall clapped her hands. Nathan could not say that her eyes lit at the sight of him, but she did seem pleased. Mrs Kendall grasped Nathan by the arm and led him toward the sofa. What a lovely surprise! Nathan looked back over his shoulder to see Miss Kendall following along behind. She sat in the chair opposite him and smiled sweetly, her mother taking the seat next to her. Miss Kendall was beautiful, there was no denying that, but she did not have the same beauty as Jasmine. Miss Kendall glanced at the clock. I confess, I was hoping to see you today. I wish to ensure that you suffered no ill effects from the rain yesterday. I know Jas... Miss Tinsdale has come down with a cough. Miss Kendall raised a brow. You have already been to see Miss Tinsdale? Nathan swallowed. She is a close friend. We do not hold to at-home hours with each other. When the words were out of his mouth, he realised how they might sound to another lady. But he could not take them back now. Miss Kendall narrowed her eyes slightly. I suppose we can forgive him this one time, can we not, Mamma? Her mother put her sewing to the side. Yes, I suppose we can. She smiled up at him, and he saw where Miss Kendall's beauty had derived. The daughter was a perfect image of her mother. I had hoped, Miss Kendall, that you might consent to take a turn about the esplanade with me tomorrow. Miss Kendall clasped her hands in front of her. Oh, I should be delighted, my lord. He nodded. This was good news indeed. He should be delighted his plan was on track. Shall I pick you up at ten in the morning? I believe we shall find some shade in the esplanade at that time of the day. She tipped her head to the side, looking at him with wide eyes. I shall be counting the hours, my lord. Nathan smiled, but it felt forced. He looked at his hands, suddenly remembering the flowers there. He stood and awkwardly thrust them across the table at her. She let out a squeal of delight. Oh, my lord, they are lovely. She sniffed at the bouquet and a smile slid across her face. She walked over and handed the flowers to the punkawala. He shook his head and held them back to her. No, Mam Sahib. Her eyes widened and her nose flared slightly. I beg your pardon. I do not know. Nathan stood and moved over to take them from her. He looked around the room and noticed a maid in the corner. He handed her the bouquet and she bowed before leaving the room. It is not his job, Miss Kendall. He smiled. I know their ways are difficult to understand and become accustomed to, but you will learn in time. Miss Kendall's eyes flashed, but the look was gone almost as fast as it had come. Instead, a tight smile curled her lips. We hope not to be here long enough to learn their ways. Nathan flinched slightly at the unkindness, not so much in the words, but in the tone of voice. 
You are not to be in India for long, then. She shook her head. My father had thought to live here while he established his shipping company, but since arriving, Mamma and I have discovered that is not an acceptable plan. We are to depart for England as soon as my father has purchased the cargo for his first trip back. Nathan did not know what to think. Did this change his plans? Not entirely. He had supposed they would return to England once they were wed, but he did not need to tell her of these plans now. I will be disappointed to see you leave. Are you to stay, then? Is there nothing that could entice you back to England? She fluttered her lashes at him. Nothing at all, my lord. He took a step toward her. My plans are not yet firm. If something came along that required my presence in England, then perhaps I could make the arrangements. She sighed. Then perhaps we need to find something to require your presence. She placed a finger on her lips, but he kept his eyes on hers. Would Jasmine be proud of him? Of the changes he had made? Would it matter in the end? Yes, it would. Even if he could never have her, knowing he had her good opinion would be enough. I do not know, Mamma. Do you think we shall be able to find something of such import as to require Lord Nathaniel to return to Cambridge? Miss Kendall added a silkiness to her voice. Her mother nodded. I'm sure if we think hard enough, we shall come up with something. Chapter 23 Justina heard the door open to her chambers. She opened her eyes and saw Ajit enter the room, a bouquet of flowers in an earthen pot in her hands. She set the flowers on the table next to Justina's bed. Justina pushed herself up, laying back against the headboard. Good morning, Ajit. Her ayah turned and smiled at her. Justina, Mem Sahib, you are awake. Justina coughed and her chest burnt. Yes, I am. Her brow crinkled. Have I been sleeping long? Ajit nodded. It has been three days since you took to your sickbed. Justina's mouth dropped open. Three days? She coughed again. I had no idea. She remembered speaking with Nathan about his dratted plan to marry Miss Kendall, but she could not remember much after that. Her eye straightened the coverlet on the bed. It was lucky your fever broke yesterday, or I fear the Dr. Sahib would have bled you. A shudder ran through Justina at the thought of slimy black leeches sucking at her blood. Yes, very fortunate indeed. Nathaniel Sahib has come every day to check on you. Ajit stepped over and adjusted the flowers. Some days even twice. Others have checked in also. Miss Parker has been very concerned about your health. Justina snuggled down into the covers, even though the heat of the day was already creating a stuffiness in the room. She glanced over to the flowers, and her stomach fluttered. If he cared enough to check on her so frequently, perhaps he had changed his mind about Miss Kendall. The tightness in her chest eased at the thought. Justina sat at the table for the first time in nearly a week. The consumer brought her tea and a plate with bread and butter. She smiled up and thanked him. Danyavad, sire. Her voice was still weak, but her cough had lessened. He put his hands together and bowed to her, stepping back behind her chair to wait for her next request. Her aunt bustled into the room. Here you are, dearest. A servant helped her sit while her consumer readied her tea. Her aunt only nodded, still unable to pronounce her consumer's name correctly. Good morning, aunt. I hope you slept well. Justina took a sip from her cup. I did at last. Knowing you are recovered has made sleep easier to come for me. She put her hand to her chest. I do not know what I would have told your dear mother. She spooned a boiled egg onto her plate. The children have been asking for you, but I did not think it wise to bring them in to see you yet. But perhaps today? Justina grinned. She had missed the children. I am well now, so you no longer need to worry about such things. Her aunt chewed her toast and swallowed, opening her mouth almost immediately after the bread was in her throat. And your timing could not be better, dearest. The Governor-General's ball is tonight, and now that you are well, you may attend it with your uncle and me. Justina nearly groaned. There were several reasons she did not wish to attend the ball, not the least of which was that she had only just left her room this morning. She was still fatigued and had already had two coughing fits. She was improving, but she was not ready to attend a ball. Although, it was nearly certain that Nathan would be in attendance, and that may just make it worth the effort. 
He had come to visit every day since she had awakened, but her aunt had not allowed him to come to her room, so she had yet to see or talk to him. She did not yet know if he had followed through on his plans with Miss Kendall. Miss Kendall? What if he were there with her? That thought made Justina's stomach drop to the floor. Perhaps it was best if she did miss the ball. Aunt, I am not certain I am ready for such exertions yet. The doctor only pronounced me recovered yesterday. She cleared her throat of the tickle that seemed to develop at even the thought of her cough. But he declared you fully recovered. Surely you are well enough to attend. Her aunt dabbed at her mouth with a serviette. It is the Governor-General's ball, Justina. It is the ball we have been anticipating almost since our first days here. The ball you have been anticipating, Justina wanted to retort. Your mother did not purchase you such lovely gowns just so you could stay at home for the most important event of the year. Her aunt infused a hint of a pout into her words. Justina rubbed her fingers back and forth across her forehead. I will agree to go, as long as you promise to quit the party should I begin to feel ill. Her aunt smiled, knowing she had won this battle. Of course, dearest. I should never force you to stay at a party if you are unwell. Looking at her aunt as she slathered her toast with preserves, Justina had an inkling of doubt. But she would not be able to withstand her aunt's pleas if she did not agree to go, at least for a time. Justina kept to the morning room long past the proper time to move into one of the rooms on the other side of the house. But she loved this bench. It was by far the most comfortable seat in the entirety of the house. She worked on pictures in her book, revelling in the feel of the crayons in her fingers. She had missed the process of creation, the flowing of the picture from her mind onto the paper. A knock sounded on the door and she jumped, startled, her book falling to the floor. It fell open to the pages near the back, the ones she kept hidden. She looked from the opened book to the door, uncertain whether she should snatch it up or pretend it did not exist and move toward the door. Lieutenant Markham stood in the doorway with Laraj Dutta. Markham Sahib for you, Mem Sahib. He bowed to Justina and stepped into the corridor, leaving the door open. The lieutenant stepped into the room and removed his shako, the red plume quivering with the movement. Miss Tinsdale, I'm most happy to see you up and well. I fear you gave me quite a cause for concern. She gave one last glance at the book on the floor and quickly moved toward him. Retrieving it now would only bring unwelcome attention to it. Thank you for your concern, lieutenant. She clasped her hands together. And thank you for continuing to check on me. It was very thoughtful. He took a step toward her and smiled. Why did she feel nothing when he smiled at her? When Nathan even looked in her direction, she thought butterflies may actually lift her from the floor, so fiercely they flew about inside her. But there was nothing of the sort when the lieutenant spoke to her. What is wrong with me? A gentleman stood there, obviously interested in her, and all she could think about was Nathan and her lack of response to Lieutenant Markham's attentions. He looked around the room, seeming to notice they were alone. He took several steps back and glanced at the open door. I shall not intrude on your time for long. I only wish to inquire if you were to attend the ball tonight. He twisted his shako around in his hands. I was not certain you would feel up to it yet. Justina nodded. You are correct. I am not certain I am up to the task. But this ball is very important to my aunt. I will be there. She looked at the floor, hastily adding, but I do not know how much I shall be able to dance. He nodded. I understand. If, perchance, you feel able to dance even once, I should hope you will save it for me. His eyes suddenly seemed to take notice of her book lying on the floor. While it was at a distance, it was not so far as to obscure the focus of the work, but I shall understand if you are otherwise engaged. Justina suddenly felt frustrated at Nathan for wrapping her heart up in such knots, although she knew it was not entirely Nathan's fault. The blame was equally hers, well, she would not put up with it for a minute longer. She shook her head. I am not, Lieutenant, and I believe I shall be rested enough to stand up for at least one set. She smiled at him, hoping he would see her sincerity. Perhaps the supper dance. This would mean she would be seated next to him for an entire meal, but that was the least she could do. He had been nothing but cordial and accommodating, even though she had given him no reason to be such. He smiled, and his shoulders relaxed, as much as she had ever seen on a soldier. I should enjoy that very much, Miss Tinsdale. He dipped his head. And now I shall leave you so you may rest. I should not like to be responsible for you missing out on our dance. Until tonight, Lieutenant. He turned 
and quit the room. Justina watched after him, trying to detect any sort of emotions she had toward him and his offer. Her body sagged. She felt no excitement, no anticipation, nothing. Could she be happy with an arrangement when there was no sort of connection beyond friendship? At three and twenty, she did not have many options. She may only have a choice of marriage with no kind of attraction, or spinsterhood. Justina balled her hands at her side and shook them. Oh, it was an impossible situation. Or was it? Was she once again jumping to conclusions that were not a reality? The lieutenant had not indicated he was interested in anything more than one dance at the ball tonight. But then she thought she recognised that look in his eye. It was the same look Lord Grayson had given Miss Marley. She stalked over to the bench, no longer in the mood to create any sort of pictures. She looked down, the portrait of Nathan staring up at her. Her pulse thrummed in her neck and her stomach fluttered. Now why could she not experience as much when she looked at the lieutenant in the flesh? Justina stepped into the ballroom of the Raj Bhavan. It was by far the most impressive place she had ever been, with the exception of the Prince Regent's Brighton Palace. Close to a dozen pillars on each side ran the length of the room. There was nearly two rods of space between the walls and the pillars, offering plenty of places for matrons to sit and watch the dancing. The ceiling stretched high above them, divided into dozens of wood-trimmed squares. Such squares may have looked out of place amid all the opulence, were it not for the gold and crystal chandeliers hanging low enough to provide a soft light on the dance floor. Justina ran her hands down her deep purple gown, grateful she had not worn it to the Sutherland's party. The lights in the ballroom shimmered off the silk, making the gown appear almost black at times. With her hair swept up into a bun, encased by a pearl circlet, and ringlets framing the side of her face, Justina felt truly beautiful for one of the first times in her life. Couples were already dancing, and Justina could only stare at the splendour of it all. Miss Tinsdale. Nathan's voice was warm as his gaze travelled the length of her. There was an appreciation in his eyes when they finally held hers. I am glad to see you here. I was afraid you may not yet be the pinkest of the pinks. Did his voice catch? Surely she had imagined it. He bowed and placed a soft kiss upon her hand. Oh, if only she had forgotten to wear her gloves. She tried not to be affected by Nathan's touch, by his very presence, but failed miserably. It is good to see you, my lord. She dipped a curtsy. And I must thank you for the flowers you sent while I was ill. They did much to improve my outlook. I would like to have done more. He glanced from her to her aunt. I am certain you will not last the evening dancing. May I claim your first set? She nodded. Of course, my lord. He looked so sincere it was difficult not to think there was some affinity between them. The lieutenant chose that moment to approach her. Miss Tinsdale, you look lovely tonight. Nathan's face darkened. You look flushed, Miss Tinsdale. Let me fetch you some refreshment. He took several steps away before looking back over his shoulder. Please, stay where you are. Justina watched as he approached the refreshment table, pausing when Miss Kendall entered the room. Nathan's face immediately changed. Justina was interested to note there was no joy evident, on his part at least. But Miss Kendall's eyes lit when they spotted Nathan across the room. Perhaps he had not rethought his plans after all. Nathan moved away from the table with no refreshment in hand and met Miss Kendall at the end of the hall. He leant in and whispered something to her. She smiled coyly and nodded. Lieutenant Markham cleared his throat. A weariness settled over Justina. Perhaps she was not as recovered as she had thought. A cough rattled from her chest, burning its way up her throat. Are you sure you are recovered enough to be here tonight, Miss Tinsdale? Lieutenant Markham was at her side his hand providing much-needed support. Let me help you to that chair over there. They moved slowly, Justina leaning on him more than she would have liked, but she suddenly felt as if all her strength had left her. Nathan moved back to the refreshment table and collected two cups of orange juice. Walking toward her, his gaze connected with hers. His brow furrowed and he quickened his pace. He reached her and knelt down in front of her. Placing the glass in her hand, he leant forward and whispered, Jasmine, I am worried for you. She took a long drink of the mango juice, allowing the barely cool liquid to run down her throat. 
Running her tongue along her lips, she tried to remove any of the remaining juice. Nathan's lips parted slightly as he watched her closely. She placed a hand on his shoulder. You need not worry, my lord. The crush of so many people caused me to feel weary, but all will be well. She glanced at Miss Kendall, who looked on them with narrowed eyes. I believe Miss Kendall is desiring your attention. You should go to her. Nathan stood up and gave Justina a searching look. Perhaps we should forego the first set. But if you recover, please let me know. I should like to have one dance with you. Chapter 24 Nathan sighed deeply and dragged his hand across the back of his neck. He could not go through with it. He had asked Miss Kendall to meet him in the library at ten, intending to ask for her hand. It had been easier to stay the course when Jasmine had been indisposed, when he wasn't constantly reminded of what he truly desired. But now that she was here, and by far the most handsome woman in attendance, he could not follow through with the proposal to Miss Kendall. Not when he loved someone else. It would not be fair to Miss Kendall or himself. Jasmine had told him to go to Miss Kendall, but he no longer saw the point. In point of fact, he could barely tolerate the lady. She said and did all the right things, but it all felt as if she were playing a part on the stage. Nathan gave one last parting look at Jasmine. He gripped tightly at the back of his neck as he watched the lieutenant hover over her. It should be him seeing to her comfort, not Markham. With a huff, he left the ballroom in search of a quiet place to think. Miss Kendall would be meeting him in the library and was likely expecting a proposal. How was he to get out of this situation? Lord Hastings shuffled down the corridor, spotting Nathan only when they were several feet apart. Good evening, my lord, Nathan bowed to his host. Ah, lord, the Governor-General clearly needed to search his memory for Nathan's name. Nathaniel, how are you this evening? Very well. Nathan was pleasantly surprised the man had come up with his name. I thank you for extending the invitation to this exciting ball. Yes, yes. Hastings frowned. It is more my wife's doing than my own. He looked Nathan over. How is your father? Last I heard, he was in good health, but the letters are slow in coming. Yes, I am aware. Lord Hastings nodded. I should be returning to the ball. His voice was dull and unexcited. Nathan lit on an idea. My lord, before you go, I find I need to write a letter. Might you have a quill and ink I could use? The Governor-General grunted and turned back in the direction he had come. Opening a door toward the end of the corridor, he motioned Nathan inside a room. A single candle cast the study in a low light. There is paper in the top drawer and the quill and ink is on the desktop. Shut the door when you leave, please. Lord Hastings looked longingly at the room. Thank you, my lord. I appreciate your continued generosity. He moved behind the desk and extracted a single sheet of paper. Sitting down, he picked up the quill, only then noticing Lord Hastings still standing just inside the door. I do not mean to keep you from the ball, my lord. Nathan set the quill back on the desktop. The older man waved Nathan aside. You are not keeping me. I find the quiet of this room much more to my liking than the ballroom. He lit several candles standing in a nearby candelabra and moved over to a couch. Settling in, he picked up a book that lay on the side table. Take your time on your letter, my lord, he said with a contented sigh. Nathan watched him for a moment longer. Did the man not trust him in his study? Nathan would not fault him for that. There were few people Nathan would leave alone in his personal rooms. But perhaps it was as the man said, and he did not wish to return to the ballroom. Turning his attention back to the paper before him, Nathan picked up the quill and dipped it in the ink. Now, what to say to Miss Kendall? He swished the feather back and forth beneath his chin, tickling his skin. Deciding on the words he wished to convey, Nathan scribbled out the letter. As he formed the letters of the words joy and love, he remembered the writing lesson Jasmine had given him on the ship. Blood, even thinking on her caused his pulse to quicken. He finished the letter with a flourish and folded it. Wax. Where would Lord Hastings keep the wax? He looked about the desk. It is behind the inkwell, my lord. Lord Hastings did not even look up from his book. Nathan raised a brow but reached for the stick. He held it over the flame of the single candle on the desk 
and then rubbed it in a circle on the letter. Removing the ring from his pinky finger, he pressed in his seal. Miss Kendall, he wrote across the front. Unfortunately, he had planned to meet her just before the supper dance, meaning he would need to place the letter in the library and leave the ball before supper, cutting his evening short. From there, he was not sure what his course of action would be. He felt certain Miss Kendall would not be happy with the turn of events. He had only been paying her particular attentions this last week, but foolishly he had given her hints about what was coming. The letter was the coward's way out, but given his past follies with meeting ladies in libraries, he felt it the most prudent way to disappoint her. The clock on the mantel chimed nine o'clock. He did not have much time. He still had hopes of securing at least one set with Jasmine before he was forced from the party. Pushing the chair away from the desk, he stood up. Lord Hastings lowered his book a fraction and stared at him. Are you finished with your letter, Lord Nathaniel? There was regret in his voice. Nathan offered him a half-smile. I am sorry to say I am. The Governor-General replaced his book on the side table. I had hoped that you might be either extremely verbose or a bit more tongue-tied than you seem to have been. He frowned. I suppose we must both return to the ballroom. Nathan moved around the desk and stopped at the couch, waiting for Hastings to stand. If you find you are in need of writing another letter tonight, please do not hesitate to seek me out, my lord. Nathan let out a chuckle. I shall think very hard on with whom I might need to correspond. Hastings patted Nathan on the shoulder. That's a good boy. Your father must be very proud of you. The smile fell away from Nathan's face. He had done little to make his father proud in recent years. But perhaps now... They walked out into the corridor, the distant strains of music drifting toward them. Nathan bowed to Lord Hastings. Thank you for your help, my lord. But now I find there is a young lady I must seek out for a dance. The older man nodded. Yes, these balls are for the young. Go enjoy the lovely ladies in attendance. Nathan left the man standing outside his study door. He suspected Lord Hastings would return to the room and continue with his book. Entering the ballroom, Nathan surveyed the crowd. He looked to the location where he had left Jasmine and was pleased to see her still seated. Walking around the perimeter, he snuck up behind her. I hope this means you have been resting, Jasmine. She looked up over her shoulder and smiled at him. He thought it entirely possible that he could survive without food or even air if only he could see her smile. I have been taking it easy, Nathan. She watched him as he lowered himself into a chair next to her. Where have you been hiding? He stretched his legs out in front of him and crossed them at the ankles, hoping he looked more relaxed than he felt. I was speaking with Lord Hastings in his bookroom. Technically, it was the truth. Her eyes widened. I did not realise you knew the Governor-General. Her gaze shifted around the room and she leant in toward him. I would not recommend mentioning the connection to my aunt. She will not leave you alone until you have made an introduction. Nathan chuckled. I will keep your advice in mind. He looked out over the crowd to keep himself from staring at her. In point of fact, I do not know Lord Hastings well. Rather, he knows of my father. Jasmine shrugged. I do not think my aunt will see the difference. Perhaps not. The music ended and the couples left the dance floor. I heard this dance is to be a waltz. Jasmine spoke as if the waltz were nothing special, but the perspiration dotting the back of Nathan's neck said otherwise. Was she up to such a dance? And would she even consider dancing it with the likes of him? Nathan bit the inside of his cheek. Gathering his courage, he folded his arms across his chest. Has your waltz already been spoken for? Did she hear the high timbre in his voice? No, word seems to have spread that I am not ready for much dancing. Only my supper set has been taken. Nathan nodded. Was she trying to tell him that she was not feeling up to the dance? But I find I am quite rested, she continued. If someone should ask, I believe it quite possible I would accept. She did not turn toward him, but he did catch her glance at him from the corner of her eye. He took a deep breath and pushed himself up in his seat. Bounding to his feet, he bowed before her. Miss Jasmine, he said in his most charming voice. Would you do me the honour of dancing the next set with me? Her face lit up with a smile. She dipped her head demurely. I should be honoured, my lord. He helped her to her feet and placed her hand upon his arm. Please, 
Let me know if it becomes too much for you. We can abandon the dance if need be. I feel better than I have in days. I believe I shall be well. They reached the dance floor, and Nathan slid his hand around her waist. She tensed for a moment, but then relaxed into his hold. If Nathan had thought holding her in the saddle atop the elephant had been distracting, holding her now made his mind feel like porridge. He hoped she did not expect conversation while they danced, because he could not think of a single word to say. The smell of jasmine filled his nose, and her warmth spread from his hands to the rest of his body. He felt their movement, but he could not say for certain if it was his legs that were moving him. For all he knew, the angels had taken mercy on him and were carrying them across the dance floor. Jasmine sighed against him. It took all of his restraint not to bend down and kiss her. If he had not already decided against an alliance with Miss Kendall, this moment would have made the decision for him. There was no way he could marry another when he felt like this for Jasmine. It was only too bad. He would never be worthy of her. Chapter 25 Justina floated from the dance floor on Nathan's arm. He deposited her at her chair and left to fetch some refreshments. Never, in any of her imaginings, had she dreamt that waltzing with Nathan could be so... She did not even have a word for it. Her cheeks ached from the wide smile on her face, and she felt quite breathless. Miss Tinsdale? Miss Kendall's slightly nasally voice intruded on Justina's complete joy. Good evening, Miss Kendall. Justina decided she was not going to let the lady dampen her spirits. I hope you are having a pleasant evening. You have not been in want of partners for what I have seen. Miss Kendall shrugged. I have danced every set until now, but I found I needed to catch my breath. I believe the most exciting part of my evening has not yet occurred. Justina smiled, but did not respond. Instead, she watched the dancers in front of her. I do not know if he has told you, but Lord Nathaniel has asked me to meet him in the library in just a few moments' time. Justina's eyes flicked to Miss Kendall and then to the refreshment table. Nathan was nowhere to be seen. I am quite certain, for he has given many hints, that he is to offer for me tonight. There was a smug superiority in Miss Kendall's voice. I hope you realise it would not be proper for him to call on you so frequently once we are engaged. Justina continued to look ahead, barely seeing the hazy forms of the dancers in front of her. I should be making my way there now. I think it best if I stop at the retiring room just to check my hair. I want to look my best when Nathan asks. Justina twitched. She did not know what bothered her more, that Nathan was meeting Miss Kendall in the library, or that the lady was using his Christian name. Miss Kendall patted Justina on the arm and stood. I am pleased to see you are recovered, Miss Tinsdale. Justina shot to her feet once Miss Kendall was out of sight. A cough burnt its way up her throat. She could not sit here any longer. She needed to speak with Nathan first. Perhaps it was simply a coincidence that he had picked the library to propose. Surely he had changed. She had seen it for herself. But his words echoed through her mind. I had determined I wanted nothing more to do with Lady Elizabeth. I was trying to be discreet in my refusal of her, trying to spare her from the gossip that would surely accompany a more public set-down. Justina knew the outcome of that interaction. But what if she was wrong? What if he had not changed? Had it only been a matter of time before he returned to his rakish ways? Miss Pendleton's words from the picnic flashed through her mind. Once a rake, always a rake. She sat back down, twisting her hands in her lap. This was not her problem to fix. She had to move beyond this, beyond him, else she might keel over from worry. Lieutenant Markham approached her. Miss Tinsdale, I believe I have claimed this set. She allowed him to lead her to the dance floor, but she paid him little heed. Miss Tinsdale? The lieutenant's raised voice interrupted her thoughts. She lifted her eyes to his. Yes? His brows creased. Are you well, Miss Tinsdale? You do not seem yourself at present. Justina shook her head. I am sorry, Lieutenant. I am suddenly feeling faint. Perhaps if I sit out this first dance, we could continue with the second. He nodded. Let me help you to your seat. 
Justina shook him off. No, I, I, I think I need some air. I shall return shortly. She did not wait for his response, plunging through the crowds and out into the corridor. She did not believe the humid air in the entryway could feel cooler than the ballroom, but she was pleasantly surprised. She walked down the poorly lit corridor, taking in calming breaths. A yell echoed from somewhere farther down. Justina moved quickly past the closed doors, stopping when she reached the first open one. It was the library. She turned to leave, but stopped after only a step. What had Nathan said to Miss Kendall to earn such a response? Had he told her he would not be offering for her? Hope surged through Justina's chest. She stepped into the room. Miss Kendall? The lady whipped around, her scowl fierce. What do you want? Have you come to gloat? Justina backed up several steps. I was looking for the retiring room when I heard you yell. I only meant to see if you were harmed. This is your fault! She waved the paper clutched in her fist at Justina. She reached out and grasped hold of the doorframe as the air whooshed out of her lungs. Nathan had not returned to his former ways. He had left a note instead of facing the lady. I have no notion what you are speaking about. She glanced down the corridor. Perhaps it would be best if I left. These were not the rants of a woman newly engaged. Did this mean Nathan had not asked for her hand? Where was Nathan? Had Miss Kendall not said he was to meet her here? Miss Kendall stood and threw the paper in the unlit fireplace. To the devil with Lord Nathaniel, she mumbled as she passed Justina in the doorway. Justina stood rooted in place until the lady's rants could no longer be heard. Looking both ways down the corridor, Justina stepped back into the library and rushed to the fireplace, snatching the letter from the grate. Afraid she would be caught reading it, she tucked it into her reticule and hurried from the room. Lieutenant Markham found her at the entrance to the ballroom. There you are, Miss Tinsdale. Are you recovered? Justina coughed, thankful that it sounded far worse than it felt. I am afraid not, sir. I hate to spoil your evening, but I feel I must return home. He nodded. I understand. I was afraid this evening would be too much for you. He looked around. Sit here, and I shall find your aunt and uncle. Moments later, Aunt Martin was at her side. As you can see, she is not well. Lieutenant Markham said the words Justina could not say. Her stomach churned. Was she really to cut her aunt's evening short, just so she could read a letter in privacy? Yes, I have noticed your colour does not look well. She turned to the lieutenant. Please go find my husband and we will summon the carriage. Justina put her hand out. No, aunt, I do not wish to make you leave. I know how much you have been looking forward to this evening. She sighed, but the guilt was not enough to make her relent. If we summon the carriage, I will return home and send it back for you and Uncle Martin. Her aunt patted her arm. Nonsense, we shall all quit the ball. In truth, Justina did not want her aunt to accompany her. She wished to be alone with her thoughts and the emotions that were doubtless to come. Please, aunt. Justina dropped her voice. Please, I will be well on my own. Stay and enjoy the supper and conversation. Her aunt gave her an appraising look. If you are certain... Justina smiled, as much as she could muster. I am certain. She looked to the lieutenant. I am sorry, lieutenant. How far she had fallen to be able to look this man in the eyes and lie. Perhaps Nathan was not the only scoundrel. Her aunt nodded and led her toward the front doors. Let me at least stay with you until the carriage arrives. A footman handed Justina up into the carriage and shut the door behind her. The torches lighting the wide drive lit the interior of the carriage almost as if it was midday. Justina wanted to pull the letter from her reticule, but her aunt and uncle stood watching from the walkway. Instead, she dropped her head against the bench. The carriage lurched forward and slowly moved away from the palace, leaving the light behind them. Justina watched as the shadows of the trees passed in front of her. Soon she would be home and finally able to read the letter. She fidgeted until their townhouse came into view. The carriage door opened and a footman handed her out. Propriety was the only thing which kept her from pulling up her skirts and running to her room. Laraj Dutta opened the door and gave her a worried look. You are home early, Mem Sahib. Are you well? She nodded. I am only fatigued, Laraj Dutta. I believe it was too soon for me to venture out. He raised his brows slightly as she stepped over the threshold and practically threw off her wrap, hurrying straight to her bedchamber. 
Ajit jumped from her spot on the floor, an anxious look on her face. I am well, Ajit, Justina said. Her stomach grumbled, reminding her she had missed out on more than just the supper dance. But I did miss supper. Could you send someone to the kitchens for some food and tea? The ayah nodded and left the room, finally giving Justina the privacy she desired. She moved to her writing desk and flattened the paper out, pressing the creases left from Miss Kendall's tight fist from the letter. Drawing the candle closer, Justina read, Miss Kendall. She skimmed over the pleasantries offered to the lady, but slowed her reading as she started the second paragraph. I mistakenly gave the impression that a proposal would be forthcoming, but upon reflection, I realised it would be a disservice to both of us for me to marry you and my heart belongs to another. While I shall never be worthy of her love, I cannot imagine it shall ever dim. I pray you will find felicity in marriage, as I am sure there are gentlemen desiring your good opinion. Yours, Lord Nathaniel Westlake. Justina's heart throbbed. He had not mentioned her specifically, but could his heart belong to her? It seemed almost unfathomable. She stood abruptly, shaking the table and dropping wax onto the wooden top, but Justina ignored it. What if it was true? There had been moments when she had thought it possible, but she had always found reasons to dismiss them. Her thoughts drifted back to the waltz they shared at the ball. The way he had held her tightly to him, or the way he had kept his gaze focused on her and her alone. Her skin tingled, and she found it difficult to breathe. Perhaps she should go to him, tell him of her affections. The thought of opening herself up, allowing herself to be vulnerable, brought a shake to her hands. Tomorrow, she vowed. Tomorrow she would visit Nathan and tell him she loved him. What was the worst that could happen? Chapter 26 Nathaniel Sahib Nathan's butler put his hands together and bowed. A Mr. Kendall is here to see you. He has come with his daughter, says you have unfinished business. Nathan frowned. It was barely nine o'clock in the morning. This could not be a social call. Visions of Lord Malvern flitted through his head. Surely it would not come to that again. Where have you put them? They are waiting for you in the morning room, Sahib. Nathan nodded. Thank you, I shall be with them in a moment. He read over the plans Mr. Wixom had sent over yesterday and added his initials to the bottom. The ship had been purchased and Nathan's new partner was anxious to depart Calcutta as soon as possible. Things had fallen into place with almost dizzying speed. Nathan was not sure if that notion should cause him anxiety or peace. Rubbing at his eyes with his thumb and forefinger, Nathan stretched tall in his seat. He had awakened early to go over this paperwork, making him glad he had not stayed for the entirety of the ball. The ball. So many emotions flooded over him when he thought of it. He was tempted to close his eyes and relive the dance he had shared with Jasmine, something he had done dozens of times already. But he grudgingly pushed this thought aside, knowing he should not keep Mr. Kendall waiting. It was sure to be an unpleasant sort of conversation, and as much as Nathan was not looking forward to it, the man would surely not be put off. Nathan left his study and walked toward the morning room, pausing at the end of the corridor, as Mr. Kendall's voice carried down the passageway toward him. The vicar will be here within the hour, my dear. Nathan choked on his breath. The vicar had been summoned. Did the man think to have the wedding today? But how could that be possible? Surely the marriage act included those taking place in India. Nathan scratched his head and winced. In truth, he had no idea. He will not throw my daughter over as he has the others before him. But there had been no understanding. Hints had been given, but the words had never been spoken to anyone but Jasmine, and she would not have said anything. She detested Miss Kendall. Did Mr. Kendall truly think to force a marriage upon Nathan? I think not. Nathan backed down the corridor. He did not think himself a coward, but if the man had made up his mind enough to have already summoned the vicar, the high-handedness of it all. It seemed imprudent, indeed, for Nathan to put himself in a position where he may not have a choice in the outcome. Turning and putting his back to the corridor, Nathan went to his study and collected his papers. This time, he did not intend to flee without at least some of his belongings. Mr. Wixon was not the only one who wished to set sail immediately. If only there was a way to get word to Jasmine. 
Justina returned to her uncle's townhouse and threw her bonnet down on the entryway table. Nathan was not at home. She had built up her courage, made her way to his house, only to discover he was not at home. She huffed out a breath. How would she muster the courage to confront him again this evening? Her first attempt had left her nearly spent. Laraj Dutta approached her and bowed. A letter for you, Mem Sahib. Justina took the folded paper, not missing that her hand still shook from nervousness. Thank you. She took the letter and made her way to her room. She needed to calm herself before she could focus on the children's studies. Shutting the door behind her, she was glad to see that Arjit was not kneeling on the floor and Justina had the room to herself. Taking her letter to the chair by the window, she examined the seal pressed into the wax on the back. It was not one she recognised, but when she turned it over to reveal her name, or rather Nathan's name for her, scrawled across the front, she sucked in a breath. Had he been at home all along, but just had not wished to see her? But if that was the case, how did the letter arrive before she had returned home? She cracked the seal and fumbled to unfold the missive. Meet me at the Calcutta gate of Fort William at one this afternoon. N. Justina read the note several times over, but still she could not account for it. What did it mean? Why could they not meet at his townhouse? Or why could he not just come and visit her here? She licked her lips. She would go and meet him. She could think of nothing to hold her back. But she was perplexed, to say the least. Justina glanced at the clock on the mantel, she had just three hours until the appointed time. Thankfully, the morning would be spent with her cousins. Smoothing her dress, she moved across the hall to the schoolroom. As she wrote small words down on the paper for Matthew to trace and then attempt to write on his own, Aunt Martin came into the room. Good morning, dearest. Justina looked up, surprised to see her aunt up after such a late night. She smiled, hoping to hide the nervousness mounting with every minute. Good morning. I received a missive from Nathan this morning. She reached over and guided Matthew's hand as he traced the letters. He has asked me to meet him at Fort William at one this afternoon. I hoped you would be available to accompany me. Her aunt clapped her hands. Of course, dearest. Is that not close to Peterfell's? I heard from Mrs Glover that a new shipment of gowns arrived just yesterday. I would like to look at them before the most desirable ones are gone. Justina breathed deeply. Could she be so fortunate as to have her aunt allow them some time alone? The thought of voicing her love to Nathan with her aunt listening in was quite mortifying, especially considering she did not know how Nathan would respond. After thinking on it more, Justina was not wholly convinced that Nathan felt nothing for her, but it did not follow that he was in love with her, and that was what made her declaration risky. We shall depart at half-past twelve so as not to make Lord Nathaniel wait, especially in this heat. It is even more oppressive today than it was yesterday. Please come and fetch me when it is time to go. The children and I will need all of the time remaining for their studies. Justina examined the paper of words Matthew had traced and rumpled his hair. Very nicely done, Matthew. Carry on, dearest. I will see you soon. Justina sat on the settee with Penny at her side, reading from the primer book. Matthew lay on the floor with a wooden horse, galloping it in a circle around the table. Her aunt stepped over the threshold and Justina put down the book. Penny sighed and scowled at her mother. Must you take her so soon? I wish to finish this story. I'm sorry, Penny dear, but if Justina is to meet Lord Nathaniel precisely at one, we must be on our way. We can continue this story when I return. She dropped a kiss onto Penny's temple before standing and stretching her hands over her head. She looked down at her morning dress. Oh dear, I should have thought about changing my gown. She glanced at the clock. But there is no time for it now. Her aunt looked at the wrinkled gown and tusked. It is not ideal, but you are right, we do not have time. Come, come. She made a shooing motion toward the door. They hurried down the stairs and out to the walkway, where the carriage waited in front of their house. Justina looked at her aunt. Do you think the carriage necessary? We could walk to the gate just as quickly. In this heat? I think not. Besides, it will be better to have the carriage should I find some new gowns to purchase. Her aunt stepped up and settled against the seat. Justina followed in behind. She twisted the tips of her gloves as the carriage lurched forward, reminding her where they were destined to go. She had rehearsed what she wished to tell Nathan over and over again, but now she couldn't remember a single word of it, except that she loved him. That part of her speech was never far from her mind. 
She swallowed hard as doubts crept in. She had been so happy he had asked for the waltz. Perhaps she had allowed herself to believe, as she had with Lord Grayson, that he cared more for her than he actually did. The carriage stopped just outside the Calcutta gate at Fort William, and the footman opened the door to hand them out. Justina waited for her aunt to precede her, but her aunt stayed seated. It is too hot to go walking around the esplanade today. I shall wait here in the carriage. Her aunt folded her hands in her lap and turned her gaze out the window. Justina knew she should insist on her aunt accompanying her, but she did not desire it, so she simply nodded and allowed the footman to hand her down. Chapter 27 Nathan leant against the wall of the Calcutta Gate. Jasmine had not replied to his missive, leaving him wondering if she would come or not. After he had abandoned her at the ball, he would not be surprised if she never looked on him again. His breath hissed out through his nose as the Martin's carriage came to a stop in front of the gate. While every muscle within him wished to rush over and take her in his arms, he held back. There was no need to complicate things. Jasmine stepped down from the carriage and raised a hand to shield her eyes from the sun. Blood. How was he to leave her behind? He lifted a hand in greeting, and Justina smiled. Had it only been mere hours since he last saw her? His pulse thrummed in his neck and wrists. Pushing himself off the wall, he walked toward her, increasing his stride until he met her halfway. He stared, memorising every inch of her. If this was the last he was to see of her... He wished the memories to last a lifetime. Her face coloured up under his intense scrutiny. Oh, he had embarrassed her. A smile curved the corners of her mouth. Good day, Nathan. Her voice poured over him, setting him more at his ease. But with every movement, every word she spoke, he found his resolve to leave without her weakening. Not that it was his decision to make. Good day to you, Jasmine. I was... She held up her hand. Please... I have been practising what I wish to say to you, and I am afraid if I do not say it now, I shall lose my nerve. Nathan flinched. This was it. She knew of his feelings for her, and she intended to let him know that they could never be together. I know what you wish to say. Please, Nathan. This is hard enough without you interrupting me. She bit her lip and looked away from him. He pinched his mouth shut. This must be very bad indeed for her to chew on her lip in such a way. I have come to the conclusion, that is to say, I have known for some time that there is only one man I wish to be with. She looked at her hands and gave a small shrug. There is only one who holds my heart. My whole heart. Nathan towed at a pebble partially buried in the pathway. Was it the lieutenant? Nathan's fists clenched at his side. He did not like the man, but under different circumstances they may have been friends. Jasmine took a step forward. That man is you, Nathan. I love you, and while I know I may never have your love in return, I could not risk losing you to a marriage of convenience without you knowing how I felt. Nathan twitched. I hope you and Lieutenant. He paused. Had he heard her right? She loved him. Lord Nathaniel Westlake, the hopeless rake. How could that be? He shook his head. But you can't mean it. She chuckled. I believe I know my own heart, my lord. But how could you? You know the worst of me, Jasmine. His body sagged. You deserve better than the likes of me. She lifted a hand to his cheek, and he leant into her. She could not possibly know what she was saying, but he found he did not have the willpower to step away. I also know the best of you. He shook his head. This changed nothing. There was no way her father would give his consent. He stepped away from her and looked out at the hoolie. I am leaving, Jasmine. The ship Mr. Wixom has purchased set sail in the morning and I intend to be on it. He cautioned a glance at her, but regretted it immediately. I thought you should know. She looked up at him, and he felt his stomach twist at the hurt he saw there. Why, my lord? Miss Kendall's father is insisting that I marry her. He claims overtures were made and I must now follow through with them. He dragged a hand through his hair. I can't marry her, Jasmine. Jasmine closed the distance between them. Why, my lord? Her voice was soft but insistent. 
Nathan looked away, but she grasped his chin between her thumb and forefinger and brought it back, bringing his eyes to hers. I asked you why you cannot marry Miss Kendall. I do not love her. His throat ached from holding back his emotions. You told me that was why you wished for the arrangement in the first place. What has changed? Nathan stared into her dark, intense brown eyes. If only things could be different and he could look into them forever. But it could not be. I realised I was wrong. One should marry for love, not because it makes sense. Her mouth ticked up slightly. Blood, her lips were exquisite. She moved closer to him. Nathan? She pulled her lower lip in between her teeth again. Did she know what that did to him? Nathan, do you love me? What was he to say? To deny it would be a bouncer like none other. He sighed. He could not lie to her. More than life itself. The mere thought of leaving you sucks the air from my lungs and I can scarce see the need to continue on. Her body relaxed a fraction. Then why have you not asked for my hand? He shook his head. Because you deserve. She placed a finger over his mouth. I am capable of knowing what I deserve, Nathan. Her voice took on a fiercer tone. You have no right to tell me who I can and cannot love or deserve. I am the one to make that decision, and I have decided I want you. She pulled her finger away. He shook his head. I have no notion why you would. She moved closer, their bodies barely a whisper apart. He lifted shaking hands and cupped her face, bringing his brow down to hers. You seem nervous, my lord. Are you not the one with experience in this area? She raised a saucy brow at him and smiled. He rubbed his thumbs along her jawline. I have never experienced this before. She pulled her head back and stared at him. Experienced a kiss, Nathan. I have never kissed a woman that I love. He took in a shaky breath, unsure what to do. Oh, my lovely Jasmine. He grinned. I suppose it is time I called you by your given name. She shook her head. You called it a ridiculous name, my lord. And while my father might disagree with you, I find I prefer Jasmine. Nerves flared in Nathan's gut. It was a strange feeling for him. He had always known what to do where the ladies were concerned. Before he could make a decision about how to proceed, Jasmine raised up on her tiptoes and pressed her lips to his. He froze. She kissed his top lip and then the bottom before lifting her hands and intertwining them at the back of his neck. Pulling her closer, he wrapped his arms around her waist. She kissed him again. Her lips were soft and her kisses tentative, but they affected him more than any other he had ever experienced. He deepened the kiss, knowing there was no way he could leave her behind now. He did not know if he could ever be away from her again. Do you think Mr and Mrs Martin would allow you to accompany me back to England? Jasmine leant her head back. Why must we leave tomorrow? If we do not, I fear I shall be married to Miss Kendall before the sun sets. The thought caused a shudder to run down his spine. It is my understanding that there is no need for bans or even special licences here. If you were already married, Mr Kendall would not be able to force your hand. She glanced in the direction of St John's Cathedral. Nathan relaxed, the tension flowing from him. Have I told you how happy I am? You are a blue stocking, my love. He pressed a kiss to her lips, slowly feeling them out as if he had no time restraints. When he pulled away, he looked to the carriage. Do you think your aunt and uncle will consent? She smiled. I am quite certain my aunt has been watching us from the carriage window. Regardless, I am certain she will be quite thrilled with the notion. I have thought her to be partial to me. Nathan winked and was pleased to see Jasmine colour. Given the circumstances, I believe we should make haste before word reaches Mr Kendall. Nathan moved to pull away, but she held him firmly in place. Nathan, is this what you want? He dropped his brow to hers again. I have never desired anything more. I shall not be at ease until you are my wife. She sighed and rested her head against his chest his pounding heart matching hers in rhythm. Bringing her head up, she kissed him again. This time her kisses were strong and demanding. Her fingers curled into his hair at the nape of his neck as she tried to bring them closer together. 
Nathan obliged her and wrapped her tightly in his arms, moving his lips to her earlobes and the small curve of her neck. A giggle escaped her lips, and Nathan wondered briefly if he was dreaming. But then, never, even in his dreams, had he been this happy. My lord? Justina placed a kiss on his chin. I do believe I have thoroughly ruined you. Nathan smiled and bent to kiss her again, whispering against her lips. And I find I do not care in the least. Epilogue Justina stood on the deck, looking out at the dock. It felt so similar to when she had departed for India. The ship, while different, looked similar enough. Even the bustle of people and animals about the docks, all trying to make it some place or another, felt like any other dock she had visited. Perhaps the only difference was the man standing at her side, his arm holding her tightly against him. He leant over and placed a kiss at her temple. How did I not remember you after that first time we met? Justina laughed. Which time are you referring, Nathan? He looked at her, his brows nearly touching in the centre, why, at Mrs. Hutching's card party. Justina leant her head against his chest. That was our third introduction, Nathan. In point of fact, our meeting on the ship was our fifth. His mouth dropped open and his head shook. No, you are in jest. Indeed I am not. Our first introduction was in my first season at the Henley's Ball. Nathan looked as if he was trying to place the event in his memory. But a ball is always such a crushing event. I cannot be held responsible for not remembering every lady I met. She shrugged. Perhaps. But what is your excuse for not remembering me from the Garvey's Brighton house party? His face blanched. Indeed. You were there. Justina nodded. Indeed. He sucked in a breath and ran a hand over his face. His eyes flicked toward the shore and he moved a step away from her. My lovely Jasmine, I will return momentarily, but there is something I must fetch. Justina turned to him. But Nathan, the ship is about to leave. The captain has blown the whistle. He kissed the tip of her nose. I promise I will not allow the ship to leave without me. He raised his brows quickly. I am experienced at such things. Her stomach clenched. What was so important as to force him from the ship just before it was to leave? She did not particularly wish to take a grand tour without him. A seaman hefted her trunk onto his shoulder and moved toward the stairway leading below deck. Is the gentleman not to sail with us, ma'am? The captain has blown his whistle. Yes, I heard. My husband had to see to an errand. He will return shortly. She twisted at the tip of the glove on her pinky finger. What are you about, Nathan? I should hope he does. The captain waits for no one. The man shouted over his shoulder as he moved on the narrow stairs with his wide load. Last call to come aboard! the first mate yelled. Several seamen moved over and bent to lift the gangplank away from the dock. Justina's stomach dropped to the deck and she hurried over beside them. Oh, please, wait a moment longer. My husband is coming. I have my orders, ma'am. They continued lifting the gangplank just as Nathan ran up the incline and onto the deck of the ship. He put his hand through his hair and used his other to thrust a bouquet with roses and sprigs of jasmine into her hands. Jasmine, for my lovely jasmine. She raised a brow at him and stomped her foot. Flowers, Nathan. I hardly think this was important enough for you to nearly miss the ship. He held up a finger. But I did not miss the ship. That is a very important fact. He grasped one of her hands and raised it to his lips. And when I saw the jasmine at the flower stand, I knew you had to have some. It is a small token to apologise for forgetting you all those times. I was a thoughtless cad. Please, forgive me. She tilted her head to the side as the butterflies were freed from their cage. Do you not remember what happened the last time you narrowly made it onto a departing ship? He frowned. How could I forget my time sleeping with the crew? He turned an eye towards the first mate roaming the deck, giving orders. You do not think it shall happen again, just because I came aboard late, do you? It is not even the same crew. You have not made a good impression, I'm afraid. Justina gave him a coy smile. But not to worry. I suppose you could sleep in my stateroom again. Nathan wrapped his arms around her waist and whispered in her ear, Only this time you will not be removing yourself, my love. Justina let out a sigh. Nathan, please remind me when we return home to post a letter to Lord Malvern. Nathan let out a gasp laugh. Why should you do such a thing? 
She turned in his arms and smiled up at him. I would like to thank him and his son, for without them I should never have met you for the fifth time. This has been Rake on the Run by Mindy Burbage Strunk, narrated by v Afterward. Dear reader, thank you so much for reading. This story has a bit of an interesting history in that it was not supposed to be written when it was. It was not slated until much later in my schedule, but as sometimes happens with stories, scenes and dialogue kept coming to my mind. I would write it down just to get it out of my head, but as soon as one part was written, another would come to my mind. After several weeks, I finally relented and sat down to write the book, and I am so glad that I did. India is a fascinating place to study, especially during the British imperial times. The name of the Martins townhouse was a product of my imagination, but Chowringi Road, the Esplanade, Maiden, Fort William, and the Raj Bhavan are or were all real places. Lord Hastings was the actual Governor General of India at this time. However, his dialogue and personality are the product of my imagination. Primary source documents about this time period were fascinating and often sucked me in for far longer than was efficient. But I learned so much from that time in these accounts. It was these books that taught me about kakas, tatties, and punkas. It was so interesting to see how people handled the heat and what they did to combat it. Um, I think it made for an interesting backdrop, and I hope it helps you to immerse yourself inside the pages of this book. Please be sure to check out all of my other stories. Also, if you enjoy listening to the professional narration of my books, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It helps me out a lot. Thanks. Happy reading, Mindy.